Preface to the Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard. Preface In offering the American public a carefully studied outline of its national park system, I have two principal objects. The one is to describe and differentiate the national parks in a manner which will enable the reader to appreciate their importance, scope, meaning, beauty, manifold uses, and enormous value to individual and nation. The other is to use these parks, in which nature is writing in large plain lines the story of America's making, as examples illustrating the several kinds of scenery and what each kind means in terms of world-building. In other words, to translate the practical findings of science into unscientific phrase for the reader's increased profit and pleasure not only in his national parks, but in all other scenic places, great and small. At the outset I have been confronted with a difficulty because of this double objective. The role of the interpreter is not always welcome. If I write what is vaguely known as a popular book, wise men have warned me that any scientific intrusion, however lightly and dramatically rendered, will displease its natural audience. If I write the simplest of scientific books, I am warned that a large body of warm-blooded, wholesome, enthusiastic Americans, the very ones above all others, whose keen enjoyment I want to double by doubling their sources of pleasure, will have none of it. The suggestion that I make my text popular and carry my science in an appendix I promptly rejected. For if I cannot give the scientific aspects of nature their readable values in the text, I cannot make them worth an appendix. Now I fail to share with my advisers their poor opinion of the taste, enterprise, and intelligence of the wide-awake American, but, for the sake of my message, I yield in some part to their warnings. Therefore I have so presented my material that the miscalled, and I verily believe, badly slandered average reader, may have his popular book by omitting the note on the appreciation of scenery and the several notes explanatory of scenery which are interpolated between groups of chapters. If it is true, as I have been told, that the average reader would omit these anyway, because it is his habit to omit prefaces and notes of every kind, then nothing has been lost. The keen and inquiring reader, however, the reader who wants to know values and to get, in the eloquent phrase of the day, all that's coming to him, will have the whole story by beginning the book with the note on the appreciation of scenery and reading it consecutively, interpolated notes and all. As this will involve less than a score of additional pages, I hope to get the message of the national parks in terms of their fullest enjoyment before much of the greater part of the book's readers. The pleasure of writing this book has many times repaid its cost in labor, and any helpfulness it may have in advancing the popularity of our national parks, in building up the system's worth as a national economic asset, and in increasing the people's pleasure in all scenery by helping them to appreciate their greatest scenery, will come to me as pure profit. It is my earnest hope that this profit may be large. A similar spirit has actuated the very many who have helped me to acquire the knowledge and experience to produce it. The officials of the National Park Service, the superintendents and several rangers in the national parks, certain zoologists of the United States Biological Survey, the director and many geologists of the United States Geological Survey, scientific experts of the Smithsonian Institution, and professors in several distinguished universities. Many men have been patient and untiring in assistance and helpful criticism, and to these I render warm thanks for myself and for the readers who may benefit by their work. End of Preface Part 1 of The Book of the National Parks This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard On the Appreciation of Scenery To the average educated American, scenery is a pleasing hodgepodge of mountains, valleys, plains, lakes, and rivers. To him, the glacier-hollowed valley of Yosemite, the stream-scooped abyss of the Grand Canyon, the volcanic gulf of Crater Lake, the bristling granite core of the Rockies, and the ancient ice-carved shales of Glacier National Park are all one, just scenery, magnificent, incomparable, meaningless. As a people, we have been content to wonder, not to know. Yet with scenery, as with all else, to know is to begin fully to enjoy. 
appreciation measures enjoyment and this brings me to my proposition namely that we shall not really enjoy our possession of the grandest scenery in the world until we realize that scenery is the written page of the history of creation and until we learn to read that page the national parks of america include areas of the noblest and most diversified scenic sublimity easily accessible in the world nevertheless it is their chiefest glory that they are among the completest expressions of the earth's history the american people is waking rapidly to the magnitude of its scenic possession it has yet to learn to appreciate it nevertheless we love scenery we are a nation of sightseers the year before the world war stopped all things we spent two hundred and eighty million dollars in going to europe that summer switzerland's receipts from the sale of transportation and board to persons coming from foreign lands to see her scenery was one hundred million dollars and more than half it has been stated apparently with authority came from america that same year tourist travel became canada's fourth largest source of income exceeding in gross receipts even her fisheries and the greater part came from the united states it is a matter of record that seven-tenths of the hotel registrations in the canadian rockies were from south of the border had we then known as a nation that there was just as good scenery of its kind in the united states and many more kinds we would have gone to see that it is a national trait to buy the best since then we have discovered this important fact and are crowding to our national parks is it true a woman asked me at the foot of yosemite falls that this is the highest unbroken waterfall in the world she was the average tourist met there by chance i assured her that such was the fact i called attention to the apparent deliberation of the water's fall a trick of the senses resulting from failure to realize height and distance to think they are the highest in the world she mused i told her that the soft fingers of water had carved this valley three thousand feet into the solid granite and that ice had polished its walls and i estimated for her the ages since the merced river flowed at the level of the cataract's brink i have seen the tallest building in the world she replied dreamily and the longest railroad and the largest lake and the highest monument and the biggest department store and now i see the highest waterfall just think of it if one has illusions concerning the average tourist let him compare the hundreds who gape at the paint pots and geysers of yellowstone with the dozens who exult in the sublimated glory of the colorful canyon or let him listen to the table talk of a party returned from crater lake or let him recall the statistical superlatives which made up his friend's last letter from the grand canyon i am not condemning wonder which in its place is a legitimate and pleasurable emotion as a condiment to sharpen an accent and abounding sense of beauty it has real and abiding value love of beauty is practically a universal passion it is that which lures millions into fields valleys woods and mountains on every holiday which crowds our ocean lanes and railroads the fact that few of these rejoicing millions are aware of their own motive and that strangely enough a few even would be ashamed to make the admission if they became aware of it has nothing to do with the fact it's a wise man that knows his own motives the fact that still fewer whether aware or not of the reason of their happiness are capable of making the least expression of it also has nothing to do with the fact the tourist woman whom i met at the foot of yosemite falls may have felt secretly suffocated by the filmy grandeur of the incomparable spectacle notwithstanding that she was conscious of no higher emotion than the cheap wonder of a superlative the grand canyon's rim is the stillest crowded place i know i've stood among a hundred people on the precipice and heard the whir of a bird's wings in the abyss probably the majority of those silent gazers were suffering something akin to pain at their inability to give vent to the emotions bursting within them i believe that the statement cannot be successfully challenged that as a people our enjoyment of scenery is almost wholly emotional love of beauty spiced by wonder is the equipment for enjoyment of the average intelligent traveller of to-day now add to this a more or less equal part of the intellectual pleasure of comprehension and you have the equipment of the average intelligent traveller of to-morrow to hasten this to-morrow is one of the several objects of this book to see in the carved and colourful depths of the grand canyon not only the stupendous abyss whose terrible beauty grips the soul but also to-day's chapter in a thrilling story of creation whose beginning lay untold centuries back in the ages whose scene covers three hundred thousand square miles of our wonderful southwest 
whose actors include the greatest forces of nature, whose tremendous episodes shame the imagination of Doré, and whose logical end invites suggestions before which finite minds shrink. This is to come into the presence of the great spectacle properly equipped for its enjoyment. But how many who see the Grand Canyon get more out of it than merely the beauty that grips the soul? So it is throughout the world of scenery. The geologic story written on the cliffs of Crater Lake is more stupendous than even the glory of its indigo bowl. The war of titanic forces described in simple language on the rocks of Glacier National Park is unexcelled in sublimity in the history of mankind. The story of Yellowstone's making multiplies many times the thrill occasioned by its world-famed spectacle. Even the simplest and smallest rock details often tell thrilling incidents of prehistoric times out of which the enlightened imagination reconstructs the romances and the tragedies of Earth's earlier days. How eloquent, for example, was the small, water-worn fragment of dull coal we found on the limestone slope of one of Glacier's mountains. Impossible companionship, the one the product of forest, the other of submerged depths. Instantly I glimpsed the distant age when thousands of feet above the very spot upon which I stood, but then at sea level, bloomed a Cretaceous forest, whose broken trunks and matted foliage decayed in bogs where they slowly turned to coal, coal which, exposed and disintegrated during intervening ages, has long since, all but a few small fragments like this, washed into the headwaters of the Saskatchewan to merge eventually into the muds of Hudson Bay. And then, still dreaming, my mind leaped millions of years still further back to lake bottoms where, ten thousand feet below the spot on which I stood, gathered the pre-Cambrian ooze which later hardened into this very limestone." from ooze a score of thousand feet, a hundred million years, to coal, and both lie here together now in my palm. Filled thus with visions of a perspective beyond human comprehension, with what multiplied intensity of interest I now return to the noble view from Gable Mountain. In pleading for a higher understanding of nature's method and accomplishment as a precedent to study and observation of our national parks, I seek enormously to enrich the enjoyment not only of these supreme examples, but of all examples of world-making. The same readings which will prepare you to enjoy the full message of our national parks will invest your neighborhood hills at home, your creek and river and prairie, your vacation valleys, the landscape through your car window, even your wayside ditch, with living interest. I invite you to a new and fascinating earth, an earth interesting, vital, personal, beloved, because at last known and understood." It requires no great study to know and understand the earth well enough for such purpose as this. One does not have to dim his eyes with acres of maps, or become a plodding geologist, or learn to distinguish schists from granites, or to classify plants by table, or to call wild geese and marmots by their Latin names. It is true that geography, geology, physiography, mineralogy, botany, and zoology must each contribute their share toward the condition of intelligence which will enable you to realize appreciation of nature's amazing earth, but the share of each is so small that the problem will be solved not by exhaustive study, but by the selection of essential parts. Two or three popular books which interpret natural science in perspective should pleasurably accomplish your purpose. But once begun, I predict that few will fail to carry certain subjects beyond the mere essentials, while some will enter for life into a land of new delights. Let us, for illustration, consider for a moment the making of America. The earth, composed of countless aggregations of matter, drawn together from the skies, whirled into a globe, settled into a solid mass surrounded by an atmosphere carrying water like a sponge, has reached the stage of development when land and sea have divided the surface between them, and successions of heat and frost, snow, ice, rain, and flood are busy with their ceaseless carving of the land. Already mountains are wearing down, and sea bottoms are building up with their refuse. Sediments carried by the rivers are deposited in strata, which some day will harden into rock. We are looking now at the close of the era which geologists call Archean, because it is ancient beyond knowledge. A few of its rocks are known, but not well enough for many definite conclusions. All the earth's vast mysterious past is lumped under this title. The definite history of the earth begins with the close of the dim Archean era. It is the lapse from then till now, a few hundred million years at most, out of all infinity, 
which ever can greatly concern man, for during this time were laid the only rocks whose reading was assisted by the presence of fossils. During this time the continents attained their final shape, the mountains rose, and valleys, plains, and rivers formed and reformed many times before assuming the passing forms which they now show. During this time also, life evolved from its inferred beginnings in the late Archean to the complicated, finely developed, and in man's case, highly mentalized and spiritualized organization of today. Surely the geologist's field of labor is replete with interest, inspiration, even romance. But because it has become so saturated with technicality as to become almost a popular bugaboo, let us attempt no special study, but rather call from its voluminous records those simple facts and perspectives which will reveal to us this greatest of all story-books, our old earth, as the volume of enchantment that it really is. With the passing of the Archean, the earth had not yet settled into the perfectly balanced sphere which nature destined it to be. In some places the rock was more compactly squeezed than in others, and these denser masses eventually were forced violently into neighbor masses, which were not so tightly squeezed. These movements far below the surface shifted the surface balance, and became one of many complicated and little-known causes impelling the crust here to slowly rise and there to slowly fall. Thus, in places, sea bottoms lifted above the surface and became land, while lands elsewhere settled and became seas. There are areas which have alternated many times between land and sea. This is why we find limestones, which were formed in the sea, overlying shales, which were formed in fresh water, which in turn overlie sandstones, which once were beaches, all these now in plateaus, thousands of feet above the ocean's level. Sometimes these mysterious internal forces lifted the surface in long waves. Thus mountain chains and mountain systems were created. Often their summits, worn down by frosts and rains, disclosed the core of rock which, ages before, then hot and fluid, had underlain the crust and bent it upward into mountain form. Now cold and hard, these masses are disclosed as the granite of today's landscape, or as other igneous rocks of Earth's interior, which now cover broad surface areas, mingled with the stratified or water-made rocks which the surface only produces. But this has not always been the fate of the undersurface molten rocks, for sometimes they have burst by volcanic vents clear through the crust of the Earth, where, turned instantly to pumice and lava by release from pressure, they build great surface cones, cover broad plains, and fill basins and valleys. Thus were created the three great divisions of the rocks, which form the three great divisions of scenery, the sediments, the granites, and the lavas. During these changes in the levels of enormous surface areas, the frosts and water have been industriously working down the elevations of the land. Nature forever seeks a level. The snows of winter, melting at midday, sink into the rock's minutest cracks. Expanded by the frost, the imprisoned water pries open and chips the surface. The rains of spring and summer wash the chippings and other debris into rivulets, which carry them into mountain torrents, which rush them into rivers, which sweep them into oceans, which deposit them for the upbuilding of the bottoms. Always the level. Thousands of square miles of California were built up from ocean's bottom with sediments, chiseled from the mountains of Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah, and swept seaward through the Grand Canyon. These mills grind without rest or pause. The atmosphere gathers the moisture from the sea, the winds roll it in clouds to the land, the mountains catch and chill the clouds, and the resulting rains hurry back to the sea in rivers, bearing heavy freights of soil. Spring, summer, autumn, winter, day and night, the mills of nature labor unceasingly to produce her level. If ever this earth is really finished to nature's liking, it will be as round and polished as a billiard ball. Years mean nothing in the computation of the prehistoric past. Who can conceive a thousand centuries, to say nothing of a million years? Yet either is inconsiderable against the total lapse of time, even from the Archean's close till now. And so geologists have devised an easier method of count, measured not by units of time, but by what each phase of progress has accomplished. This measure is set forth in the accompanying table, together with a conjecture concerning the lapse of time in terms of years. The most illuminating accomplishment of the table, however, is its bird's-eye view of the procession of the evolution of life from the first inference of its existence to its climax of today, 
and, concurrent with this progress, is suggestion of the growth and development of scenic America. It is, in effect, the table of contents of a volume whose thrilling text and stupendous illustrations are engraved immortally in the rocks, a volume whose ultimate secrets, the scholarship of all time, perhaps will never fully decipher, but whose dramatic outlines and many of whose most thrilling incidents are open to all at the expense of a little study at home and a little thoughtful seeing in the places where the facts are pictured in lines so big and graphic that none may miss their meanings. Man's colossal egotism is rudely shaken before the procession of the ages. Aghast, he discovers that the billions of years which have wrought this earth from stardust were not merely God's laborious preparation of a habitation fit for so admirable an occupant, that man, on the contrary, is nothing more or less than the present master tenant of earth, the highest type of hundreds of millions of years of succeeding tenants, only because he is the latest in evolution. Who can safely declare that the day will not come when a new Yellowstone, hurled from reopened volcanoes, shall found itself upon the buried ruin of the present Yellowstone, when the present Sierra shall have disappeared into the Pacific, and the deserts of the Great Basin become the gardens of the hemisphere, when a new rocky mountain system shall have grown upon the eroded and dissipated granites of the present, when shallow seas shall join anew Hudson Bay with the Gulf of Mexico, when a new and lofty Appalachian range shall replace the rounded summits of today, when a race of beings as superior to man, intellectually and spiritually, as man is superior to the ape, shall endeavor to reconstruct a picture of man from the occasional remnants which floods may wash into view. Fantastic, you may say. It is fantastic. So far as I know, there exists not one fact upon which definite predictions such as these may be based, but also there exists not one fact which warrants specific denial of predictions such as these. And if inference whatever may be made from Earth's history, it is the inevitable inference that the period in which man lives is merely one step in an evolution of matter, mind, and spirit which looks forward to changes as mighty or mightier than those I have suggested. With so inspiring an outline, the study to which I invite you can be nothing but pleasurable. Space does not permit the development of the theme in the pages which follow, but the book will have failed if it does not, incidental to its main purposes, entangle the reader in the charm of America's adventurous past. Progress of Creation Chart of the Divisions of Geologic Time and an estimate in years based on the assumption that a hundred million years have elapsed since the close of the Archean period, together with a condensed table of the evolution of life from its inferred beginnings in the Archean to the present time. Read from the bottom up. Archaeozoic Era, Archean Period. No fossils found, but life inferred from the existence of iron ores and limestones, which are generally formed in the presence of organisms. Proterozoic Era, 33 millions of years. Algonquian Period. The first life which left a distinct record. Very primitive forms of water life, crustaceans, brachiopods, and algae. The Paleozoic Era of Old Life. 45 millions of years. The Cambrian period. More highly developed forms of water life, trilobites and brachiopods, most abundant, algae. Ordovician period. Sea animals develop shells, especially cephalopods and mollusk-like brachiopods, trilobites at their height. First appearance of insects. First appearance of fishes. Silurian period. Shellfish develop fully, Appearance and culmination of crinoids or sea lilies, and large scorpion-like crustaceans. First appearance of reef-building corals. Development of fishes. Devonian period. The age of fishes. Evolution of many forms. Fish of great size. First appearance of amphibians and land plants. Mesozoic era of intermediate life. Sixteen millions of years. Carboniferous period. Permian, Pennsylvanian, and Mississippian epochs. The Age of Amphibians, the Coal Age. Sharks and sea animals with nautilus-like shells. Evolution of land plants in many complex forms. First appearance of land vertebrates. First flowering plants. First cone-bearing trees. Club mosses and ferns highly developed. 
Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods. The Age of Reptiles Shellfish with complex shells Enormous land reptiles Flying reptiles and the evolution therefrom of birds First palms First hardwood trees First mammals Cenozoic era of recent life Six millions of years Tertiary period Pliocene, Miocene, Oligocene, and Eocene epochs The age of mammals Rise and development of the highest orders of plants and animals. Quaternary period. Recent Pleistocene or Ice Age epochs. The age of man. Animals and plants of the modern type. First record of man occurs in the early Pleistocene. Footnote. Explanatory of the estimate of geologic time in the preceding table. The general assumption of modern geologists is that a hundred million years have elapsed since the close of the Archean period. At least this is a round number, convenient for thinking and discussion. The recent tendency has been greatly to increase conceptions of geologic time over the highly conservative estimates of a few years ago, and a strong disposition is shown to regard the Algonquian period as one of very great length, extremists even suggesting that it may have equaled all time since. For the purposes of this popular book, then, let us conceive that the earth has existed for a hundred million years since Archean times, and that one-third of this was Algonquian, and let us apportion the two-thirds remaining among succeeding errors in the average of the proportions adopted by Professor Joseph Barrell of Yale University, whose recent speculations upon geologic time have attracted wide attention. End of footnote to the table. End of part one Part two of the Book of the National Parks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard. The National Parks of the United States. The National Parks of the United States are areas of supreme scenic splendor or other unique quality which Congress has set apart for the pleasure and benefit of the people. At this writing, they number eighteen, sixteen of which lie within the boundaries of the United States and are reached by rail and road. Those of greater importance have excellent roads, good trails, and hotels or hotel camps, or both, for the accommodation of visitors. Also, public campgrounds, where visitors may pitch their own tents. Outside the United States, there are two national parks, one enclosing three celebrated volcanic craters, the other conserving the loftiest mountain on the continent. 1. The starting point for any consideration of our national parks necessarily is the recently realized fact of their supremacy in world scenery it was the sensational force of this realization which intensely attracted public attention at the outset of the new movement many thousands hastened to see these wonders and their reports spread the tidings throughout the land and gave the movement its increasing impetus the simple facts are these the swiss alps except for several unmatchable individual features are excelled in beauty sublimity and variety by several of our own national parks, and these same parks possess other distinguished individual features unrepresented in kind or splendor in the Alps. The Canadian Rockies are more than matched in rich coloring by our Glacier National Park. Glacier is the Canadian Rockies done in Grand Canyon colors. It has no peer. The Yellowstone outranks by far any similar volcanic area in the world. It contains more and greater geysers than all the rest of the world together, the next in rank are divided between Iceland and New Zealand. Its famous canyon is alone of its quality of beauty. Except for portions of the African jungle, the Yellowstone is probably the most populated wild animal area in the world, and its wild animals are comparatively fearless, even sometimes friendly. Mount Rainier has a single peak glacier system whose equal has not yet been discovered. Twenty-eight living glaciers, some of them very large, spread octopus-like from its center. It is four hours by rail or motor from Tacoma. Crater Lake is the deepest and bluest accessible lake in the world, occupying the whole left after one of our largest volcanoes had slipped back into Earth's interior through its own rim. Yosemite possesses a valley whose compelling beauty the world acknowledges as supreme. The valley is the center of 1,100 square miles of high-altitude wilderness. The sequoia contains more than a million sequoia trees, 
12,000 of which are more than 10 feet in diameter, and some of which are the largest and oldest living things in the wide world. The Grand Canyon of Arizona is by far the hugest and noblest example of erosion in the world. It is gorgeously carved and colored. In sheer sublimity, it offers an unequaled spectacle. Mount McKinley stands more than 20,000 feet above sea level and 17,000 feet above the surrounding valleys. Scenically, it is the world's loftiest mountain, for the monsters of the Andes and the Himalayas, which surpass it in altitude, can be viewed closely only from valleys from five to 10,000 feet higher than McKinley's northern valleys. The Hawaii National Park contains the fourth greatest dead crater in the world, the hugest living volcano, and the Kilauea Lake of Fire, which is unique and draws visitors from the world's four quarters. These are the principal features of America's world supremacy. They are incidental to a system of scenic wildernesses which in combined area, as well as variety, exceed the combined scenic wilderness playgrounds of similar class, comfortably accessible elsewhere. No wonder, then, that the American public is overjoyed with its recently realized treasure, and that the government looks confidently to the rapid development of its newfound economic asset. The American public has discovered America, and no one who knows the American public doubts for a moment what it will do with it. 2. The idea still widely obtains that our national parks are principally playgrounds. A distinguished member of Congress recently asked, Why make these appropriations? More people visited Rock Creek Park here in the city of Washington last Sunday afternoon than went to the Yosemite all last summer. The country has endless woods and mountains, which cost the Treasury nothing. This view entirely misses the point. The national parks are recreational, of course. So are state, county, and city parks. So are resorts of every kind. So are the fields, the woods, the seashore, the open country everywhere. We are living in an open-air age. The nation of outdoor livers is a nation of power, initiative, and sanity. I hope to see the time when available state lands everywhere, when every square mile from our national forest reserve, when even many private holdings are made accessible and comfortable, and become habited with summer trampers and campers. It is the way to individual power and national efficiency. But the national parks are far more than recreational areas. They are the supreme examples. They are the gallery of masterpieces. Here the visitor enters in a holier spirit. Here is inspiration. They are also the museums of the ages. Here nature is still creating the earth upon a scale so vast and so plain that even the dull and the frivolous cannot fail to see and comprehend. This is no distinction without a difference. The difference is so marked that few indeed even of those who visit our national parks in a frivolous or merely recreational mood remain in that mood. The spirit of the great places brooks nothing short of silent reverence. I have seen men unconsciously lift their hats. The mind strips itself of affairs as one sheds a coat. It is the hour of the spirit. One returns to daily living with a springier step, a keener vision, and a broader horizon for having worshipped at the shrine of the infinite. 3. The Pacific Coast Expositions of 1915 marked the beginning of the nation's acquaintance with its national parks. In fact, they were the occasion, if not the cause, of the movement for national parks' development, which found so quickly a countrywide response, and which is destined to results of large importance to individual and nation alike. Because thousands of those whom the expositions were expected to draw westward would avail of the opportunity to visit national parks, Secretary Lane, to whom the national parks suggested neglected opportunity requiring business experience to develop, induced Stephen T. Mather, a Chicago businessman with mountaintop enthusiasms, to undertake their preparation for the unaccustomed throngs. Mr. Mather's vision embraced a correlated system of superlative scenic areas which should become the familiar playgrounds of the whole American people, a system which, if organized and administered with the efficiency of a great business, should even become, in time, the rendezvous of the sightseers of the world. He foresaw in the national parks a new and great national economic asset. The educational and other propaganda by which this movement was presented to the people, which the writer had the honor to plan and execute, won rapidly the wide support of the public. To me, the national parks appealed powerfully as the potential museums and classrooms for the popular study of the natural forces 
which made, and are still making, America, and of American fauna and flora. Here were set forth, in fascinating picture, and lines so plain that none could fail to read and understand, the essentials of sciences whose real charm are rapid educational methods in part to few. This book is the logical outgrowth of a close study of the national parks, beginning with the inception of the new movement from this point of view. How free from the partisan considerations common in governmental organization was the birth of the movement is shown by an incident of Mr. Mather's inauguration into his assistant secretaryship. Secretary Lane had seen him at his desk and had started back to his own room, but he returned, looked in at the door, and asked, "'Oh, by the way, Steve, what are your politics?' This book considers our national parks as they line up four years after the beginning of this movement. It shows them well started upon the long road to realization, with Congress, government, and the people united toward a common end, with the schools and the universities interested, and for the first time with the railroads, the concessioners, the motoring interests, and many of the public-spirited educational and outdoor associations all pulling together under the inspiration of a recognized common motive. Of course, this triumph of organization, for it is no less, could not have been accomplished nearly so quickly without the assistance of the closing of Europe by the Great War. Previous to 1915, Americans had been spending $300 million a year in European travel. Nor could it have been accomplished at all if investigation and comparison had not shown that our national parks excel in supreme scenic quality and variety, the combined scenery which is comfortably accessible in all the rest of the world together. To get the situation at the beginning of our book into full perspective, it must be recognized that, previous to the beginning of our propaganda in 1915, the national parks as such scarcely existed in the public consciousness. Few Americans could name more than two or three of the fourteen existing parks. The Yosemite Valley and the Yellowstone alone were generally known, but scarcely as national parks. Most of the school geographies which mentioned them at all ignored their national character. The advertising folders of competing railroads were the principal sources of public knowledge, for few indeed asked for the compilation of rates and charges which the government then sent in response to inquiries for information. The parks had practically no administration. The business necessarily connected with their upkeep and development was done by clerks as minor and troublesome details which distracted attention from more important duties. There was no one clerk whose entire concern was with the national parks. The American public still looked confidently upon the Alps as the supreme scenic area in the world, and hoped some day to see the Canadian Rockies. 4. Originally, the motive in park-making had been unalloyed conservation. It is as if Congress had said, Let us lock this up, where no one can run away with it. We don't need it now, but some day it may be valuable. That was the instinct that led to the reservation of the Hot Springs of Arkansas in 1832, the first national park. Forty years later, when official investigation proved the truth of the amazing tales of Yellowstone's natural wonders, it was the instinct which led to the reservation of that largely unexplored area as the second national park. Seventeen years after Yellowstone, when newspapers and scientific magazines recounted the ethnological importance of the Casa Grande ruin in Arizona, it resulted in the creation of the third national park, notwithstanding that the area so conserved enclosed less than a square mile, which contained nothing of the kind and quality which today we recognize as essential to parkhood. This closed what may be regarded as the initial period of national parks conservation. It was wholly instinctive. Distinctions, objectives, and policies were undreamed of. Less than two years after Casa Grande, which, by the way, has recently been reclassed a national monument, what may be called the Middle Period began brilliantly with the creation in 1890 of the Yosemite, the Sequoia, and the General Grant National Parks, all parks in the true sense of the word, and all of the first order of scenic magnificence. Nine years later, Mount Rainier was added, and two years after, that wonderful Crater Lake, both meeting fully the new standard. What followed was human and natural. The term National Park had begun to mean something in the neighborhoods of the parks. Yellowstone and Yosemite had long been household words, and the introduction of other areas to their distinguished company fired local pride in neighboring states. Why should we not have national parks too? people asked. 
Congress, always the reflection of the popular will, and therefore not always abreast of the moment, was unprepared with reasons. Thus, during 1903 and 1904, there were added to the list areas in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Oklahoma, which were better fitted for state parks than for association with the distinguished company of the nation's noblest. A reaction followed, and resulted in what we may call the modern period. Far-sighted men, in and out of Congress, began to compare and look ahead. No hint yet of the splendid destiny of our national parks, now so clearly defined, entered the minds of these men at this time, but ideas of selection, of development and utilization, undoubtedly began to take form. At least conservation, as such, ceased to become a sole motive. Insensibly, Congress, or at least a few men of vision in Congress, began to take account of stock and figure on realization. This healthy growth was helped materially by the public demand for the improvement of several of the national parks. No thought of appropriating money to improve the bathing facilities of hot springs had affected congressional action for nearly half a century. It was enough that the curative springs had been saved from private ownership. Yellowstone was considered so altogether extraordinary, however, that Congress began in 1879 to appropriate yearly for its approach by road and for the protection of its springs and geysers. But this was because Yellowstone appealed to the public sense of wonder. It took twenty years more for Congress to understand that the public sense of beauty was also worth appropriations. Yosemite had been a national park for nine years before it received a dollar, and then only when the public demand for roads, trails, and accommodations became insistent. But once born, the idea took root and spread. It was fed by the press and magazine reports of the glories of the newer national parks, then attracting some public attention. It helped discrimination in the comparison of the minor parks created in 1903 and 1904 with the greater ones which had proceeded. The realization that the parks must be developed at public expense sharpened congressional judgment as to what areas should and should not become national parks. From that time on, Congress has made no mistakes in selecting national parks. Mesa Verde became a park in 1905, Glacier in 1910, Rocky Mountain in 1915, Hawaii and Lassen Volcanic in 1916, Mount McKinley in 1917, and Lafayette and the Grand Canyon in 1919. From that time on, Congress, most conservatively, it is true, has backed its judgment with increasing appropriations, and in 1916 it created the National Park Service, a bureau of the Department of the Interior, to administer them in accordance with a definite policy. 5. The distinction between the national forests and the national parks is essential to understanding. The national forests constitute an enormous domain administered for the economic commercialization of the nation's wealth of lumber. Its forests are handled scientifically, with the object of securing the largest annual lumber output consistent with the proper conservation of the future. Its spirit is commercial. The spirit of national park conservation is exactly opposite. It seeks no great territory, only those few spots which are supreme. It aims to preserve nature's handiwork exactly as nature made it. No tree is cut except to make way for road, trail, or hotel to enable the visitor to penetrate and live among nature's secrets. Hunting is excellent in some of our national forests, but there is no game in the national parks. In these, wild animals are part of nature's exhibits, they are protected as friends. It follows that forests and parks, so different in spirit and purpose, must be handled wholly separately. Even the rangers and scientific experts have objects so opposite and different that the same individual cannot efficiently serve both purposes. High specialization in both services is essential to success. Another distinction which should be made is the difference between a national park and a national monument. The one is an area of size created by Congress upon the assumption that it is a supreme example of its kind and with the purpose of developing it for public occupancy and enjoyment. The other is made by presidential proclamation to conserve an area or object which is historically, ethnologically, or scientifically important. Size is not considered, and development is not contemplated. The distinction is often lost in practice. Casa Grande is essentially a national monument, but had the status of a national park until 1918. The Grand Canyon, from every point of view a national park, was created a national monument and remained such 
until 1919. The National Parks at a Glance Number 18 Total Area 10,739 Square Miles National Parks in Order of Creation Location, Area and Square Miles, and Distinctive Characteristics Hot Springs, 1832, Middle Arkansas, one and one half square miles, forty six hot springs possessing curative properties, many hotels and boarding houses, twenty bath houses under public control. Yellowstone, eighteen seventy two, northwestern Wyoming, three thousand three hundred forty eight square miles, more geysers than in all the rest of the world together, boiling springs, mud volcanoes, petrified forest, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, remarkable for gorgeous coloring, large lakes, many large streams and waterfalls, greatest wild bird and animal preserve in the world. Sequoia, 1890, Middle Eastern California, 252 square miles, the Big Tree National Park, 12,000 sequoia trees over 10 feet in diameter, some 25 to 36 feet in diameter, towering mountain ranges, startling precipices, large limestone cave. Yosemite, 1890, Middle Eastern California, 1,125 square miles, valley of world-famed beauty, lofty cliffs, romantic vistas, many waterfalls of extraordinary height, three groves of big trees, high sierra, water wheel falls. General Grant, 1890, Middle Eastern California, four square miles, created to preserve the celebrated General Grant tree, 35 feet in diameter, six miles from Sequoia National Park. Mount Rainier, 1899, West Central Washington, 324 square miles, largest accessible single peak glacier system, 28 glaciers, some of large size, 48 square miles of glacier, 50 to 500 feet thick, wonderful subalpine wild flower fields. Crater Lake, 1902, southwestern Oregon, 249 square miles, lake of extraordinary blue and crater of extinct volcano, Sides 1,000 feet high, interesting lava formations. Wind Cave, 1903, South Dakota, 17 square miles. Cavern having many miles of galleries and numerous chambers containing peculiar formations. Platte, 1904, South Oklahoma, 1 and one third square mile. Many sulfur and other springs possessing medicinal value. Sully's Hill, 1904, North Dakota, one and one half square mile, small park with woods, streams, and a lake. It is an important wild animal preserve. Mesa Verde, 1906, southwest Colorado, 77 square miles, most notable and best preserved prehistoric cliff dwellings in the United States, if not in the world. Glacier, 1910, northwestern Montana. 1,534 square miles, rugged mountain region of unsurpassed alpine character, 250 glacier-fed lakes of romantic beauty, 60 small glaciers, sensational scenery of marked individuality. Rocky Mountain, 1915, North Middle Colorado, 398 square miles, heart of the Rockies, snowy range, peaks 11,000 to 14,250 feet altitude, Remarkable Records of Glacial Period Hawaii, 1916 Hawaiian Islands, 118 square miles Three separate volcanic areas Kilauea and Mauna Loa on Hawaii Haleakala on Maui Lassen Volcano, 1916 Northern California, 124 square miles Only active volcano in United States proper Lassen Peak, 10,465 feet Cinder Cone, 6,879 feet, Hot Springs, Mud Geysers. Mount McKinley, 1917, South Central Alaska, 2,200 square miles, highest mountain in North America, rises higher above surrounding country than any other mountain in the world. Grand Canyon, 1919, North Central Arizona, 958 square miles, the greatest example of erosion and the most sublime spectacle in the world, one mile deep and eight to twelve miles wide, brilliantly colored. Lafayette, 1919, Maine Coast, eight square miles, 
the group of granite mountains on Mount Desert Island. End of part two. Part three of the Book of the National Parks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard. The Granite National Parks. Granite's Part in Scenery. The Granite National Parks are Yosemite, Sequoia, including the proposed Roosevelt Park, General Grant, Rocky Mountain, and Mount McKinley. Granite, as its name denotes, is granular in texture and appearance. It is crystalline, which means that it is imperfectly crystallized. It is composed of quartz, feldspar, and mica in varying proportions, and includes several common varieties which mineralogists distinguish scientifically by separate names. Because of its great range and abundance, its presence at the core of mountain ranges where it is uncovered by erosion, its attractive coloring, its massiveness, and its vigorous personality, it figures importantly in scenery of magnificence the world over. In color, granite varies from light gray, when it shines like silver upon the high summits, to warm rose or dark gray, the reds deepening upon the proportion of feldspar in its composition. It produces scenic effects very different indeed from those resulting from volcanic and sedimentary rocks. While it bulks hugely in the higher mountains, running to enormous rounded masses below the level of the glaciers, and to jagged spires and pinnacled walls upon the loftiest peaks, it is found also in many regions of hill and plain. It is one of our commonest American rocks. Much of the loftiest and noblest scenery of the world is wrought in granite. The Alps, the Andes, and the Himalayas, all of which are world celebrated for their lofty grandeur, are prevailingly granite. They abound in towering peaks, bristling ridges, and terrifying precipices. Their glacial cirques are girt with fantastically toothed and pinnacled walls. This is true of all granite ranges which are lofty enough to maintain glaciers. These are, in fact, the very characteristics of Alpine, Andean, Himalayan, Sierran, Alaskan, and Rocky Mountain summit landscape. It is why granite mountains are the favorites of those daring climbers whose ambition is to equal established records and make new ones. And this, in turn, is why some mountain neighborhoods become so much more celebrated than others, which are quite as fine or finer, because, I mean, of the publicity given to this kind of mountain climbing, and of the unwarranted assumption that the mountains associated with these exploits necessarily excel others in sublimity. As a matter of fact, the accident of fashion has even more to do with the fame of mountains than of men. But by no means all granite mountains are lofty. The White Mountains, for example, which parallel our northeastern coast and are far older than the Rockies and the Sierra, are a low granite range, with few of the characteristics of those mountains which lift their heads among the perpetual snows. On the contrary, they tend to rounded forested summits and knobby peaks. This results in part from a longer subjection of the rock surface to the eroding influence of successive frosts and rains than is the case with high ranges which are perpetually locked in frost. Besides, the ice sheets which planed off the northern part of the United States lopped away their highest parts. There are also millions of square miles of eroded granite which are not mountains at all. These tend to rolling surfaces. The scenic forms assumed by granite will be better appreciated when one understands how it enters landscape. The principal one of many igneous rocks, it is liquefied under intense heat and afterward cooled under pressure. Much of the earth's crust was once underlaid by granites in a more or less fluid state. When terrific internal pressures caused the earth's crust to fold and make mountains, this liquefied granite invaded the folds and pushed close up under the highest elevations. There it cooled. Thousands of centuries later, when erosion had worn away these mountain crests, there lay revealed the solid granite core which frost and glacier have since transformed into the bristling ramparts of today's landscape. End of Part 3 Part 4 of the Book of the National Parks This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard Yosemite, the Incomparable Yosemite National Park, Middle Eastern California 
area 1,125 square miles. The first emotion inspired by the sight of Yosemite is surprise. No previous preparation makes the mind ready for the actual revelation. The hardest preliminary reading and the closest study of photographs, even familiarity with other mountains as lofty or loftier, fail to dull one's first astonishment. Hard on the heels of astonishment comes realization of the park's supreme beauty. It is of its own kind, without comparison, as individual as that of the Grand Canyon or the Glacier National Park. No single visit will begin to reveal its sublimity. One must go away and return to look again with rested eyes. Its devotees grow in appreciative enjoyment with repeated summerings. Even John Muir, life student, interpreter, and apostle of the Sierra, confessed toward the close of his many years that the valley's quality of loveliness continued to surprise him at each renewal. And lastly comes the higher emotion, which is born of knowledge. It is only when one reads in these inspired rocks the stirring story of their making that pleasure reaches its fullness. The added joy of the collector upon finding that the unsigned canvas, which he bought only for its beauty, is the lost work of a great master, and was associated with the romance of a famous past, is here duplicated. Written history never was more romantic nor more graphically told than that which nature has inscribed upon the walls of these vast canyons, domes, and monoliths in a language which man has learned to read. 1. The Yosemite National Park lies on the western slope of the Sierra Nevada Mountains in California, nearly east of San Francisco. The snowy crest of the Sierra, bellying irregularly eastward to a climax among the jagged granites and gale-swept glaciers of Mount Lyell, forms its eastern boundary. From this, the park slopes rapidly, 30 miles or more westward, to the heart of the warm, luxuriant zone of the giant sequoias. This slope includes in its 1,125 square miles some of the highest scenic examples in the wide gamut of Sierra grandeur. It is impossible to enter it without exultation of spirit, or describe it without superlative. A very large proportion of Yosemite's visitors see nothing more than the valley, yet no consideration is tenable which conceives the valley as other than a small part of the national park. The two are inseparable. One does not speak of knowing the Louvre, who has seen only the Venus de Milo, or St. Mark's, who has looked only upon its horses. Considered as a whole, the park is a sagging plain of solid granite, hung from Sierra's sawtooth crest, broken into divides and transverse mountain ranges, punctured by volcanic summits, gashed and bitten by prehistoric glaciers, dotted near its summits with glacial lakes, furrowed by innumerable cascading streams, which combine in singing rivers, which in turn furrow greater canyons, some of majestic depth and grandeur. It is a land of towering spires and ambitious summits, serrated cirques, enormous isolated rock masses, rounded granite domes, polished granite pavements, lofty precipices, and long, shimmering waterfalls. Bare and gale-ridden near its crest, the park descends in thirty miles through all the zones and gradations of animal and vegetable life through which one would pass in traveling from the ice-bound shores of the Arctic Ocean, the continent's length, to Mariposa Grove. Its tree sequence tells the story. Above Timberline, there are none but inch-high willows and flat piney growths, mingled with tiny Arctic flowers, which shrink in size with elevation. Even the sheltered spots on Lyle's lofty summit have their colored lichens and their almost microscopic bloom. At Timberline, low, wiry shrubs interweave their branches to defy the gales, merging lower down into a tangle of many stunted growths, from which spring twisted pines and contorted spruces, which the winds curve to leeward, or bend at sharp angles, or spread in full development as prostrate upon the ground as the mountain lion's skin upon the home floor of his slayer. Descending into the great area of the Canadian zone, with its thousand wild valleys, its shining lakes, its roaring creeks and plunging rivers, the zone of the angler, the hiker, and the camper out, we enter forests of various pines, of silver fir, hemlock, aged humpback juniper, and the species of white pine which Californians wrongly call tamarack. This is the paradise of outdoor living. It almost never rains between June and October. The forests fill the valley floors, thinning rapidly as they climb the mountain slopes. They spot with pine green the broad shining plateaus, rooting where they find the soil, 
leaving unclothed innumerable glistening areas of polished, uncracked granite, a striking characteristic of Yosemite uplands. From an altitude of seven or eight thousand feet, the Canadian zone forests begin gradually to merge into the richer forests of the transition zone below. The towering sugar pine, the giant yellow pine, the Douglas fir, and a score of deciduous growths, live oaks, bays, poplars, dogwoods, maples, begin to appear and become more frequent with descent, until two thousand feet or more below, they combine into the bright, stupendous forest where, in specially favored groves, King Sequoia holds his royal court. Wild flowers, birds, and animals also run the gamut of the zones. Among the snows and alpine flowerets of the summits are found the ptarmigan and rosy finch of the Arctic Circle, and in the summit cirques and on the shores of the glacial lakes whistles the mountain marmot. The richness and variety of wildflower life in all zones, each of its characteristic kind, astonishes the visitor new to the American wilderness. Every meadow is ablaze with gorgeous coloring. Every copse and sunny hollow, river bank and rocky bottom, becomes painted in turn the hue appropriate to the changing seasons. Now blues prevail in the kaleidoscopic display, now pinks, now reds, now yellows. Experience of other national parks will show that the Yosemite is no exception. All are gardens of wildflowers. The Yosemite and the Sequoia are, however, the exclusive possessors among the parks of a remarkably showy flowering plant, the brilliant, rare snow plant. So alluring is the red pillar which the snow plant lifts a foot or more above the shady mold, and so easily is it destroyed, that to keep it from extinction, the government finds covetous visitors for every flower picked. The birds are those of California, many, prolific, and songful. Ducks raise their summer broods fearlessly on the lakes. Geese visit from their distant homes. Cranes and herons fish the streams. Every tree has its soloist, every forest its grand chorus. The glades resound with the tapping of woodpeckers. The whir of startled wings accompanies passage through every wood. To one who has lingered in the forest to watch and to listen, it is hard to account for the widespread fable that the Yosemite is birdless. No doubt, happy, talkative tourists, in companies and regiments, afoot and mounted, drive bird and beast alike to silent cover, and comment on the lifeless forests. The whole range, from foothill to summit, is shaken into song every summer, wrote John Muir, to whom birds were the loved companions of a lifetime of Sierra summers, and, though low and thin in winter, the music never ceases. There are two birds which the unhurried traveler will soon know well. One is the big, noisy, gaudy Clark Crow, whose swift flight and companionable squawk are familiar to all who tour the higher levels. The other is the friendly camp robber who, with encouragement, not only will share your camp luncheon, but will gobble the lion's share. Of the many wild animals, ranging in size from the great, powerful, timid grizzly bear, now almost extinct here, whose Indian name, by the way, is Yosemite, to the tiny shrew of the lowlands, the most frequently seen are the black or brown bear and the deer, both of which, as compared with their kind in neighborhoods where hunting is permitted, are unterrified, if not friendly. Notwithstanding its able protection, the Yosemite will need generations to recover from the hideous slaughter which, in a score or two of years, denuded America of her splendid heritage of wild animal life. Of the several carnivora, the coyote alone is occasionally seen by visitors. Wolves and mountain lions, prime enemies of the deer and mountain sheep, are hard to find, even when officially hunted in winter with dogs trained for the purpose. 2. The Yosemite Valley is the heart of the national park. Not only is it the natural entrance and abiding place, the living room, so to speak, the central point from which all parts of the park are comfortably accessible, it is also typical in some sense of the Sierra as a whole, and is easily the most beautiful valley in the world. It is difficult to analyze the quality of the valley's beauty. There are, as Muir says, many Yosemites in the Sierra. The Hetch Hetchy Valley in the northern part of the park, which bears the same relation to the Tulalum River that the Yosemite Valley bears to the Merced, is scarcely less in size, richness, and the height and magnificence of its carved walls. Scores of other valleys, similar except for size, abound north and south, which are, scientifically, and in Muir's meaning, Yosemites. That is, they are pauses in their river's headlong rush, 
once lakes dug by rushing waters squared and polished by succeeding glaciers chiselled and ornamented by the frosts and rains which preceded and followed the glaciers muir is right for all these are yosemites but he is wrong for there is only one yosemite it is not the giant monoliths that established the incomparable valley's world supremacy hetch hetchy the hippite kings and others have their giants too it is not its towering perpendicular serrated walls the sierra has elsewhere too an overwhelming exhibit of titanic granite carvings it is not its waterfalls though these are the highest by far in the world nor its broad peaceful bottoms nor its dramatic vistas nor the cavernous steps of its tortuous tributary canyons its secret is selection and combination like all supremacy yosemite's lies in the inspired proportioning of carefully chosen elements herein is its real wonder for the more carefully one analyzes the beauty of the yosemite valley the more difficult it is to conceive its ensemble the chance of nature's functioning rather than the master product of supreme artistry entrance to the yosemite by train is from the west by automobile from east and west both from whatever direction the valley is the first objective for the hotels are there it is the valley then which we must see first nature's artistic contrivance is apparent even in the entrance the train ride from the main line at merced is a constant up valley progress from a hot treeless plain to the heart of the great cool forest expectation keeps pace changing to automobile at el portal one quickly enters the park a few miles of forest and behold the gates of the valley el capitan huge glistening rises upon the left three thousand feet above the valley floor at first sight its bulk almost appalls opposite upon the right cathedral rocks support the bridal veil fall shimmering filmy a fairy thing between them in the distance lies the unknown progress up the valley makes constantly for climax seen presently broadside on el capitan bulks double at least opposite the valley bellies cathedral rocks and the medieval towers known as cathedral spires are enclosed in a bay which culminates in the impressive needle known as sentinel rock all richly gothic meantime the broadened valley another strong contrast in perfect key delightfully alternates with forest and meadow and through it the quiet merced twists and doubles like a glistening snake and then we come to the three brothers already some notion of preconception has possessed the observer it could not have been chance which set off the filmy bridal veil against el capitan's bulk which designed the gothic climax of sentinel rock which wondrously proportioned the consecutive masses of the three brothers which made el capitan now looked back upon against a new background a new and appropriate creation a thing of brilliance and beauty instead of bulk mighty of mass powerful in shape and poise yet mysteriously delicate and unreal as we pass on with rapidly increasing excitement to the supreme climax at the valley's head where gather together glacier point yosemite falls of unbelievable height and graciousness the royal arches manifestly a carving the gulf-like entrances of tenana and the merced canyons and above all and pervading all the distinguished mysterious personality of half dome presiding priest of this cathedral of beauty again there steals over us the uneasy suspicion of supreme design how could nature have happened upon the perfect composition the flawless technique the divine inspiration of this masterpiece of more than human art is it not in fact the master temple of the master architect to appreciate the valley we must consider certain details it is eight miles long and from a half mile to a mile wide once prehistoric lake yosemite its floor is as level as a ball field and except for occasional meadows grandly forested the sinuous merced is forested to its edges in its upper reaches but lower down occasionally wanders through broad blooming opens the rock walls are dark pearl-hued granite dotted with pines wherever clefts or ledges exist capable of supporting them even el capitan carries its pine tree halfway up its smooth precipice frequently the walls are sheer they look so everywhere the valley's altitude is four thousand feet the walls rise from two thousand to six thousand feet higher 
the average is a little more than 3,000 feet above the valley floor. Sentinel Dome and Mount Watkins somewhat exceed 4,000 feet. Half Dome nearly attains 5,000 feet. Clouds Rest soars nearly 6,000 feet. Two large, trench-like canyons enter the valley at its head, one on either side of Half Dome. Tenyana Canyon enters from the east in line with the valley, looking as if it were the valley's upper reach. Merced Canyon enters from the south after curving around the east and south sides of Half Dome. Both are extremely deep. Half Dome's 5,000 feet form one side of each canyon. Mount Watkins 4,300 feet form the north side of Tenyana Canyon. Glacier Point's 3,200 feet the west side of Merced Canyon. Both canyons are superbly wooded at their outlets and lead rapidly up to Timberline. Both carry important trails from the valley floor to the greater park above the rim. To this setting add the waterfalls, and the scene is complete. They are the highest in the world. Each is markedly individualized. No two resemble each other. Yet, with the exception of the Vernal Fall, all have a common note. All are formed of comparatively small streams, dropping from great heights. All are wind-blown ribbons, ending in clouds of mist. They are so distributed that one or more are visible from most parts of the valley and its surrounding rim. More than any other feature, they differentiate and distinguish the Yosemite. The first of the falls encountered, Bridal Vale, is a perfect example of the valley type. A small stream pouring over a perpendicular wall drops 620 feet into a volume of mist. The mist, of course, is the Bridal Vale. How much of the water reaches the bottom as water is a matter of interesting speculation. This and the condensed mists reach the river through a delta of five small brooks. As a spectacle, the Bridal Veil vale Fall is unsurpassed. The delicacy of its beauty, even in the high water of early summer, is unequaled by any waterfall I have seen. A rainbow frequently gleams like a colored rosette in the mass chiffon of the bride's train. So pleasing are its proportions that it is difficult to believe the fall nearly four times the height of Niagara. The Ribbon Fall, directly opposite Bridal Vale, a little west of El Capitan, must be mentioned because for a while in early spring its 1,600-foot drop is a spectacle of remarkable grandeur. It is merely the run of a snow field which disappears in June. Thereafter, a dark perpendicular stain on the cliff marks its position. Another minor fall, this from the south rim, is that of Sentinel Creek. It is seen from the road at the right of Sentinel Rock, dropping 500 feet in one leap of several, which aggregate 2,000 feet. Next in progress come Yosemite Falls, loftiest by far in the world, a spectacle of sublimity. These falls divide with Half Dome the honors of the Upper Valley. The tremendous plunge of the Upper Fall and the magnificence of the two falls in apparent near continuation, as seen from the principal points of elevation on the valley floor, form a spectacle of extraordinary distinction. They vie with Yosemite's two great rocks, El Capitan and Half Dome, for leadership among the individual scenic features of the continent. The upper fall pours over the rim at a point nearly 2,600 feet above the valley floor. Its sheer drop is 1,430 feet, the equal of nine Niagara's. Two-fifths of a mile south of its foot, the lower fall drops 320 feet more. From the crest of the upper fall to the foot of the lower fall lacks a little of half a mile. From the foot of the lower fall, after foaming down the talus, Yosemite Creek, seeming a ridiculously small stream to have produced so monstrous a spectacle, slips quietly across a half-mile of level valley to lose itself in the Merced. From the floods of late May, when the thunder of falling water fills the valley and windows rattle a mile away, to the October drought, when the slender ribbon is little more than mist, the upper Yosemite Fall is a thing of many moods and infinite beauty. Seen from above and opposite at Glacier Point, sideways and more distantly from the summit of Cloud's Rest, straight on from the valley floor, upwards from the foot of the lower fall, upwards again from its own foot, and downwards from the overhanging brink toward which the creek idles carelessly to the very step-off of its fearful leap, the fall never loses for a moment its power to amaze. It draws and holds the eye as the magnet does the iron. Looking up from below, one is fascinated by the extreme leisureliness of its motion. The water does not seem to fall, it floats. A pebble dropped alongside 
surely would reach bottom in half the time. Speculating upon this appearance, one guesses that the air retards the water's drop, but this idea is quickly dispelled by the observation that the solid inner body drops no faster than the outer spray. It is long before the wondering observer perceives that he is the victim of an illusion, that the water falls normally, that it appears to descend with less than natural speed only because of the extreme height of the fall, the eye naturally applying standards to which it has become accustomed in viewing falls of ordinary size. On windy days, the upper fall swings from the brink like a pendulum of silver and mist. Back and forth it lashes like a horse's tail. The gusts lop off puffy clouds of mist which dissipate in the air. Muir tells of powerful winter gales driving head-on against the cliff, which break the fall in its middle and hold it in suspense. Once he saw the wind double the fall back over its own brink. Muir, by the way, once tried to pass behind the upper fall at its foot, but was nearly crushed. By contrast with the lofty temperamental upper fall, the lower fall appears a smug and steady pygmy. In such company, for both are always seen together, it is hard to realize that the lower fall is twice the height of Niagara. Comparing Yosemite's three most conspicuous features, these gigantic falls seem to appeal even more to the imagination than to the sense of beauty. El Capitan, on the other hand, suggests majesty, order, proportion, and power. It has its many devotees. Half Dome suggests mystery. To many it symbolizes worship. Of these three, Half Dome easily is the most popular. Three more will complete the valley's list of notable waterfalls. All of these lie up the Merced Canyon. Iliouette, 370 feet in height, enters from the west, a frothing fall of great beauty, hard to see. Vernal and Nevada Falls carry the Merced River over steep steps in its rapid progress from the upper levels to the valley floor. The only exception to the valley type, Vernal Fall, which some consider the most beautiful of all, and which certainly is the prettiest, is a curtain of water 317 feet high and of pleasing breadth. The Nevada Fall, three-fifths of a mile above, a majestic drop of nearly 600 feet, shoots watery rockets from its brink. It is full-run, powerful, impressive, and highly individualized. With many, it is the favorite waterfall of Yosemite. In sharp contrast to these valley scenes is the view from Glacier Point down into the Merced and Tenyana canyons, and out over the magical park landscape to the snow-capped mountains of the High Sierra. Two trails lead from the valley up to Glacier Point, and high upon the precipice, 3,000 feet above the valley floor, is a picturesque hotel. It is also reached by road. Here one may sit at ease on shady porches and overlook one of the most extended, varied, and romantic views in the world of scenery. One may take dinner on this porch and have sunset served with dessert and the afterglow with coffee. Here again one is haunted by the suggestion of artistic intention. So happy is the composition of this extraordinary picture. The foreground is the dark, tremendous gulf of Merced Canyon, relieved by the silver shimmer of Vernal and Nevada Falls. From this, in middle distance rises, in the center of the canvas, the looming, tremendous personality of Half Dome, here seen in profile, strongly suggesting a monk with outstretched arms blessing the valley at close of day. Beyond stretches the horizon of famous, snowy, glacier-shrouded mountains, golden in sunset glow. End of Part 4part five of the book of the national parks this librivox recording is in the public domain the book of the national parks by robert sterling yard yosemite the incomparable continued three every summer many thousands of visitors gather in yosemite most of them of course come tourist fashion to glimpse it all in a day or two or three a few thousands come for long enough to taste most of it or really, to see a little. Fewer, but still increasingly many, are those who come to live a little with Yosemite. Among these we find the lovers of nature, the poets, the seers, the dreamers, and the students. Living is very pleasant in the Yosemite. The freedom from storm during the long season, the dry warmth of the days and the coldness of the nights, 
the inspiration of the surroundings and the completeness of the equipment for the comfort of visitors make it extraordinary among mountain resorts there is a hotel in the valley and another upon the rim at glacier point there are three large hotel camps in the valley where one may have hotel comforts under canvas at camp prices two of these hotel camps possess swimming pools dancing pavilions tennis courts electrically lighted for night play hot and cold water tubs and showers and excellent table service one of the hotel camps the largest provides evening lectures song services and a general atmosphere suggestive of chautauqua still a third is for those who prefer quiet retirement and their tradition of an old-fashioned camp life above the valley rim besides the excellent hotel upon glacier point there are at this writing hotel camps equipped with many hotel comforts including baths at such outlying points as merced lake and tenyana lake the former centering the mountain climbing and trout fishing of the stupendous region on the southwest slope of the park and the latter the key to the entire magnificent region of the tuolome these camps are reached by mountain trail tenyana lake camp also by motor road the hotel camp system is planned for wide extension as growing demand warrants there are also hotels outside park limits on the south and west which connect with the park roads and trails the roads by the way are fair three enter from the west centering at yosemite village in the valley one from the south by way of the celebrated mariposa grove of giant sequoias one from el portal terminus of the yosemite railway and one from the north by way of several smaller sequoia groves connecting directly with the tioga road above the valley rim and north of it the tioga road crosses the national park and emerges at mono lake on the east having crossed the sierra over tioga pass on the park boundary the tioga road which was built in eighteen eighty one on the site of the mono trail to connect a gold mine west of what has since become the national park with roads east of the sierra was purchased in nineteen fifteen by patriotic lovers of the yosemite and given to the government the mine having soon failed the road had been impassable for many years repaired with government money it has become the principal highway of the park and the key to its future development the increase in motor travel to yosemite from all parts of the country which began the summer following the great war has made this gift one of growing importance it affords a new route across the sierra but hotels and hotel camps while accommodating the great majority of visitors by no means shelter all those who camp out under their own canvas are likely to be yosemite's most appreciative devotees the camping out colony lives in riverside groves in the upper reaches of the valley the government assigning locations without charge many families make permanent summer homes here storing equipment between seasons in the village others hire equipment complete from tents to salt cellars on the spot some who come to the hotels finish the season under hired canvas and next season come with their own an increasing number come in cars which they keep in local garages or park near their canvas homes living is easy and not expensive in these camp homes midday temperatures are seasonable and nights are always cool as it does not rain tents are concessions to habit many prefer sleeping under the trees markets in the village supply meats vegetables milk bread and groceries at prices regulated by government and deliver them at your kitchen tent shops furnish all other reasonable needs it is not camping out as commonly conceived you are living at home on the banks of the merced under the morning shadow of half dome and within sight of yosemite falls from these valley homes one rides into the high sierra on horses hired from the government concessioner tours to the tuolome meadows or the mariposa grove by automobile wanders long summer afternoons in the valley climbs the great rocks and domes picnics by moonlight under the shimmering falls or beneath the shining tower of el capitan explores famous fishing waters above the rim and on frivolous evenings dances or looks at motion pictures at the greater hotel camps no wonder that camp homes in the yosemite are growing in popularity four the trail traveler finds the trails the best in the country and as good as the best in the world they are the models for the national system competent guides horses supplies and equipment are easy to hire at regulated prices in the village as for the field there is none nobler or more varied in the world there are dozens of divides scores of towering snow-splashed peaks hundreds of noble valleys and shining lakes thousands of cascading streams great and small 
from whose depths fighting trout rise to the cast fly there are passes to be crossed which carry one through concentric cirques of tooth granite to ridges from which the high sierra spreads before the eye a frothing sea of snowy peaks such a trip is that through the tuolome meadows up lyle canyon to its headwaters over the sierra at donahue pass and up into the birth chambers of rivers among the summit glaciers of lyle and mcclure a never-to-be-forgotten journey which may be continued if one has time and equipment down the john muir trail to mount whitney and the sequoia national park or one may return to the park by way of banner peak and thousand island lake a wonder spot and thence north over parker and mono passes trips like these produce views as magnificent as the land possesses space does not permit even the suggestion of the possibilities to the trail traveller of this wonderland above the rim it is the summer playground for a nation second in magnificence among the park valleys is hetch hetchy the yosemite of the north both are broad flowered and forested levels between lofty granite walls both are accented by gigantic rock personalities kalana rock which guards hetch hetchy at its western gateway as el capitan guards yosemite must be ranked in the same class were there no yosemite valley hetch hetchy though it lacks the distinction which gives yosemite valley its world-wide fame would be much better known than it is now a statement also true about other features of the national park hetch hetchy is now being dammed below kalana rock to supply water for san francisco the dam will be hidden from common observation and the timber lands to be flooded will be cut so as to avoid the unsightliness usual with artificial reservoirs in forested areas the reservoir will cover one of the most beautiful bottoms in america it will destroy forests of luxuriance it will replace these with a long sinuous lake from which sheer yosemite-like granite walls will rise abruptly two or three thousand feet there will be places where the edges are forested down into this lake from the high rim will cascade many roaring streams the long fight in california in the press of the whole country and finally in congress between the advocates of the hetch hetchy reservoir and the defenders of the scenic wilderness is one of the stirring episodes in the history of our national parks at this writing time enough has not yet passed to heal the wounds of battle but at least we may look calmly at what remains one consideration at least affords a little comfort hetch hetchy was once in late prehistoric times a natural lake of great nobility the remains of nature's dam not far from the site of man's are plain to the geologist's eye it is possible that with care in building the dam and clearing out the trees to be submerged this restoration of one of nature's noble features of the past may not work out so inappropriately as once we feared the grand canyon of the tuolome through which the river descends from the level of the tuolome meadows almost five thousand feet to the hetch hetchy valley possesses real yosemite grandeur much of this enormous drop occurs within a couple of amazing miles west of the california falls here the river slips down sharply tilted granite slopes at breathless speed breaking into cascades and plunging over waterfalls at frequent intervals it is a stupendous spectacle which few but the hardiest mountaineers saw previous to nineteen eighteen so steep and difficult was the going during that season a trail was opened which makes accessible to all one of the most extraordinary examples of plunging water in the world the climax of this spectacle is the water wheels granite obstructions in the bed of the steeply tilted river throw solid arcs of frothing water fifty feet in air they occur near together singly and in groups five the fine camping country south of the yosemite valley also offers its sensation at its most southern point the park accomplishes its forest climax in the mariposa grove this group of giant sequoias sequoia washingtoniana ranks next in the number and magnificence of its trees to the giant forest of the sequoia national park and the general grant grove the largest tree of the mariposa grove is the grizzly giant which has a diameter of twenty nine feet a circumference of sixty four feet and a height of two hundred and four feet one may guess its age from three thousand to thirty two hundred years it is the third in size and age of living sequoias general sherman the largest and oldest has a diameter of thirty six and a half feet and general grant a diameter of thirty five feet and neither of these in all probability has attained the age of four thousand years 
General Sherman grows in the Sequoia National Park, 70 miles or more south of Yosemite. General Grant has a little national park of its own, a few miles west of Sequoia. The interested explorer of the Yosemite has so far enjoyed a wonderfully varied sequence of surprises, the incomparable valley with its towering monoliths and extraordinary waterfalls, the high Sierra with its glaciers, serrated cirques, and sea of snowy peaks, the Grand Canyon of the Tuolome with its cascades, rushing river, and frothing water wheels, are but the headliners of a long catalogue of the unexpected and extraordinary. It only remains to complete this new tale of Arabian Nights, to make one's first visit to the sequoias of Mariposa Grove, the first sight of the calm, tremendous columns which support the lofty roof of this forest temple provokes a new sensation. Unconsciously, the visitor removes his hat and speaks his praise in whispers. The sequoias are considered at greater length in the chapter describing the Sequoia National Park, which was created especially to conserve and exhibit more than a million of these most interesting of trees. It will suffice here to say that their enormous stems are purplish-red, that their fine lace-like foliage hangs in splendid heavy plumes, that their enormous limbs crook at right angles, the lowest from a hundred to a hundred and fifty feet above the ground, and that all other trees, even the gigantic sugar pine and Douglas fir, are dwarfed in their presence. Several of the sequoias of the Mariposa Grove approach three hundred feet in height. The road passes through the trunk of one. 6. The human history of the Yosemite is quickly told. The country north of the valley was known from early times by explorers and trappers who used the old Mono Indian Trail, now the Tioga Road, which crossed the divide over Mono Pass. But though the trail approached within a very few miles of the north rim of the Yosemite Valley, the valley was not discovered till 1851, when Captain Bowling of the Mariposa Battalion, a volunteer organization for the protection of settlers, entered it from the west in pursuit of Indians who had raided mining settlements in the foothills. These savages were known as the Yosemite, or Grizzly Bear Indians. Tanyana, their chief, met their pursuers on the uplands and besought them to come no further. But Captain Bowling pushed on through the heavy snows, and on March 21st entered the valley, which proved to be the Indians' final stronghold. Their villages, however, were deserted. The original inhabitants of the valley were called the Awaniches, the Indian name for the valley being Awani, meaning a deep grassy canyon. The Awaniches, previous to Captain Bowling's expedition, had been decimated by war and disease. The new tribe, the Yosemites, or grizzly bears, was made up of their remainder, with Manos and Paiutes added. Captain Bowling's report of the beauty of the valley having been questioned, he returned during the summer to prove his assertions to a few doubters. Nevertheless, there were no further visitors until 1853, when Robert B. Stinson of Mariposa led in a hunting party. Two years later, J. M. Hutchings, who was engaged in writing up the beauties of California for the California magazine, brought the first tourists. The second, a party of sixteen, followed later the same year. Pleasure travel to the Yosemite Valley may be said to have commenced with 1856, the year the first house was built. This house was enlarged in 1858 by Height and Beardsley and used for a hotel. Sullivan and Cushman secured it for a debt the following year, and it was operated in turn by Peck, Longhurst, and Hutchings until 1871. Meantime, J. C. Lehman settled in 1860, the first actual resident of the valley, an honor which he did not share with others for four years. The fame of the valley spread over the country, and in 1864 Congress granted to the state of California the cleft or gorge of the granite peak of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, known as the Yosemite Valley, with the understanding that all income derived from it should be spent for improving the reservation or building a road to it. The Mariposa Big Tree Grove was also granted at the same time. California carefully fulfilled her charge. The Yosemite Valley became world famous, and in 1890 the Yosemite National Park was created. 7. The Yosemite's geological history is much more thrilling. Everyone who sees it asks, how did nature make the Yosemite Valley? Was it split by earth convulsions or scooped by a glacier? Few ask what part was played by the gentle Merced. The question of Yosemite's making has busy geologists from Professor Whitney of the University of California, who first studied the problem, down to F. E. Mathis of the United States Geological Survey, 
whose recent exhaustive studies have furnished the final solution. Professor Whitney maintained that glaciers never had entered the valley. He did not even consider water erosion. At one time he held that the valley was simply a cleft or rent in the earth's crust. At another time he imagined it formed by the sudden dropping back of a large block in the course of the convulsions that resulted in the uplift of the Sierra Nevada. Galen Clark, following him, carried on his idea of an origin by force. Instead of the walls being cleft apart, however, he imagined the explosion of close-set domes of molten rock the riving power, but conceived that ice and water erosion finished the job. With Clarence King, the theory of glacial origin began its long career. John Muir carried this theory to its extreme. Since the period of Muir speculations, the tremendous facts concerning the part played by erosion in the modification of the Earth's surface strata have been developed. Beginning with W. H. Turner, a group of Yosemite students under the modern influence worked upon the theory of the stream-cut valley modified by glaciers. The United States Geological Survey then entered the field, and Mathis's minute investigations followed. The manuscript of his monograph has helped me reconstruct the dramatic past. The fact is that the Yosemite Valley was cut from the solid granite nearly to its present depth by the Merced River, before the glaciers arrived. The river-cut valley was 2,400 feet deep opposite El Capitan, and 3,000 feet deep opposite Eagle Peak. The valley was then V-shaped, and the present waterfalls were cascades. Those which are now the Yosemite Falls were 1,800 feet deep, and those of Sentinel Creek were 2,000 feet deep. All this in pre-glacial times. Later on, the glaciers of several successive epochs greatly widened the valley and measurably deepened it, making it U-shaped. The cascades then became waterfalls, but none will see the Yosemite Valley and its cavernous tributary canyons without sympathizing a little with the early geologists. It is difficult to imagine a gash so tremendous cut into solid granite by anything short of force. One can think of it gouged by massive glaciers, but to imagine it cut by water is at first inconceivable. To comprehend it, we must first consider two geological facts. The first is that no dawdling modern Merced cut this chasm, but a torrent considerably bigger, and that this roaring river swept at tremendous speed down a sharply tilted bed, which it gouged deeper and deeper by friction of the enormous masses of sand and granite fragments which it carried down from the high Sierra. The second geological fact is that the Merced and Tenyana torrents sandpapered the deepening beds of these canyons day and night for several million years, which, when we remember the mile-deep canyons which the Colorado River and its confluence cut through a thousand or more miles of Utah and Arizona, is not beyond human credence, if not conception. But, objects the skeptical, the Merced couldn't keep always tilted. In time, it would cut down to a level and slow up, then the sand and gravel it was carrying would settle, and the stream stop its digging. Again, if the stream-cut valley theory is correct, why isn't every Sierra Canyon a Yosemite? Let us look for the answer in the Sierra's history. The present Sierra Nevada is not the first mountain chain upon its site. The granite which underlay the folds of the first Sierra are still disclosed in the walls of the Yosemite Valley. The granites which underlay the second and modern Sierra are seen in the towering heights of the crest. Once these mountains overran a large part of our present far west, they formed a level and very broad and high plateau, or more accurately, they tended to form such a plateau, but never quite succeeded, because its central section kept caving and sinking in some of its parts as fast as it lifted in others. Finally, in the course, perhaps, of several millions of years, the entire central section settled several thousand feet lower than its eastern and western edges. These edges it left standing steep and high. This sunken part is the great basin of today. The remaining eastern edge is the Wasatch Mountains. The remaining western edge is the Sierra. That is why the Sierra's eastern front rises so precipitously from the deserts of the Great Basin, while its western edge slopes gradually toward the Pacific. But other crust changes accompany the sinking of the Great Basin. The principal one was the rise in a series of upward movements of the remaining crest of the Sierra. These movements may have corresponded with the sinkings of the Great Basin. Both were due to tremendous internal readjustments. And, of course, whenever the Sierra crest lifted, it tilted more sharply the whole granite block of which it was the eastern edge. These successive tiltings 
are what kept the Merced and Tanyana channels always so steeply inclined that, for millions of years, the streams remained torrents swift enough to keep on sandpapering their beds. The first of these tiltings occurred in that far age which geologists call the Cretaceous. It was inconsiderable, but enough to hasten the speed of the streams and establish general outlines for all time. About the middle of the tertiary period, volcanic eruptions changed all things. Nearly all the valleys except the Yosemite became filled with lava. Even the crest of the range was buried a thousand feet in one place. This was followed by a rise of the Sierra Crest a couple of thousand feet, and, of course, a much sharper tilting of the western slopes. The Merced and Tanyana rivers must have rushed very fast indeed during the many thousand years that followed. The most conservative estimate of the duration of the tertiary period is four or five million years, and until its close, volcanic eruptions continued to fill valleys with lava, and the Great Basin kept settling, and the crest of the Sierra went on rising, and with each lifting of the crest, the tilt of the river sharpened, and the speed of the torrents hastened. The canyon deepened during this time from seven hundred to a thousand feet. The Yosemite was then a mountain valley whose sloping sides were crossed by cascades. Then, about the beginning of the Quaternary period, came the biggest convulsion of all. The crest of the Sierra was hoisted, according to Mathis's calculations, as much as eight thousand feet higher in this one series of movements, and the whole Sierra block was again tilted, this time, of course, enormously. For thousands of centuries following, the torrents from Lyles and McClure's melting snows must have descended at a speed which tore boulders from their anchorages, ground rocks into sand, and savagely scraped and scooped the river beds. Armed with sharp, hard-cutting tools ripped from the granite cirques of Sierra's crest, these mad rivers must have scratched and hewn deep and fast, and because certain valleys, including the Yosemite, were never filled with lava like the rest, these grew ever deeper with the centuries. The great crust movement of the Quaternary period was not the last by any means, though it was the last of great size. There were many small ones later. Several even have occurred within historic times. On March 26, 1872, a sudden earth movement left an escarpment 25 feet high at the foot of the range in Owens Valley. The village of Lone Pine was leveled by the accompanying earthquake. John Muir, who was in the Yosemite Valley at the time, describes in eloquent phrase the accompanying earthquake which was felt there. A small movement, doubtless of similar origin, started the San Francisco fire in 1906. Conditions created by the great quaternary tilting deepened the valley from 1,800 feet at its lower end to 2,400 feet at its upper end. It established what must have been an unusually interesting and impressive landscape, which suggested the modern aspect, but required completion by the glaciers. Geologically speaking, the glaciers were recent. There were several ice invasions, produced probably by the same changes in climate which occasioned the advances of the continental ice sheet east of the Rockies. Mathis describes them as similar to the northern glaciers of the Canadian Rockies of today. For unknown thousands of years, the valley was filled by a glacier three or four thousand feet thick, and surrounding country was covered with tributary ice fields. Only Cloud's Rest, Half Dome, Sentinel Dome, and the Crown of El Capitan emerged above this ice. The glacier greatly widened and considerably deepened the valley, turned its slopes into perpendiculars, and changed its side cascades into waterfalls. When it receded, it left Yosemite Valley almost completed. There followed a long period of conditions not unlike those of today. Frost chipped and scaled the granite surfaces, and rains carried away the fragments. The valley bloomed with forests and wildflowers. Then came other glaciers and other intervening periods. The last glacier advanced only to the head of Bridal Veil vale Meadow. When it melted, it left a lake which filled the valley from wall to wall, 300 feet deep. Finally, the lake filled up with soil, brought down by the streams, and made the floor of the present valley. The centuries since have been a period of decoration and enrichment. Frost and rain have done their perfect work. The incomparable valley is complete. End of Part 5Part 6 of the Book of the National Parks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard The Proposed Roosevelt National Park Including the present Sequoia National Park, West Central California, Area, 1,600 square miles. 1. Where the lava billows of the Cascade Mountains end in northern California, the granite knobs of the Sierra begin. Sharply differentiated in appearance and nature, a few miles further in either direction, here their terminals overlap, and so nearly merge that the southern end of the one and the northern beginning of the other are not easily distinguished by the untrained eye. But southward, the Sierra Nevada, the snowy, sawtoothed range of the Spaniards, the Sierra of the modern American phrase, rapidly acquires the bulk and towering height, the craggy cirque summits, and the snowy shoulders which have made it celebrated. Gathering grandeur as it sweeps southward, close to the western boundary of California, its western slopes slash deep with canyons, its granite peaks and domes pushing ever higher above the scattering forests of its middle zones, its eastern ramparts dropping in precipices to the desert, it valiantly guards its sunny state against the passage of eastern highways and forces hard engineering problems upon the builders of transcontinental railroads. Where it becomes the eastern boundary of the Yosemite National Park, it breaks into climaxes of magnificence. From this point on, the Sierra broadens and bulks. It throws out spurs, multiplies paralleling ranges, heaps peaks and ridges between gulf-like canyons which carry roaring waters through their forested trenches. Pushing ever higher above timberline, it breaks into large, lake-bearing cirques, sometimes cirque within cirque, walled in silvery granite, hung with garlands of snow, and dripping with shining glaciers. Ninety miles south of Yosemite, it culminates in a close grouping of snow-daubed, glacier-gouged, lightning-splintered peaks, one of which, Mount Whitney, highest summit in the United States, raises his head just a little above his gigantic neighbors. South of Whitney, the Sierra subsides rapidly and merges into the high plateaus and minor ranges of Southern California. Seventy-five miles of the crest of this titanic range, at the climax of its magnificence, sixty-five miles of it north of Whitney, and ten miles of it south, constitute the western boundary of an area of sixteen hundred square miles, which Congress is considering setting apart under the title of the Roosevelt National Park, a region so particularly characterized by ruggedness, power, and unified purpose, that it is eminently fitted to serve as the nation's memorial to Theodore Roosevelt. Besides its stupendous mountains, it includes the wildest and most exuberant forested canyons and the most luxuriant groves in the United States, for its boundaries will enclose also the present Sequoia National Park, in which a million trunks of the famous Sequoia Washingtoniana cluster around the General Sherman tree, believed to be the biggest and oldest living thing in all the world. Wide though its range from bleak crest to warm forest, every part of this region is a necessary part of its whole. Nature's subtle finger has so knitted each succeeding zone into the fabric of its neighbors that it would be a vandal's hand which would arbitrarily cut the picture short of the full completion of its perfect composition. It is one of nature's masterpieces, through whose extremist contrast runs the common note of supremacy. Whether or not, then, Congress ensures its perpetuity and unified development, we can consider it scenically only as a whole. Similar in kind to the Yosemite National Park, Roosevelt is far ruggeder and more masterful. It will be the national park of superlatives. Yet each of these similar areas is a completed unit of striking individuality. Yosemite, taking its note from its incomparable valley, will never be equaled for sheer beauty. Roosevelt knows no peer for exuberance and grandeur. Yosemite will remain Mecca for the tourist. Roosevelt will draw into its forest of giant trees and upon its shoulders of chiseled granite thousands of campers out and lovers of the high trail. Joined near the crest of the Sierra by the John Muir Trail, California's memorial to her own prophet of the out-of-doors, these two national parks, so alike and yet so different, each striking surely its own note of sublimity, are, in a very real sense, parts of one still greater whole, the marriage of beauty and strength. 2. The region is roughly pear-shaped, a straight line drawn from Pine Creek Pass at its northern end to Sheep Mountain on the southern baseline measures 68 miles. The park is 36 miles wide at its widest, just north of Mount Whitney. Its eastern boundary, the crest of the Sierra, 
divides many notable peaks. From north to south we pass, as we travel the John Muir Trail, Mount Humphreys, 13,972 feet, Mount Darwin, 13,841 feet, Mount Winchell, 13,749 feet, Split Mountain, 14,051 feet, Striped Mountain, 13,160 feet, Mount Baxter, 13,118 feet, Junction Peak, 13,903 feet, Mount Tyndall, 14,025 feet, and Mount Whitney, 14,501 feet. Supporting Whitney on the south is Mount Langley, 14,042 feet, all these connected by splintered peaks, granite ledges, and mountain masses scarcely less in altitude. Between the bristling crests of this snow-daubed eastern boundary and the park's western boundary, thousands of feet lower where the forests begin, the region roughly divides into parallel zones. That which immediately adjoins the crest upon its west side, a strip ten miles or more in width, is known to its devotees as the High Sierra. It is a country of tremendous jagged peaks, of intermediate pinnacled walls, of enormous cirques holding remnants of once mighty glaciers, of great fields of sun-cupped snow, of turquoise lakes resting in chains upon enormous granite steps, the whole gleaming like chased silver in the noon sun, a magical land of a thousand Matterhorns, whose trails lead from temple to temple, so mighty of size and noble of design that no mind less than the creator's could ever have conceived them. The High Sierra has been celebrated for many years in the fast-growing brotherhood of American mountain climbers, east as well as west, many of whom proclaim its marked superiority to all parts of the Swiss Alps, except the amazing neighborhood of Mont Blanc. With the multiplication of trails and the building of shelters for the comfort of the inexperienced, the veriest amateur of city business life will find in these mountains of perpetual sunshine a satisfaction which is only for the seasoned mountaineer abroad. The zone adjoining the High Sierra upon its west side is one of far wider range of pleasure. Subsiding rapidly in elevation, it becomes a knobbed and bouldered land, which includes timberline and the thin forests of wind-twisted pines, which contend with the granite for foothold. It is crossed westward by many lesser ranges, buttressing the High Sierra. From these cross ranges, many loftier peaks arise, and between them roar the rivers, whose thousands of contributing streams drain the snowfields and the glaciers of the White Heights. Finally, paralleling the western boundary, is the narrow zone in which this region meets and merges with the greater forests and the meadows beyond the boundary. Here, in the southwestern corner, is the marvelous warm forest in which trees of many kinds attain their maximum of size and proportion, and which encloses a million sequoia trees, including the greatest and oldest embodiments of the principle of life. This extraordinary forest was reserved in 1890 under the title of the Sequoia National Park. At the same time was created the General Grant National Park, a reservation of four square miles of similar forest, virtually a part of it, but separated because of an intervening area of privately owned lands. Thus does this region run the gamut of supremacy from the high Sierra upon its east to the giant forest upon its west. Of no less distinction are its waters. Innumerable lakelets of the high Sierra, born of the snows, overflow in tiny streams, which combine into roaring, frothing creeks. These, in turn, augmented by the drainage of the lofty, tumbled divides, combine into powerful little rivers. Four river systems originate in this region. Far in the north, a lake, more than 11,000 feet high, lying at the western foot of Mount Goddard, begins the south fork of the San Joaquin River, which drains the park's northern area. Incidentally, it has cut a canyon of romantic beauty, up which the John Muir Trail finds its way into the park. The northern middle of the park is drained by the middle and south forks of the Kings River, which find their origins in perhaps forty miles of Sierra's crest. The drainage basins of these splendid streams cover nearly half of the park's total area, and include some of the biggest, as well as some of the wildest and most beautiful mountain scenery in the world. Bounded upon their west by an arc of snowy mountains, separated by the gigantic monarch divide, flanked by twisted ranges and towering peaks, they cascade westward through meadows of rank grasses and vividly colored wildflowers, alternating with steep side gorges and canyons of sublimity. Dropping thousands of feet within a few miles, they abound in cascades and majestic falls, 
between which swift rapids alternate with reaches of stiller but never still waters which are the homes of cutthroat trout each of these rivers has its canyon of distinguished magnificence the tehipite valley of the middle fork and the king's river canyon of the south fork are destined to world celebrity the southwestern area of the park is drained by five forks of the beautiful Kawea river these streams originate on the north in the divide of the south fork of the king's river and on the east in a conspicuously fine range known as the great western divide they wind through the wooded valleys of the sequoia national park upon their banks grow the monsters of the american forest the southern area is drained by the kern river into which flow the waters of mount whitney and his giant neighbors the kern canyon is one of roosevelt's noblest expressions flowing southward between precipitous walls three thousand feet and more in height flanked upon the east by the monsters of the high sierra and on the west by the splendid elevations of the great western divide it is a valley supremely fitted for the highest realization of the region's gifts of enjoyment from camps beside its trout-haunted waters it is a matter of no difficulty for those equipped for the trail to reach the summit of whitney on the one hand and the giant forest on the other near the southern boundary of the park golden trout creek enters the kern it originates at the very crest of the sierra which it follows closely for many miles before swinging westward to its outlet in this stream is found a trout which appears when fresh caught as though carved from gold popularly it is known as the golden trout its scientific name is salmo rooseveltii originally no doubt the color evolved from the peculiar golden hues of the rocks through which its waters flow the golden trout has been transplanted into other sierra streams in some of which notably the upper waters of the middle fork of the kings it has thrived and maintained its vivid hue in sheltered waters it has apparently disappeared a fact which may merely mean that its color has changed with environment three there are many gateways two by road the rest by trail for years to come as in the past the great majority of visitors will enter through the giant forest of the sequoia national park and through the general grant national park the traveler by rail will find motor stages at Vasilia for the run into the giant forest and at fresno for the general grant national park the motorist will find good roads into both from california's elaborate highway system in both the traveler will find excellent hotel camps and if his purpose is to live a while under his private canvas public campgrounds convenient to stores and equipped with water supply and even electric lights under the gigantic pines firs and ancient sequoias of these extraordinary forests increasing thousands spend summer weeks and months from these centers the lovers of the sublime take saddle horses and pack trains or if they are hikers burrows to carry their equipment and follow the trails to kern canyon or the summit of whitney or the king's river canyon or the tehipite valley or the john muir trail upon the sierra's crest many are the trip combinations the choice of which depends upon the time and the strenuousness of the traveler camping out on the trail in roosevelt is an experience which demands repetition sure of clear weather the traveler does not bother with tents but snuggles at night in a sleeping bag under a roof of spreading pine but it is possible to equip for the trail elsewhere the principal point upon the north is the yosemite national park where one may provide himself with horses and supplies for a journey of any desired duration starting in the yosemite valley and leaving the park near the carved cirques of mount lyell the traveler will find the intervening miles of the john muir trail a panorama of magnificence thousand island lake reflecting the glorious pyramid of banner peak the devil's post pile a group of basaltic columns far finer than ireland's celebrated giant's causeway the mono valley with its ancient volcano split down through the middle so that all may see its vent and spreading crater are merely the more striking features of a progress of spectacles to the north entrance of roosevelt park this is at the junction of the south fork of the san joaquin river and paiute creek the principal eastern gateway is kearsarge pass on the crest of the sierra a few miles north of mount whitney the trail ascends from independence where one also may comfortably outfit these four are at this writing the principal entrance gates each opening from points at which parties may be sure of securing horses equipment and guides but several other trails enter from the east south southwest and west sides all of these in time will become with development well-traveled trails into the heart of the great wilderness four 
Any description of the glories of the John Muir Trail, from its entrance into the park to its climax upon the summit of Mount Whitney, far passes the limits of a chapter. In time, it will inspire a literature. Approaching from Yosemite through the canyon of the San Joaquin, the traveler swings around the north side of Mount Goddard, crosses gorgeous Muir Pass, and enters the fringe of cirques and lakes which borders the western edge of Sierra's crest from end to end. Through this he winds his way southward, skirting lakes, crossing snowfields, encircling templed cirques, plunging into canyons, climbing divides, rounding gigantic peaks, surprising views of sublimity, mounting ever higher until he stands upon the shoulders of Mount Whitney. Dismounting here, he scrambles up the few hundred feet of stiff climb which places him on the summit, from which he looks out north, west, and south, over the most diversified high mountain landscape in America, and eastward over the Sierra foothills to Death Valley, lowest land in the United States. No thrilling alpine feat is the ascent of our loftiest summit, but those who want to measure human strength and skill in terms of perpendicular granite may find among Whitney's neighbors peaks which will present harder problems than those offered abroad, peaks which themselves, well, may become as celebrated in future years. The John Muir Trail is destined to a fame and a use perhaps many times as great as those men thought who conceived it as a memorial to a lover of the trail and of all that that implies. It will play a distinguished part in the education of the nation in the love of mountains. It will win artists to a phase of the sublime in America which they have overlooked. It will bring students to the classrooms where nature displays her most tremendous exhibits. Nevertheless, Roosevelt's lower levels will draw many times as many devotees as will the High Sierra, and these visitors will stay longer. It is the valleys and the canyons which will prove the greatest lure, for here one may camp leisurely and in entire comfort, and thence make what trips he chooses into the regions of the peaks and the cirques. There are literally thousands of canyons and of many kinds. Besides the Kern Canyon, there are two which must rank with Yosemite. In the summer of 1916, I traveled the length of the park, as far as the giant forest, with a party led by Director Stephen T. Mather of the National Park Service, then assistant to the Secretary of the Interior, and was powerfully impressed with the scenic qualities of the Tehipite Valley and the Kings River Canyon, at the time little known. Time will not dim my memory of the Tehipite Dome, the August Valley, and the leaping, singing river which it overlooks. Well short of the Yosemite Valley in the kind of beauty that plunges the observer into silence, the Tehipite Valley far excels it in bigness, power, and majesty. Lookout Point on the North Rim, a couple of miles south of the dome, gave us our first sensation. Three thousand feet above the river, it offered by far the grandest valley view I have looked upon, for the rim view into Yosemite by comparison is not so grand as it is beautiful. The canyon revealed itself to the east as far as Mount Woodworth, its lofty, diversified walls lifting precipitously from the heavy forests of the floor and sides, and yielding to still greater heights above. Enormous cliffs abutted, Yosemite-like, at intervals. South of us, directly across the canyon, rose the strenuous heights of the Monarch Divide, Mount Harrington towering a thousand feet higher above the valley floor than clouds rest above the Yosemite. Down the slopes of the Monarch Divide, seemingly from its turreted summits, cascaded many frothing streams. The Eagle Peaks, Blue Canyon Falls, Silver Spur, the Gorge of Despair, Lost Canyon, these were some of the romantic and appropriate titles we found on the geological survey map. And close at hand, opposite Mount Harrington and just across Crown Creek Canyon, rose mighty to Hippite we stood level with its rounded glistening dome. The Tehipite Dome is a true Yosemite feature. It compares in height and prominence with El Capitan. In fact, it stands higher above the valley floor and occupies a similar position at the valley's western gate. It is not so massive as El Capitan and therefore not so impressive, but it is superb. It is better compared with Half Dome, though again perhaps not so impressive, but it has its own august personality as notably so as either of these world-famed rocks, and if it stood in the Yosemite, would share with them the incomparable valley's highest honors. Descending to the floor, the whole aspect of the valley changed. Looking up, to Hippite Dome, now outlined against the sky, and the neighboring abrupt castellated walls, 
towered more hugely than ever. We did not need the contour map to know that some of these heights exceeded Yosemite's. The skyline was fantastically carved into spires and domes, a counterpart in gigantic miniature of the great Sierra of which it was the valley climax. The Yosemite measure of sublimity perhaps lacked, but in its place was a more rugged grandeur, a certain suggestion of vastness and power that I have not seen elsewhere. This impression was strengthened by the floor itself, which contains no suggestion whatever of Yosemite's exquisiteness. Instead, it offers rugged spaciousness. In place of Yosemite's peaceful woods and meadows, here were tangled, giant-studded thickets and mountainous masses of enormous broken talus. Instead of the quiet, winding Merced, here was a surging, smashing, frothing, cascading, roaring torrent, several times its volume, which filled the valley with its turbulence. One step foot on the valley floor, and all thought of comparison with Yosemite vanishes forever. This is a different thing altogether, but a thing in its own way no less superlative. The keynote of the Tehipite Valley is wild exuberance. It thrills where Yosemite enervates, yet its temperature is quite as mild. The middle fork contains more trout than any other stream I have fished. We found them in pools and riffles everywhere. No water was too white to get a rise. In the long, greenish-white borders of fast rapids, they floated continually into view. In five minutes' watching, I could count a dozen or more such appearances within a few feet of water. They ran from eight to fourteen inches. No doubt larger ones lay below. So I got great fun by picking my particular trout and casting specially for him. Stop your fly's motion, and the pursuing fish instantly stops, backs, swims round the lure in a tour of examination, and disappears start it moving and he instantly reappears from the white depth where no doubt he has been cautiously watching a pause and a swift start often tempted to a strike these rainbows of the torrents are hard fighters and many of them if ungently handled availed of swift currents to thresh themselves free you must fish a river to appreciate it standing on its edges leaping from rock to rock slipping waist deep at times wading recklessly to reach some pool or eddy of special promise, searching the rapids, peering under the alders, testing the pools. That's the way to make friends with a river. You study its moods and its ways as those of a meddlesome horse. And after a while its spirit seeps through and finds yours. Its personality unveils. A sweet friendliness unites you. A sense of mutual understanding. There follows the completest detachment that I know. Years and the worries disappear. You and the river dream away the unnoted hours. Passing on from the Tehipite Valley to the Kings River Canyon, the approach to Granite Pass was nothing short of magnificent. We crossed a superb cirque studded with lakelets. We could see the pass ahead of us on a fine snow-crowned bench. We ascended the bench and found ourselves, not in the pass, but in the entrance to still another cirque, also lake-studded, a loftier, nobler cirque, encircling the one below. Ahead of us, upon another lofty bench, surely was the pass. Those inspiring, snow-daubed heights, whose serrated edges cut sharply into the sky, certainly marked the supreme summit. Our winding trail up steep, rocky ascents pointed true. An hour's toil would carry us over. But the hour passed, and the crossing of the shelf disclosed, not the glowing valley of the South Fork across the pass, but a still vaster, nobler cirque above, sublime in arctic glory how the vast glaciers that cut these titanic carvings must have swirled among these huge concentric walls pouring over this shelf and that piling together around these uplifting granite peaks concentrating combined effort upon this unyielding mass and that and beaten back pouring down the torturous main channel with rendings and tearings unimaginable granite pass is astonishing we saw no less than four of these vast concentric cirques through three of which we passed, and the geological survey map discloses a tributary basin adjoining, which enclosed a group of large volcanic lakes, and doubtless other vast cirque-like chambers. We took photographs, but knew them vain. A long, dusty descent of Copper Creek brought us, near Day's End, into the exquisite valley of the south fork of the King's River, the King's River Canyon. Still another Yosemite. It is not so easy to differentiate the two canyons of the kings. They are similar and yet very different. Perhaps the difference lies chiefly in degree. 
both lie east and west, with enormous rocky bluffs rising on either side of rivers of quite extraordinary beauty. Both present carved and castellated walls of exceptional boldness of design. Both are heavily and magnificently wooded, the forest reaching up sharp slopes on either side. Both possess, to a marked degree, the quality that lifts them above the average of even the Sierra's glacial valleys. But the outlines here seem to be softer, the valley floor broader, the river less turbulent. If the keynote of the Tehipite Valley is wild exuberance, that of the Kings River Canyon is wild beauty. The one excites, the other lulls. The one shares with Yosemite the distinction of extraordinary outline, the other shares with Yosemite the distinction of extraordinary charm. There are few nobler spots than the junction of Copper Creek with the Kings. The Grand Sentinel is seldom surpassed. It fails of the personality of El Capitan, Half Dome, and Tehipite, but it only just fails. If they did not exist, it would become the most celebrated rock in the Sierra, at least. The view up the canyon from this spot has few equals. The view down the canyon is not often excelled. When the day of the Kings River Canyon dawns, it will dawn brilliantly. 5. The western slopes of the Pacific Ranges, from the Canadian border southward to the desert, carry the most luxuriant forest in the United States. The immense stands of yellow pine and Douglas fir of the far north merge into the sugar pines and giant sequoias of the south in practically an unbroken belt which, on Sierra's slopes, lies on the middle levels between the low productive plains of the west and the towering heights of the east. The Sequoia National Park and its little neighbor, the General Grant National Park, enclose areas of remarkable fertility in which trees, shrubs, and wildflowers reach their greatest development. The million sequoia trees which grow here are a very small part, numerically, of this amazing forest. These slopes are rich with the soil of thousands of years of accumulations. They are warmed in summer by mild Pacific winds, heated in their passage across the lowlands, and blanketed in winter by many feet of soft snow. They are damp with countless springs and streams sheltered under heavy canopies of foliage. In altitude they range from 2,000 feet at the bottom of Cahuillas Canyon as it emerges from the park to 8,000 feet in the east, with mountains rising three or 4,000 feet higher. It is a tumbled land of ridges and canyons, but its slopes are easy and its outline gracious. Oases of luscious meadows dot the forests. This is the court of King Sequoia. Here assemble in everlasting attendance millions of his nobles that ever bowed the knee before the human potentate. Erect, majestic, clothed in togas of perpetual green, their heads bare to the heavens, stand rank upon rank, mile upon mile, the noblest personalities of the earth. Chief among the courtiers of the king is the sugar pine, towering here in his full two hundred feet, straight as a ruler, his stem at times eight feet in thickness, scarcely tapering to the heavy limbs of his high crown. Largest and most magnificent of the Pacific pines, reaching sometimes six hundred years of age, the greater trunks clear themselves of branches a hundred feet from the ground, and the bark develops long, dark plates of armor. So marked is his distinguished personality that, once seen, he never can be mistaken for another. Next in rank, and scarcely less in majesty, is the mass of white fir, rising at times even to two hundred feet, his sometimes six-foot trunk conspicuously rough, dark brown in color, deeply furrowed with ashen gray. His pale yellow-green crown is mysteriously tinged with white. His limit of age is three hundred and fifty years. Last of the ranking trio is the western yellow pine, a warrior clad in plates of russet armor. A hundred and sixty feet in natural height, here he sometimes towers even with his fellow knights. He guards the outer precincts of the court, his cap of yellow-green, his branching arms resting upon his sides. These are the great nobles, but with them are millions of lesser courtiers, the incense cedar from whose buttressed, tapered trunks spring countless branches tipped with fan-like plumes, many lesser conifers, the splendid Pacific birches in picturesque pose, the oaks of many kinds, far different from their eastern cousins and among the feet of these courtiers of higher degree crowd millions upon millions of flowering shrubs, massing often in solid phalanxes, disputing passage with the deer. All mingle together, great and small. The conifers, in the king's honor, flaunt from stem and greater branch long fluttering ribbons of pale green moss. 
Thousands of squirrels chatter in the branches. Millions of birds make music. It is a gala day. Enter the king. The king of trees is of royal lineage. The patient searchers in the rocks of old have traced his ancestry, unknown millions of years, back to the forests of the Cretaceous period. His was Viking stock from Arctic zones where trees can live no more. Today he links all human history, the identical tree around which gather thousands of human courtiers every year emerged a seedling while Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. No man knows how old his predecessors were when finally they sank into death, mighty fall. But John Muir counted four thousand rings in the trunk of one fallen giant, who must have lived while Pharaoh still held captive the children of Israel. The general Sherman tree of the giant forest, the oldest living thing today, so far as I have been able to ascertain, probably has seen 3,600 years. It is evident to the unlearned observer that, while mature, he is long short of the turn of life. A thousand years from now, he may still be the earth's biggest and oldest living thing, how much beyond that none may venture to predict. Picture now the giant forest, largest of the several sequoia groves in the Sequoia National Park. You have entered, say, in the dusk of the night before, and after breakfast wander planless among the trees. On every side rise the huge pines and firs, their dark columns springing from the tangled brush to support the cathedral roof above. Here an enormous purplish-red column draws and holds your astonished eye. It is a gigantic thing in comparison with its monster neighbors. It glows among their dull columns. It is clean and spotless amid their moss-hung trunks. Branchless, it disappears among their upper foliage, hinting at steeple heights above. Yet your guide tells you that this tree is small, that its diameter is less than twenty feet, that in age it is a youngster of only two thousand years. Wait, he tells you, till you see the general Sherman trees, thirty-six and a half feet of diameter. Wait till you see the hundreds, yes, thousands, which surpass this infant. But you heed him not, for you see another back among those sugar pines. Yes, and there's another, and there on the left are two or three in a clump. Back in the dim cathedral aisles are reddish glows which must mean still others. Your heart is beating with a strange emotion. You look up at the enormous limbs bent at right angles, at the canopy of feathery foliage hanging in ten thousand huge plumes. You cry aloud for the sheer joy of this great thing, and plunge into the forest heart. The giant forest contains several thousand sequoia trees of large size, and many young trees. You see these small ones on every hand, erect, sharply pointed, giving in every line a vivid impression of quivering, bounding life. Later on, as they emerge above the roof of the forest, for some of them are more than three hundred feet high, they lose their sharp, ambitious tops. They become gracefully rounded. Springing from seed less than a quarter of an inch in diameter, they tend, like their cousins the redwoods, to grow in groups, and these groups tend to grow in groves. But there are scattering individuals in every grove, and many small isolated groves in the Sierra. The giant forest is the largest grove of greatest trees. The general Grant Grove, in a small national park of its own, nearby, is the second grove in size and importance. Its central figure is the general Grant tree, second in size and age, to the general Sherman tree. The dimensions of the greatest trees are astonishing. Glance at this table. Name, height in feet, and diameter in feet. Giant Forest Grove. General Sherman. 279.9 feet high, 36.5 feet in diameter. Abraham Lincoln. 270 feet in height, 31 feet in diameter. William McKinley. 291 feet in height, 28 feet in diameter. Muir Grove. Dalton. 292 feet in height, 27 feet in diameter. Garfield Grove, California, 260 feet in height, 30 feet in diameter. General Grant Grove, General Grant, 264 feet in height, 35 feet in diameter. George Washington, 255 feet in height, 29 feet in diameter. The Theodore Roosevelt tree, which has not been measured at this writing, is one of the noblest of all, perfect in form and color, abounding in the glory of young maturity. To help realization at home of the majesty of the General Sherman tree, mark its base diameter, 36 and a half feet, plainly against the side of some building, 
preferably a church with a steeple and neighboring trees, then measure 280 feet, its height, upon the ground at right angles to the church, then stand on that spot, and facing the church, imagine the trunk rising, tapering slightly, against the building's side and the sky above it, then slowly lift your eyes until you are looking up into the sky at an angle of 45 degrees, this to fix its height as if it were growing in front of the church. Imagine its lowest branches, each far thicker than the trunks of eastern elms and oaks, pushing horizontally out at a height above the ground of 150 feet, which is higher than the tops of most of the full-grown trees of our eastern forests. Imagine these limbs bent horizontally at right angles, like huge elbows, as though holding its green mantle close upon its form. Imagine the upper branches nearly bare, shattered perhaps by lightning, and imagine its crown of foliage, dark yellowish-green, hanging in enormous graceful plumes. This is the King of Trees. End of Part 6part 7 of the book of the national parks this librivox recording is in the public domain the book of the national parks by robert sterling yard the heart of the rockies the rocky mountain national park north central colorado area 398 square miles the sierra nevada mountains of california and the cascade range of california oregon and washington have each three national parks which fully represent their kind and quality. The great central system of the United States, the Rocky Mountains, which also possesses three national parks, are represented in kind by only one, for Yellowstone is an exceptional volcanic interlude, and Glacier is the chance upheaval of shales and limestones from a period antedating the granite Rockies by many millions of years. Neither in any sense exhibits the nature and scenic quality of the backbone of our continent. This is one of the reasons for the extraordinary distinction of the reservation appropriately called the Rocky Mountain National Park, namely that it is the only true example of the continental mountain system in the catalogue of our national parks. It is well, therefore, to lay the foundations for a sound comprehension of its differentiating features. The Rocky Mountains, which began to rise at the close of the Cretaceous period, at a rate so slow that geologists think they are making a pace today as rapid as their maximum, extend from the plateau of New Mexico northwesterly until they merge into the mountains of eastern Alaska. In the United States, physiographers consider them in two groups, the northern Rockies and the southern Rockies, the point of division being the elevated Wyoming basin. There are numerous ranges, known like the Wasatch Mountains by different names, which nevertheless are consistent parts of the Rocky Mountain system. The Rockies attain their most imposing mass and magnificence in their southern group, culminating in Colorado. So stupendous is this heaping together of granitic masses that in Colorado alone are found 42 of the 55 named peaks in the United States which attain the altitude of 14,000 feet. Of the others, 12 are in the Sierra of California and one Mount Rainier in Washington. Mount Elbert in Colorado, our second highest peak, rises within 82 feet of the height of California's Mount Whitney, our first in rank. Colorado's Mount Massive attains an altitude only four feet less than Washington's Mount Rainier, which ranks third. In point of mass, one-seventh of Colorado rises above 10,000 feet of altitude. The state contains 350 peaks above 11,000 feet of altitude, 220 peaks above 12,000 feet, and 150 peaks above 13,000 feet. Besides the 42 named peaks which exceed 14,000 feet, there are at least three others which are unnamed. Geologists call the Rockies young, by which they mean anything, say, from 5 to 20 million years. They are more or less contemporary with the Sierra. Like the Sierra, the mountains we see today are not the first. Several times their ranges have uplifted upon wrecks of former ranges, which have yielded to the assaults of frost and rain. Before they first appeared, parts of the eastern Appalachians had paralleled our eastern seacoast for many million years. The age of mammals had well dawned before they became a feature in a landscape which previously had been a mid-continental sea. 2. 
The front range, carrying the continental divide, is a gnarled and jagged rampart of snow-splashed granite facing the eastern plains, from which its grim summits may be seen for many miles. Standing out before it like captains in front of gray ranks at parade, rise three conspicuous mountains. Long's Peak, 50 miles northwest of Denver, Mount Evans, west of Denver, and Pike's Peak, 70 miles to the south. Long's Peak is directly connected with the Continental Divide by a series of jagged cliffs. Mount Evans is farther away. Pike's Peak stands, sentinel-like, 75 miles east of the range. A gigantic monadnock, remainder and reminder of a former range, long ages worn away. Though many massive mountains of greater altitude lie farther west, the front range, for many reasons, is representative of the Rockies' noblest. To represent them fully, the National Park should include the three sentinel peaks and their neighborhoods, and it is earnestly hoped that the day will come when Congress will recognize this need. At this writing, only the section of greatest variety and magnificence, the nearly 400 square miles of which Long's Peaks is the climax, has been thus entitled. In fact, even this was unfortunately curtailed in the making, the straight southern boundary having been arbitrarily drawn through the range at a point of sublimity, throwing out of the park the St. Vrain glaciers, which form one of the region's wildest and noblest spectacles, and Arapahoe Peak and its glaciers, which in several respects constitute a climax in Rocky Mountain scenery. Thus carelessly cropped, despoiled of the completeness which nature meant it to possess, nevertheless the Rocky Mountain National Park is a reservation of distinguished charm and beauty. It straddles the Continental Divide, which bisects it lengthwise north and south. The western slopes rise gently to the divide. At the divide, the eastern front drops in a precipice several thousand feet deep, out of which frosts, rains, glaciers, and streams have gouged gigantic gulfs and granite-bound vales and canyons, whose intervening cliffs are battlemented walls and monoliths. As if these features were not enough to differentiate this national park from any other, nature has provided still another element of popularity and distinction. East of this splendid rampart spreads a broad area of rolling plateau, carpeted with wildflowers, edged and dotted with luxuriant groves of pine, spruce, fir, and aspen, and diversified with hills and craggy mountains, carved rock walls, long forest-grown moraines, and picturesque ravines, a stream-watered, lake-dotted, summer and winter pleasure paradise of great size, bounded on the north and west by snow-spattered monsters, and on the east and south by craggy wooded foothills, only less in size, and no less in beauty than the leviathans of the main range. Here is summer living room for several hundred thousand sojourners, from whose comfortable camps and hotels the wild heart of the Rockies may be visited afoot or on horseback, between early breakfast and late supper at home. This plateau has been known to summer visitors for many years under the titles of several settlements, Moraine Park, Horseshoe Park, and Long's Peak, each had its hotels long before the National Park was created. Estes Park and Allen's Park on the east side, and Grand Lake on the west side, lie just outside the park boundaries, purposely excluded because of their considerable areas of privately owned land. Estes Park, the principal village and the distributing center of all incoming routes from the east, is the eastern gateway. Grand Lake is the western gateway. And still there is another distinction one which will probably always hold for Rocky Mountain its present great lead in popularity. That is its position nearer to the middle of the country than any other great national parks, and its accessibility from large centers of population. Denver, which claims with some justice the title of Gateway to the National Parks, meaning, of course, the Eastern Gateway to the Western Parks, is within thirty hours by rail from Chicago and St. Louis, through one or other of which most travelers from the East find it convenient to reach the west. It is similarly conveniently located for touring motorists, with whom all the national parks are becoming ever more popular. From Denver, several railroads lead to east side towns, from which the park is reached by motor stages through the foothills, and a motor stage line runs directly from Denver to Estes Park, paralleling the range. The west side is reached through Granby. 3. Entry to the park by any route is dramatic. If the visitor comes the all motorway through Ward, he picks up the range at Arapahoe Peak and follows it closely for miles. 
If he comes by any of the rail routes, his motor stage emerges from the foothills upon a sudden spectacle of magnificence, the snowy range, its highest summits crowned with cloud, looming upon the horizon across the peaceful plateau. By any route, the appearance of the range begins a panorama of ever-changing beauty and inspiration, whose progress will outlive many a summer's stay. Having settled himself in one of the hotels or camps of the east side plateau, the visitor faces the choice between two practical ways of enjoying himself. He may, as the majority seem to prefer, spend his weeks in the simple recreations familiar in our eastern hill and country resorts. He may motor a little, walk a little, fish a little in the big Thompson and its tributaries, read and botanize a little in the meadows and groves, golf a little on the excellent courses, climb a little on the lesser mountains, and dance or play bridge in hotel parlors at night. Or else he may avail himself of the extraordinary opportunity which nature offers him in the mountains, which spring from his comfortable plateau, the opportunity of entering into nature's very workshop and of studying, with her for his teacher, the inner secrets and the mighty examples of creation. In all our national parks I have wondered at the contentment of the multitude with the less when the greater, and such a greater, was there for the taking. But I cease to criticize the so-called popular point of view when I realized that its principal cause was ignorance of the wealth within grasp rather than deliberate choice of the more commonplace. Instead, I write this book, hoping that it may help the cause of the greater pleasure. Especially is the Rocky Mountain National Park the land of opportunity, because of its accessibility, and of the ease with which its inmost sanctuaries may be entered, examined, and appreciated. The story is disclosed at every step. In fact, the revelation begins in the foothills, on the way in from the railroad, for the red, iron-stained cliffs, seen upon their eastern edges, are remainders of former Rocky Mountains, which disappeared by erosion millions of years ago. The foothills themselves are remnants of mountains, which once were much loftier than now, and the picturesque canyon of the Big Thompson, through which it may have been your good fortune to enter the park, is the stream-cut outlet of a lake or a group of lakes, which once covered much of the National Park Plateau. Summer life on the plateau is as effective as a tonic. The altitude varies from seven to 9,000 feet. Rocky Mountain's valley bottoms are higher than the summits of many peaks of celebrity elsewhere. On every hand stretch miles of tumbled meadows and craggy cliffs. Many are the excellent roads, upon which cluster, at intervals of miles, groups of hotels and camps. Here one may choose his own fashion of living, for these hostelries range from the most formal and luxurious hotel to the simplest collection of tents or log cabins around a central log dining structure. Some of these camps are picturesque, the growth of years from the original log hut. Some are equipped with modern comforts, others are as primitive as their beginnings. All the larger resorts have stables of riding horses, for riding is the fashion even with those who do not venture into the mountains. Or one may camp out in the good old-fashioned way and fry his own morning bacon over his fire of sticks. Wherever one lives, however one lives, in this broad tableland, he is under the spell of the range. The call of the mountains is ever-present. Riding, walking, motoring, fishing, golfing, sitting under the trees with a book, continually he lifts his eyes to their calm heights. Unconsciously he throws them the first morning glance. Instinctively he gazes long upon their gleaming moonlit summits before turning in at night. In time they possess his spirit. They calm him, exalt him, ennoble him. Unconsciously he comes to know them all in their myriad moods. Cold and stern before sunrise, brilliant and vivid in mid-morning, soft and restful toward evening, gorgeously colored at sunset, angry, at times terrifying, in storm. Their fascination never weakens, their beauty changes, but it does not lessen. Mountains of the height of these live in constant communion with the sky. Mummy Mountain in the north and Long's Peak in the south continually gather handfuls of fleecy cloud. A dozen times a day a mist appears in the blue, as if entangled while passing the towering summit. A few moments later it is a tiny cloud. Then, while you watch, it thickens and spreads and hides the peak. Ten minutes later, perhaps, it dissipates as rapidly as it gathered, leaving the granite photographed against the blue. Or it may broaden and settle till it covers a vast acreage of sky and drops a brief shower in nearby valleys, 
while meadows half a mile away are steeped in sunshine. Then, in a twinkling, all is clear again. Sometimes, when the clearing comes, the summit is white with snow, and sometimes, standing upon a high peak in a blaze of sunshine from a cleared sky, one may look down for a few moments upon the top of one of these settled clouds, knowing that it is sprinkling the hidden valley. The charm of the mountains from below may satisfy many, but sooner or later temptation is sure to beset. The desire comes to see close up those monsters of mystery. Many, including most women, ignorant of rewards, refuse to venture because they fear hardship. I can never climb mountains in this rarefied air, pleads one, and in most cases this is true. It is important that persons unused to the higher altitudes be temperate and discreet. But the lungs and muscles of a well-trained mountain horse are always obtainable, and the least practice will teach the unaccustomed rider that all he has to do is sit his saddle limply and leave everything else to the horse. It is my proud boast that I can climb any mountain, no matter how high and difficult, up which my horse can carry me. And so, at last and inevitably, we ascend into the mountains. 4. The mountains within the park fall naturally in two groupings. The front range cuts the southern boundary midway and runs north to Long's Peak, where it swings westerly and carries the continental divide out of the park at its northwestern corner. The Mummy Range occupies the park's entire north end. The two are joined by a ridge 11,500 feet in altitude, over which the Fall River Road is building to connect the east and west sides of the park. The lesser of these two, the Mummy Range, is a mountain group of distinguished beauty. Its climax is an arc of gray monsters, Ypsilon Mountain, 13,507 feet, Mount Fairchild, 13,502 feet, Haig's Peak, 13,562 feet, and Mount Dunraven, 12,326 feet. These gather around Mummy Mountain with its 13,413 feet. A noble company, indeed, herded in close comradeship, the center of many square miles of summits, scarcely less. Ypsilon's big Greek letter, outlined in perpetual snow, is one of the famous landmarks of the northern end. Haig's Peak supports Hallett Glacier, the most interesting in the park. Dunraven, aloof and of slenderer outline, offers marked contrast to the enormous sprawling bulk of mummy, always portentous, often capped with clouds. The range is split by many fine canyons and dotted with glacial lakes, an undeveloped wilderness designed by kindly nature for summer exploration. But it is the front range, the snowy, pinnacled rampart, which commands profoundest attention. From Specimen Mountain in the far northwest, a spill of lava, now the haunt of mountain sheep, the continental divide southward piles climax upon climax. Following it at an elevation well exceeding 12,000 feet, the hardy, venturesome climber looks westward down a slope of bald granite, thickly strewn with boulders. Eastward he gazes into a succession of gigantic gorges, dropping upon the east, forest-grown, lake-set canyons, deep in mid-foreground, the great plateau spreading to its foothills far beyond the canyons, with now and then a sun glint from some irrigation pond beyond the foothills on the misty plains of eastern Colorado. Past the monolith of Teratoma Peak, with its fine glacial gorge of many lakes, past the Sprague Glacier, largest of the several shrunken fields of moving ice which still remain, he finds, from the summit of Flattop Mountain, a broad spectacle of real sublimity. But there is a greater viewpoint close at hand. Crossing the Flattop Trail, which here ascends from the settlements below on its way to the west side, and skirting the top of the Tyndall Glacier, a scramble of 400 feet lands him on the summit of Hallett Peak, 12,725 feet in altitude. Here, indeed, is reward. Below him lies the sheer abyss of the Tyndall Gorge, Dream Lake, a drop of turquoise in its depths. Beyond it, a moraine reaches out upon the plateau, six miles in length, a mile and more in width, nearly a thousand feet in height, holding Bierstad Lake upon its leveled forest crown, an eloquent reminder of that ancient time when enormous glaciers ripped the granite from these gorges to heap it in long winding hills upon the plains below. Turning southerly, the wild gardens further spread before his gaze, a tumble of granite masses rising from lake-dotted, richly forested bottoms. The entrance to Loch Vale, 
Gem Canyon of the Rockies, lies in the valley foreground. Adjoining it, the entrance to Glacier Gorge, showing one of its several lakes, rests in peaceful contrast with its impressive eastern wall, a long, winding, sharp-edged buttress pushing southward and upward to support the northern shoulder of the monster Long's Peak, whose squared summit, from here for all the world like a chef's cap, outlines sharply against the sky. Hallett Peak welcomes the climber to the heart of the Rockies at perhaps their most gorgeous point. South of Hallett, difficult going will disclose new viewpoints of supreme wildness. Otis Peak, nearly as high as Hallett, looks down upon the Andrews Glacier and displays the length of Loch Vale, at whose head towers Taylor Peak, a giant exceeding 13,000 feet. I have not sketched this tour of the Continental Divide as a suggestion for travel, for there are no trails, and none but the mountaineer, experienced in pioneering, could accomplish it with pleasure and success but as a convenient mode of picturing the glories of the continental divide. Some day a trail, even perhaps a road, for one is practicable, should make it fully accessible to the greater public. Meantime, Flat Top Trail invites valley dwellers of all degrees, afoot and horseback, up to a point on the divide from which Hallett's summit and its stupendous view is no great conquest. The gorges of the wild gardens are most enjoyed from below, Trails of no difficulty lead from the settlements to Fern and Odessa Lakes in a canyon unsurpassed, to Bear Lake at the outlet of the Tyndall Gorge, to Loch Vale, whose flower-carpeted terraces and cirque lakelets, Sky Pond and the Lake of the Glass, are encircled with mighty canyon walls, and to Glacier Gorge, which leads to the foot of Long's Peak's western precipice. These are spots, each a day's round trip from convenient overnight hotels, which deserve all the fame that will be theirs when the people come to know them, for as yet only a few hundreds a summer of Rocky Mountain's hundred thousand take the trouble to visit them. To better understand the charm of these gray monsters and the valleys and chasms between their knees, we must pause a moment to picture what architects call the planting, for trees and shrubs and flowers play as important a part in the informal architectural scheme of the front range as they do in the formality of a palace. It will be recalled that the zones of vegetation from the equator to the frozen ice fields of the far north find their counterparts in altitude. The foothills bordering the Rocky Mountain National Park lie in the austral zone of our middle and eastern states. Its splendid east side plateau and intermountain valleys represent the luxuriance of the Canadian zone. Its mountains pass rapidly up in a few thousand feet through the Hudsonian zone, including timberline at about 11,500 feet and its highest summits carry only the mosses, lichens, stunted grasses, and tiny alpine flowerets of the Arctic zone. Thus one may walk waist-deep through the marvelous wildflower meadows of Loch Vale, bordered by luxuriant forests of majestic Engelmann spruce, pines, firs, junipers, and many deciduous shrubs, and look upward at the gradations of all vegetation to the Arctic seas. Especially interesting is the revelation when one takes it in order, climbing into the range. The Fall River Road displays it, but not dramatically. The forest approach is too long, the climb into the Hudsonian zone too short, and not typical. The same is true of the trail up beautiful Forest Canyon. The reverse is true of the Ute Trail, which brings one too quickly to the stupendous Arctic summit of Trail Ridge. The Flat Top Trail is in many respects the most satisfying, particularly if one takes the time to make the summit of Hallett Peak and hunts for Arctic flowerets on the way. But one may also accomplish the purpose in Loch Vale by climbing all the way to Sky Pond at the very foot of steep little Taylor Glacier, or by ascending Glacier Gorge to its head, or by climbing the Twin Sisters or Long's Peak as far as Boulder Field, or up the St. Vrain Valley to the top of Meadow Mountain or Mount Copeland. All of these ascents are made by fair trails, and all display the fascinating spectacle of timberline, which in Rocky Mountain National Park, I believe, attains its most satisfying popular expression, by which I mean that here the panorama of the everlasting struggle between the ambitious climbing forests and the winter gales of the summits seems to be condensed and summarized, to borrow a figure from the textbooks, as I have not happened to find it elsewhere. Following up sheltered forest ravine to its head, we swing out upon the wind-swept slopes leading straight to the summit. Snow patches increase in size and number, 
as the conifers thin and shrink. Presently the trees bend eastward, permanently misshaped by the icy winter blasts. Presently they curve in semicircles, or rise bravely in the lee of some great rock, to bend at right angles from its top. Here and there are full-grown trees growing prostrate, like a rug upon the ground. Close to the summit, trees shrink to the size of shrubs, but some of these have heavy trunks a few feet high, and doubtless have attained their fullness of development. Gradually they thin and disappear, giving place to wiry, powerful, deciduous shrubs, and these in turn to gross still smaller. There are forests of willows just above Rocky Mountain's timberline, two or three inches tall, and many acres in extent. From the front range, well in the south of the park, a spur of toothed granite peaks springs two miles eastward to the monarch of the park, Long's Peak. It is this position in advance of the range, as much as the advantage of its 14,255 feet of altitude, which enables this famous mountain to become the climax of every east side view. Long's Peak has a remarkable personality. It is an architectural creation, a solid granite temple, strongly buttressed upon four sides. From every point of view, it is profoundly different, but always consistent and recognizable. Seen from the east, it is supported on either side by mountains of majesty. Joined with it on the north, Mount Lady Washington rises 13,269 feet, the cleft between their summits being the way of the trail to Long's Peak Summit. Merging with it in mass upon the south, Mount Meeker rises 13,911 feet. Once the three were one monster mountain. Frosts and rains carried off the crust strata, bared the granite core, and chipped it into three summits, while a glacier of large size gouged out of its middle the abyss which divides the mountains, and carved the precipice which drops 2,400 feet from Long's Peak summit to Chasm Lake. The chasm, which is easily reached by trail from the hotels at the mountain's foot, is one of the wildest places in America. It may be explored in a day. Mountain climbing is becoming the fashion in Rocky Mountain National Park, among those who never climbed before, and it will not be many years before its inmost recesses are penetrated by innumerable trampers and campers. The stunt of the park is the ascent of Long's Peak. This is no particular matter for the experienced, for the trail is well worn, and the ascent may be made on horseback to the boulder field, less than 2,000 feet from the summit. But to the inexperienced, it appears an undertaking of first magnitude. From the boulder field, the trail carries out upon a long, sharp slant which drops into the precipice of Glacier Gorge, and ascends the box-like summit cap by a shelf trail which sometimes has terrors for the unaccustomed. Several hundred persons make the ascent each summer without accident, including many women and a few children. The one risk is that accidental snow obscure the trail, but Long's Peak is not often ascended without a guide. The view from the summit of the entire national park, of the splendid range south which should be in the park but is not, of the foothills and pond-spotted plains in the east, of Denver and her mountain background, and of the Medicine Bow and other ranges west of the park, is one of the country's great spectacles. Long's Peak is sometimes climbed at night for the sunrise. The six miles of range between Long's Peak and the southern boundary of the park show five towering, snow-spotted mountains of noble beauty, Mount Alice, Mahana Peak, Mahania Peak, Oozle Peak, and Mount Copeland. Tributary to the Wild Basin, which corresponds south of Long's Peak to the Wild Gardens north of it, are gorges of loveliness, the waters of whose exquisite lakes swell St. Vrain Creek. The Wild Basin is one of Rocky Mountain's lands of the future. The entire west side is another, for except for the lively settlement at Grand Lake, its peaks and canyons, meadows, lakes, and valleys are seldom visited. It is natural that the east side, with its broader plateaus and showier range, should have the first development, but no accessible country of the splendid beauty of the west side can long remain neglected. Its unique feature is the broad and beautiful valley of the north fork of the Grand River, here starting for its great adventure in the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. 5. The Rockies are a masterpiece of erosion. When forces below the surface began to push them high in the air, their granite cores were covered thousands of feet deep with the sediments of the great sea of whose bottom once they were apart. The higher they rose, the more insistently frosts and rains concentrated upon their uplifting summits, 
in time all sedimentary rock were washed away and the granite beneath exposed then the frosts and rains and later the glaciers attacked the granite and carved it into the jagged forms of today the glaciers molded the gorges which the streams had cut the glaciers have passed but still the work goes on slowly the mountains rise and slowly but not so slowly the frosts chisel and the rains carry away if conditions remain as now history will again repeat itself and the gorgeous peaks of today will decline a million years or more from now into the low rounded summits of our eastern appalachians and later into the flat soil hidden granites of canada these processes may be seen in practical example ascend the precipitous east side by the flat top trail for instance and notice particularly the broad rolling level of the continental divide for many miles it is nothing but a lofty bare and undulating plain interspersed with summits but easy to travel except for its accumulation of immense loose boulders this plain slopes gently toward the west and presently breaks as on the east into cliffs and canyons it is a stage in the reduction by erosion of mountains which except for erosion might have risen many thousands of feet higher geologists call it a peneplain which means nearly a plain it is from fragmentary remains of peneplains that they trace ranges long ages washed away history may in some dim future age repeat still another wonder for upon the flattened wreck of the front range may rise by some earth movement a new and even nobler range but what about the precipitous eastern front that masterpiece was begun by water accomplished by ice and finished by water in the beginning streams determined the direction of the valleys and carved these valleys deep then came in very recent times as geologists measure earth's history the great ice age as a result of falling temperature the mountains became covered except their higher summits and the continental divide with glaciers these came in at least two invasions and remained many hundreds of thousands of years when changing climate melted them away the rocky mountain national park remained not greatly different from what it is today frosts and rains have softened and beautified it since these glaciers first forming in the beds of streams by the accumulations of snow which presently turned to ice and moved slowly down the valleys began at once to pluck out blocks of granite from their starting points and settle them in cirques they plucked downward and backward undermining their cirque walls until falling granite left precipices armed with imprisoned rocks they gouged and scraped their beds and these processes constantly repeated for thousands of centuries produced the mountain forms the giant gorges the enormous precipices and the rounded granite valleys of the stupendous east elevation of the front range there is a good illustration in iceberg lake near the base of trail ridge on the ute trail this precipitous well which every visitor to rocky mountain should see originally was an ice-filled hollow in the high surface of the ridge when the fall river glacier moved eastward the ice in the hollow slipped down to join it and by that very motion became itself a glacier downward and backward plucking in the cirque which it presently made and the falling of the undermined walls produced in say a few hundred thousand years this striking well upon whose lake surface visitors of today will find cakes of floating ice broken from the sloping snow field which is the old glacier's remainder and representative of today the glaciers which shaped rocky mountains big canyons had enormous size and thickness ice streams from scores of glacial cirques joined fan-like to form the wild basin glacier which swept out through the narrow valley of st vrain four glaciers headed at long's peak one west of mount meeker which gave into the wild basin one west of long's peak which joined the combination of glaciers that hollowed loch vale one upon the north which molded glacier gorge and the small but powerful glacier which hollowed the great chasm on the east front of long's peak the Loch Vale and Glacier Gorge glaciers joined with giant ice streams as far north as Tyndall Gorge to form the Bartolf Glacier, and north of that the mighty Thompson Glacier drained the divide to the head of Forest Canyon, while the Fall River Glacier drained the Mummy Range south of Hague's Peak. These, undoubtedly, were the main glacial streams of those ancient days, the agencies responsible for the gorgeous spectacle we now enjoy. The greater glaciers reached a thickness of 2,000 feet. They have left records scratched high upon the granite walls. 
As the glaciers moved down their valleys, they carried, imprisoned in their bodies and heaped upon their backs and sides, the plunder from their wreckage of the range. This they heaped as large moraines in the broad valleys. The moraines of the Rocky Mountain National Park are unequaled, in my observation, for number, size, and storytelling ability. They are conspicuous features of the Great Plateau upon the east and of the broad valley of the Grand River west of the park. Even the casual visitor of a day is stirred to curiosity by the straight, high wall of the great moraine for which Moraine Park is named, and by the high, curved hill which springs from the northeastern shoulder of Long's Peak and encircles the eastern foot of Mount Meeker. These and other moraines are fascinating features of any visit to Rocky Mountain National Park. The motor roads disclose them, the trails travel them. In combination with the gulfs, the shelved canyons, and the scarred and serrated peaks and walls, these moraines offer the visitor a thrilling mystery story of the past, the unraveling of whose threads and the reconstruction of whose plot and climax will add zest and interest to a summer's outing, and bring him, incidentally, in close communion with nature in a thousand happy moods. 6. The limitations of a chapter permit no mention of the gigantic prehistoric monsters of land, sea, and air which once haunted the site of this noble park, nor description of its more intimate beauties, nor detail of its mountaineering joys, for all of which, and much other invaluable information, I refer those interested to publications of the National Park Service, Department of the Interior, by Dr. Willis T. Lee and Major Roger W. Toll. But something must be told of its early history. In 1819, the exploring expedition which President Madison sent west under Colonel S. H. Long, while camping at the mouth of La Poudre River, was greatly impressed by the magnificence of a lofty, square-topped mountain. They approached it no nearer, but named it Long's Peak, in honor of their leader. Parkman records seeing it in 1845. The pioneers, of course, knew the country. Deer, elk, and sheep were probably hunted there in the forties and fifties. Joel Estes, the first settler, built a cabin in the foothills in 1860, hence the title of Estes Park. James Nugent, afterward widely celebrated as Rocky Mountain Jim, arrived in 1868. Others followed slowly. William N. Byers, founder of the Rocky Mountain News, made the first attempt to climb Long's Peak in 1864. He did not succeed then, but four years later, with a party which included Major J.W. Powell, who made the first exploration of the Grand Canyon the following year, he made the summit. In 1871, the Reverend E. J. Lamb, the first regular guide on Long's Peak, made the first descent by the East Precipice, a dangerous feat. The Earl of Dunraven visited Estes Park in 1871, attracted by the big game hunting, and bought land. He projected an immense preserve and induced men to file claims, which he planned to acquire after they had secured possession but the claims were disallowed. Albert Bierstadt visited Dunraven in 1874 and painted canvases which are now famous in American art. It was Dunraven also who built the first hotel. Tourists began to arrive in 1865. In 1874, the first stage line was established, coming in from Longmont. Telephone connection was made in 1906. Under the name of Estes Park, the region prospered. 50,000 people were estimated to have visited it in 1914. It was not, however, till the National Park was created in 1915 that the mountains assumed considerable importance, except as an agreeable and inspiring background to the broad plateau. End of Part 7「The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard McKinley, Giant of Giants Mount McKinley National Park, Alaska Area, about 2,200 square miles The monster mountain of this continent, the majestic, snow-crowned American monarch, as General Greeley called it, was made a national park in 1917. Mount McKinley rises 20,300 feet above tidewater and 17,000 feet above the eyes of the beholder, standing on the plateau at its base. Scenically, it is the highest mountain in the world, for those summits of the Andes and Himalayas, which are loftier, as measured from sea level, 
can be viewed closely only from valleys whose altitudes range from 10,000 to 15,000 feet. Its enormous bulk is shrouded in perpetual snow two-thirds down from its summit, and the foothills and broad plains upon its north and west are populated with mountain sheep and caribou in unprecedented numbers. To appreciate Mount McKinley's place among national parks, one must know what it means in the anatomy of the continent. The western margin of North America is bordered by a broad mountainous belt known as the Pacific System, which extends from Mexico northwesterly into and through Alaska to the very end of the Aleutian Islands, and includes such celebrated ranges as the Sierra Nevada, the Cascade, and the St. Elias. In Alaska, at the head of Cook Inlet, it swings a sharp curve to the southwest and becomes Alaska's mountain axis. This sharp curve, for all the world like a monstrous granite hinge connecting the northwesterly and southwesterly limbs of the system, is the gigantic Alaska Range, which is higher and broader than the Sierra Nevada and of greater relief and extent than the Alps. Near the center of this range, its climax in position, height, bulk, and majesty, stands Mount McKinley. Its glistening peak can be seen on clear days in most directions for 200 miles. For many years, Mount St. Elias, with its 18,000 feet of altitude, was considered North America's loftiest summit. That was because it stands in that part of Alaska which was first developed. The Klondike region, far northward, was well on the way to development before McKinley became officially recognized as the mountain climax of the continent. But that does not mean that it remained unknown. The natives of the Cook Inlet country on the east knew it as Dolika, and tell you that it is the rock which a god threw at his eloping wife. They say it was once a volcano, which is not the fact. The Aleuts on the south call it Trilliaca, the big mountain. The natives of the Kuskokwim country on the west knew it as Denale, the god, father of the great range. The Russians who established the first permanent white settlement in Alaska on Kodiak Island knew it as Bushiagora, the great mountain. Captain Cook, who in 1778 explored the inlet, which since has borne his name, does not mention it, but Vancouver in 1794 unquestionably meant it in his reference to distant stupendous mountains. After the United States acquired Alaska in 1867, there is little mention of it for some years. But Frank Densmore, an explorer of 1889, entered the Kuskokwim region and took such glowing accounts of its magnificence back to the Yukon that for years it was known through the settlements as Densmore's Mountain. In 1885, Lieutenant Henry C. Allen, USA, made a sketch of the range from his skin boat on the Tanana River, a hundred and fifty miles away, which is the earliest known picture of McKinley. Meantime, the neighborhood was invaded by prospectors from both sides. The Cook Inlet goldfields were exploited in 1894. Two years later, W. A. Dickey and his partner, Monks, two young Princeton graduates exploring north from their workings, recognized the mountain's commanding proportions and named it Mount McKinley, by which it rapidly became known and was entered on the early maps. With crude instruments improvised on the spot, Dickey estimated the mountain's height as 20,000 feet, a real achievement. When Belmore Brown, who climbed the Great Peak in 1912, asked Dickey why he chose the name, Dickey told him that he was so disgusted with the free silver arguments of men traveling with him that he named the mountain after the most ardent gold standard man he knew. The War Department sent several parties to the region during the next few years to explore, and the United States Geological Survey, beginning in 1898 with the Elridge Muldrow Party, has had topographical and geological parties in the region almost continuously since. In 1915, the government began the railroad from Seward to Fairbanks. Its course lies from Cook Inlet up the Susitna River to the headwaters of the Nanana River, where it crosses the range. This will make access to the region easy and comfortable. It was to safeguard the enormous game herds from the hordes of hunters which the railroad was expected to bring, rather than to conserve an alpine region scenically unequaled, that Congress set aside 2,200 square miles under the name of Mount McKinley National Park. From the white sides of Mount McKinley and his giant neighbors descend glaciers of enormous bulk and great length. Their waters drain on the east and south through the Susitna River and its tributaries into the Pacific, and on the north and west through tributaries of the Yukon and Kuskokwim into the Bering Sea. 
The south side of McKinley is forbidding in the extreme, but its north and west fronts pass abruptly into a plateau of gravels, sands, and silts, 2,500 to 3,000 feet in altitude, whose gentle valleys lead the traveler up to the very sides of the granite monster, and whose mosses and grasses pasture the caribou. The national park boundaries enclose immense areas of this plateau. The contours of its rounded, rolling elevations mark the courses of innumerable streams and occasionally abut upon great sweeping glaciers. Low as it is, the plateau is generally above timberline. The day will come when roads will wind through its valleys, and hotels and camps will nestle in its sheltered hollows, while the great herds of caribou, more than one of which has been estimated at fifteen hundred animals, will pasture like sheep within close range of the camera. For the wild animals of McKinley National Park, having never been hunted, were fearless of the explorers, and now will never learn to fear man. The same is true in lesser measure of the more timid mountain sheep, which frequent the foothills in numbers not known elsewhere. Charles Sheldon counted more than five hundred in one ordinary day's foot journey through the valleys. The magic of summer life on this sunlit plateau, with its limitless distances, its rushing streams, its enormous crawling glaciers, its waving grasses, its sweeping gentle valleys, its myriad friendly animals, and back of all and commanding all, its never forgotten and ever controlling presence, the shining range and master mountain, powerfully grip imagination and memory. One never can look long away from the mountain, whose delicate rose tint differentiates it from other great mountains. Here is ever present an intimate sense of the infinite, which is reminiscent of that pang which sometimes one may get by gazing long into the starry zenith. From many points of view, McKinley looks its giant size. As the climber ascends the basal ridges, there are places where its height and bulk appall. Along the northern edge of the park lies the Kantishna Mining District. In 1906 there was a wild stampede to this region. Diamond City, Bearpaw City, Glacier City, McKinley City, Roosevelt, and other rude mining settlements came into rapid existence. Results did not adequately reward the thousands who flocked to the new field, and the cities were abandoned. A hundred or two miners remain, scattered thinly over a large area, which is forested here and there with scrubby growths, and in localities is remarkably productive of cultivated fruits and vegetables. Few know, and few will know, Mount McKinley. It is too monstrous for any but the hardiest to discover its ice-protected secrets. The South Peak, which is the summit, has been climbed twice, once by the Parker Brown Party in 1912, after two previous unsuccessful expeditions, and once the year following, by the party of Archdeacon Hudson Stuck, who gratified an ambition which had arisen out of his many years of strenuous missionary work among the Alaskan Indians. From the records of these two parties, we gather nearly all that is known of the mountain. The North Peak, which is several hundred feet lower, was climbed by Anderson and Taylor of the Tom Lloyd Party in 1913. From each of these peaks, an enormous buttressing ridge sweeps northward until it merges into the foothills and the Great Plain. These ridges are roughly parallel and carry between them the Denali Glacier, to adopt Belmore Brown's suggested name, and its forks and tributaries. Up this glacier is the difficult passage to the summit. Tremendous as it is, the greatest perhaps of the north side, the Denali Glacier by no means compares with the giants which flow from the southern front. In 1903, Judge James Wickersham, afterward delegate to Congress from Alaska, made the first attempt to climb Mount McKinley. It failed through his underestimation of the extensive equipment necessary. In 1906, Dr. Frederick A. Cook, who meantime also had made an unsuccessful attempt from the north side, led an expedition from the south, which included Professor Herschel Parker of Columbia University and Mr. Belmore Brown, artist, explorer, and big game hunter. Ascending the Yetna River, it reached a point up the Toko Sitna Glacier, beyond which progress was impossible, and returned to Cook Inlet and disbanded. Parker returned to New York, and Cook proposed that Brown should lay in a needed supply of game, while he, with a packer named Barrel, should make what he described as a rapid reconnaissance preparatory to a further attempt upon the summit the following year. Brown wanted to accompany him, but was over-persuaded. Cook and Barrel then ascended the Susitna, struck into the country due south of McKinley, and returned to Tyonick with the announcement that they had reached the summit. 
Cook exhibited a photograph of Barrel standing upon a crag, which he said was the summit. A long and painful controversy followed upon Cook's return east with this claim. In all probability, the object of the Parker Brown expedition of 1910 was as much to follow Cook's course and check his claim as to reach the summit. The first object was attained, and Herman L. Tucker, a national forester, was photographed standing on the identical crag upon which Cook had photographed Barrel four years before. This crag was found miles south of McKinley, with other peaks higher than its own intervening. From here the party advanced up a glacier of enormous size to the very foot of the upper reaches of the mountain's south side, but was stopped by gigantic snow walls which defeated every attempt to cross. At the slightest touch of the sun, writes Brown, the great cliffs literally smoke with avalanches. The Parker-Brown expedition undertaken in 1912 for purposes of exploration also approached from the south, but, following the Susitna River farther up, crossed the Alaska Range with dog trains to the north side at a hitherto unexplored point. Just before crossing the divide, it entered what five years later became the Mount McKinley National Park, and against an April blizzard descended into a land of many gorgeous glaciers. We were now, writes Belmore Brown, in a wilderness paradise. The mountains had a wild, picturesque look due to their bare rock summits, and big game was abundant. We were wild with enthusiasm over the beauty of it all, and every few minutes as we jogged along, someone would gaze fondly at the surrounding mountains and ejaculate, This is sure a white man's country. Of these happy hunting grounds, as Brown chapters the park country in his book, Stephen R. Capps of the United States Geological Survey says in his report, Probably no part of America is so well supplied with wild game, unprotected by reserves, as the area on the north slope of the Alaska Range, west of the Nanana River. This region has been so little visited by white men that the game herds have, until recent years, been little molested by hunters. The white mountain sheep are particularly abundant in the main Alaska range and in the more rugged foothills. Caribou are plentiful throughout the entire area and were seen in bands numbering many hundred individuals. Moose are numerous in the lowlands and range over all the area in which timber occurs. Black bears may be seen in or near timbered lands, and grizzly bears range from the rugged mountains to the lowlands. Rabbits and ptarmigan are at times remarkably numerous. Parker and Brown camped along the Muldrow Glacier, now a magnificent central feature of the park. Then they made for McKinley Summit. Striking the Denali Glacier, they ascended it with a dog train to an altitude of 11,000 feet, where they made a base camp and went on afoot, packing provisions and camp outfit on their backs. At one place they ascended an incoming glacier over ice cascades, 4,000 feet high. From their last camp they cut steps in the ice for more than 3,000 feet of final ascent, and attained the top on July 1st in the face of a blizzard. On the northeastern end of the level summit, and only five minutes' walk from the little hillock which forms the supreme summit, the blizzard completely blinded them. It was impossible to go on, and to wait meant rapid death by freezing. With extreme difficulty they returned to their camp. Two days later they made a second attempt, but were again enveloped in an ice storm that rendered progress impossible. Exhaustion of supplies forbade another try, and saved their lives, for a few days later a violent earthquake shook McKinley to its summit. Later on, Mr. Brown identified this earthquake as concurrent with the terrific explosive eruption which blew off the top of Mount Katmai on the south coast of Alaska. The following spring, the Stuck Karstens party made the summit upon that rarest of occasions with Mount McKinley, a perfect day. Archdeacon Stuck describes the actual summit as a little crater like snow basin, 60 or 65 feet long and 20 to 25 feet wide, with a haycock of snow at either end, the south one a little higher than the north. Ignoring official and recognized nomenclature, and calling McKinley and Fouracre by their Kaskakwam Indian names, he writes of Mount Fouracre. Denali's wife does not appear at all from the actual summit of Denali, for she is completely hidden by his south peak, until the moment when his south peak is surmounted, and never was nobler sight displayed to man than that great isolated mountain spread out completely with all its spurs and ridges, its cliffs and its glaciers, lofty and mighty, and yet far beneath us. Above us, he writes a few pages later, the sky took on a blue so deep 
that none of us had ever gazed upon a midday sky like it before. It was deep, rich, lustrous, transparent blue, as dark as Prussian blue, but intensely blue, a hue so strange, so increasingly impressive, that to one at least it seemed like special news of God, as a new poet sings. We first noticed the darkening tint of the upper sky in the Grand Basin, and it deepened as we rose. Tyndall observed and discussed this phenomenon in the Alps, but it seems scarcely to have been mentioned since. A couple of months before the Parker Brown party started for the top, there was an ascent of the lower North Peak, which, for sheer daring and endurance, must rank high in the history of adventure. Four prospectors and miners from the Kantishna region, organized by Tom Lloyd, took advantage of the hard ice of May and an idle dog team to make for the summit. Their motive seems to have been little more than to plant a pole where it could be seen by telescope, as they thought, from Fairbanks. That was why they chose the North Peak. They used no ropes, alpenstocks, or scientific equipment of any sort, and carried only one camera, the chance possession of McGonagall. They made their last camp at an altitude of 11,000 feet. Here Lloyd remained, while Anderson, Taylor, and McGonagall attempted the summit in one day's supreme effort. Near the top, McGonagall was overcome by mountain sickness. Anderson and Taylor went on and planted their pole near the north summit, where the stuck Karstens party saw it a year later in their ascent of the South Peak. So extraordinary a feat of strength and endurance will hardly be accomplished again, unless, perhaps, by hardy miners of Arctic wilderness. The North Pole's nothing to fellows like us, one of them said later on. Once strike gold there, and we'll build a town on it in a month. The published records of the Parker Brown and Stuck Karsten's expeditions emphasize the laborious nature of the climbing. The very isolation, which gives McKinley its spectacular elevation, multiplies the difficulties of ascent by lowering the snow line thousands of feet below the snow line of the Himalayas and Andes with their loftier surrounding valleys. Travel on the glaciers was trying in the extreme, for much of the way had to be sounded for hidden crevasses, and after the selection of each new camping place, the extensive outfit must be returned for and sledded or carried up. Frequent barriers, often of great height, had to be surmounted by torturous and exhausting detours over icy cliffs and soft snow, and always special care must be taken against avalanches. The roar of avalanches for much of the latter journey was almost continuous. Toward the end, the thermometer was rarely above zero, and at night far below, but the heat and glare of the sun was stifling and blinding during much of the day. Often they perspired profusely under their crushing burdens, with the thermometer nearly at zero. Snow fell daily, and often several times a day. It is probable that no other of the world's mountain giants presents climbing conditions so strenuous. Farming is successfully carried on in the Himalayas, far above McKinley's level of perpetual snow, and Tucker reports having climbed a 20,000-foot peak in the Andes with less exertion than it cost the Parker Brown Party, of which he had been a member, to mount the first 4,500 feet of McKinley. While McKinley will be climbed again and again in the future, the feat will scarcely be one of the popular amusements of the National Park. Yet Mount McKinley is the northern landmark of an immense unexplored mountain region south of the National Park, which very far surpasses the Alps in every feature that has made the Alps world famous. Of this region, A. H. Brooks, chief of the Alaska Division of the United States Geological Survey, writes, Here lies a rugged highland area, far greater in extent than all of Switzerland, a virgin field for explorers and mountaineers. He who would master unattained summits, explore unknown rivers, or traverse untrodden glaciers in a region whose scenic beauties are hardly equaled, has not to seek them in South America or Central Asia, for generations will pass before the possibilities of the Alaska range are exhausted. But this is not Switzerland, with its hotels, railways, train guides, and well-worn paths. It will appeal only to him who prefers to strike out for himself, who can break his own trail through trackless wilds, can throw the diamond hitch, and will take the chances of life and limb so dear to the heart of the true explorer. The hotels will come in time to the Mount McKinley National Park, and perhaps they will come also to the Alaskan Alps. Perhaps it is not straining the credulity of an age like ours to suggest that McKinley's commanding summit may be attained some day by aeroplane, with many of the joys and none of the distressing hardships endured by the weary climber. When this time comes, if it does come, 
there will be added merely another extraordinary experience to the very many unique and pleasurable experiences of a visit to the Mount McKinley National Park. End of Part 8「The Book of the National Parks」by Robert Sterling Yard Lafayette and the East Lafayette National Park, Maine, area 10,000 acres It has been the policy of Congress to create national parks only from public lands, the title to which costs nothing to acquire. It may be many years before the nation awakes to the fact that areas distinguished for supreme scenery, historical association, or extraordinary scientific significance are worth conserving, even if conservation involves their purchase. The answer to the oft-asked question why the national parks are all in the West is that the East passed into private possession before the national park idea assumed importance in the national consciousness. The existence of the two national parks east of the Rocky Mountains merely emphasizes the fact the hot springs of Arkansas were set apart in 1832, while the Ozark Mountains were still a wilderness. The Lafayette National Park in Maine is made up of many small parcels of privately owned land, which a group of public-spirited citizens, because of the impossibility of securing national appropriations, patiently acquired during a series of laborious years and presented, in 1916, to the people of the United States. While refusing to purchase land for national parks, Congress nevertheless is buying large areas of eastern mountain land for national forests, the purpose being not only to conserve water sources, which national parks would accomplish quite as thoroughly, but particularly to control lumbering operations in accord with principles which will ensure the lumber supply of the future. Here and there in this reserve are limited areas of distinguished national park quality, but whether they will be set aside as national parks is a question for the people and the future to decide. Certainly, the mountain topography and the rich deciduous forests of the eastern United States should be represented in the national park system by several fine examples. The Lafayette National Park differs from all other members of the national park system in several important respects. It is in the far east. It combines seashore and mountain. It is clothed with a rich and varied growth of deciduous trees and eastern conifers. It is intimately associated with the very early history of America, besides which it is a region of noble beauty subtle charm, and fascinating variety. The Appalachian Mountain Uplift, which, roughly speaking, embraces all the ranges constituting the eastern rib of the continent, may be considered to include also the very ancient peneplains of New England. These tumbled hills and shallow valleys, accented here and there by ranges and monadnocks, by which the geologist means solitary peaks, are all that the frost and rains of many millions of years and the glaciers of more recent geologic times have left of what once must have been a towering mountain region crested in snow. The wrinkling of the earth's surface which produced this range occurred during the Devonian period, when fishes were the predominant inhabitants of the earth, many millions of years before birds or even reptiles appeared. Its rise was accompanied by volcanic disturbances, whose evidences are abundant on islands between the mouth of the Penobscot and Mount Desert Island, though not within the park. The mind cannot conceive the lapse of time which has reduced this range, at an erosional speed no greater than today's, to its present level. During this process, the coastline was also slowly sinking, changing valleys into estuaries and land-encircled bays. The coast of Maine is an eloquent chapter in the continent's ancient history, and the Lafayette National Park is one of the most dramatic paragraphs in the chapter. Where the Penobscot River reaches the sea, and for forty miles east, the sinking continental shore has deeply indented the coastline with a network of broad, twisting bays, enclosing many islands. The largest and finest of these is Mount Desert Island, for many years celebrated for its romantic beauty. Upon its northeast shore, facing Frenchman's Bay, is the resort town of Bar Harbor. Other resorts dot its shores on every side. The island has a large summer population, drawn from all parts of the country. Besides its hotels, there are many fine summer homes. The feature which especially distinguishes Mount Desert Island from other islands, in fact from the entire Atlantic coast, is a group of granitic mountains which rise abruptly from the sea. They were once towering monsters, perhaps only one, unquestionably the loftiest for many miles around. They are the sole remainders upon the present coastline of a great former range. 
they are composed almost wholly of granite, worn down by the ages, but massive enough still to resist the agencies which wiped away their comrades. They rise a thousand feet or more, grim, rounded, cleft with winding valleys and deep passes, divided in places by estuaries of the sea, holding in their hollows many charming lakes. Their abrupt flanks gnawed by the beating sea, their valleys grown with splendid forest and brightened by wildflowers, their slopes and domes sprinkled with conifers which struggle for foothold in the cracks which the elements are widening and deepening in their granite surface. For years they have been the resort of thousands of climbers, students of nature, and seekers of the beautiful. The views of the sea, estuary, island, plain, lake, and mountain from the heights have no counterpart elsewhere. All this mountain wilderness, free as it was to the public, was in private ownership. Some of it was held by persons who had not seen it for years. Some of it was locked up in estates. The time came when owners began to plan fine summer homes high on the mountain slopes. A few, however, believed that the region should belong to the whole people, and out of this belief grew the movement, led by George B. Dorr and Charles W. Eliot, to acquire title and present it to the nation which would not buy it. They organized a holding association, to which they gave their own properties. For years afterwards, Mr. Dorr devoted most of his time to persuading others to contribute their holdings, and to raising subscriptions for the purchase of plots which were tied up in estates. In 1916, the association presented 5,000 acres to the government, and President Wilson created it by proclamation the Sieur de Mont National Monument. The gift has been greatly increased since. In 1918, Congress made appropriations for its upkeep and development. In February 1919, Congress changed its name and status. It then became the Lafayette National Park. The impulse to name the new national park after the French general, who came to our aid in time of need, arose, of course, out of the wartime warmth of feeling for our ally France. The region had been identified with early French exploration. The original monument had been named in commemoration of this historical association. The first European settlement in America, north of the latitude of the Gulf of Mexico, was here. Henri of Navarre had sent two famous adventurers to the New World, de Mont and Champlain. The first colony established by de Mont was at the mouth of the St. Croix River, which forms the eastern boundary of Maine, and the first land within the present United States, which was reached by Champlain, was Mount Desert Island. This was in 1604. It was Champlain who gave the island its present name, after the mountains which rise so prominently from its rock-bound shore. To him, however, the name had a different significance than it first suggests to us. L'Ile de Mont Désert meant to him the island of the lonely mountains, and lonely indeed they must have seemed above the flat shoreline. Thus named, the place became a landmark for future voyagers. Among others, Winthrop records seeing the mountains on his way to the Massachusetts colony in 1630. He anchored opposite and fished for two hours, catching sixty-seven great cod, one of which was a yard around. By a curious train of circumstances, writes George B. Dorr, the titles by which these mountains to the eastward of Somme Sound are held go back to the early ownership of Mount Desert Island by the Crown of France, for it was granted by Louis the Fourteenth, grandson of Henry the Fourth, to Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac, an officer of noble family from southwestern France, then serving in Acadia, who afterward became successively the founder of Detroit and the governor of Louisiana, the Mississippi Valley. Cadillac lost it later, through English occupation of the region, ownership passing first to the province, then to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But presently the Commonwealth gave back to his granddaughter, Madame de Grégoire, and her husband, French refugees, the island's eastern half, moved there, too, by the part that France had taken in the recent War of Independence, and by letters they had brought from Lafayette. And they came down and lived there. And so it naturally followed that, under stress of war enthusiasm, this reservation with its French associations should commemorate not only the old province of Acadia, which the French yielded to England, only after a half a century of war, and England later on to us after another war, but the great war also in which France, England, and the United States all joined as allies in the cause of the world's freedom. In accord with this idea, the highest mountain looking upon the sea has been named the Flying Squadron in honor of the service of the air, born of an American invention and carried to perfection by three allies in common. 
The park may be entered from any of the surrounding resorts, but the main gateway is Bar Harbor, which is reached by train, automobile, and steamboat. No resort may be reached more comfortably, and hotel accommodations are ample. The mountains rise within a mile of the town. They extend westward for twelve miles, lying in two groups, separated by a fine saltwater fjord known as Somme Sound. The park's boundary is exceedingly irregular, with deep indentations of private property. It is enclosed along the shore by an excellent automobile road. Roads also cross it on both sides of Somme Sound. There are ten mountains in the eastern group. The three fronting Bar Harbor have been renamed, for historic reasons, Cadillac Mountain, the Flying Squadron, and Champlain Mountain. For the same reason, mountains upon Somme Sound have been renamed Acadia Mountain, St. Sauveur Mountain, and Norumbega Mountain, the last an Indian name. Similar changes commemorating the early English occupation also have been made in the nomenclature of the Western group. Tablets and memorials are also projected in emphasis of the historical associations of the place. Both mountain groups are dotted with lakes. Those of the Western group are the largest of the island. The pleasures, then, of the Lafayette National Park cover a wide range of human desire. Sea bathing, boating, yachting, saltwater and freshwater fishing, tramping, exploring the wilderness, hunting the view spots, these are the summer occupations of many visitors, the diversions of many others. The more thoughtful will find its historical associations fascinating, its geological record one of the richest in the continent, its forests well-equipped schools for tree study, their branches a museum of bird life. To climb these low mountains, wandering by the hour in their hollows and upon their sea-horizon shoulders, is for one interested in nature to get very close indeed to the secrets of her wonderful east. One may stand upon Cadillac's rounded summit and let imagination realize for him the day when this was a glaciered peak in a mighty range, which forged southward from the far north, shoulder upon shoulder, peak upon peak, pushing ever higher as it approached the sea, and extending far beyond the present ocean horizon, for these mountains of Mount Desert are by no means the terminal of the original mighty range, the slow subsidence of the coast has wholly submerged several, perhaps many, that once rose south of them. The valley, which now carries the St. Croix River, drained this once towering range's eastern slopes. The valley of the Penobscot drained its western slopes. The rocks beneath his feet disclose not only this vision of the geologic past, besides that, in their slow decay, in the chiseling of the trickling waters, in the cleavage of masses by winter's ice, in the peeling of the surface by alternate freezing and melting, in the dissolution and disintegration everywhere by the chemicals imprisoned in air and water, all of which he sees beneath his feet, they disclose to him the processes by which nature has wrought this splendid ruin. And if, captivated by this vision, he studies intimately the page of history written in these rocks, he will find it full of fascinating detail." The region also offers an absorbing introduction to the study of our eastern flora. The exposed bogs and headlands support several hundred species of plants typical of the Arctic, Subarctic, and Hudsonian zones, together with practically all of the common plants of the Canadian zone, and many of the southern coasts. So with the trees. Essentially coastal, it is the land of conifers, the southern limit of some which are common in the great regions of the north, yet exhibiting in nearly full variety the species for many miles south, yet it is also, in its sheltered valleys, remarkably representative of the deciduous growth of the entire Appalachian region. The bird life is full and varied, the food supply attracts migratory birds, and aquatic birds find here the conditions which make for increase. Deer are returning in some numbers from the mainland. In brief, the Lafayette National Park, small though it is, is one of the most important members of the National Park System. For the pleasure-seeker, no other provides so wide and varied an opportunity. To the student, no other offers a more readable or more distinctive volume. It is the only national museum of the fascinating geology of the East, and I can think of no other place in the East where classes can find so varied and so significant an exhibit. To the artist, the poet, and the dreamer, it presents vistas of ocean, inlet, fjord, shore, wave-last promontory, bog, meadow, forest, and mountain, an answer to every mood. If this nation, as now appears, must long lack national parks representative of the range of its splendid east, let us be thankful 
that this one small park is so complete and so distinguished. End of Part 9part 10 of the book of the national parks this librivox recording is in the public domain the book of the national parks by robert sterling yard on the volcano in scenery the volcanic national parks are lassen volcanic crater lake mount rainier yellowstone and hawaii though several of them exhibit extremely high mountains their scenic ensemble differs in almost all respects from that of the granite parks the landscape tends to be broad elevated surfaces and rolling hills from which rise sharp towering cones or massive mountains whose irregular bulging knobs were formed by outbreaks of lava upon the sides of original central vents the cascade mountains in washington oregon and northern california are one of the best examples of such a landscape from its low swelling summits rise at intervals the powerful master cones of shasta rainier adams hood baker and others Fujiyama, the celebrated mountain of Japan, may be cited as a familiar example of the basic mountain form, the single-cone volcanic peak. Vesuvius is a familiar example of simple complication, the double-cone volcano, while Mauna Loa in Hawaii, including Kilauea of the Ring of Fire, a neighbor volcano which it has almost engulfed in its swollen bulk, well illustrates the volcano built up by outpouring of lava from fence broken through its sides. Flat and rolling Yellowstone, with its geyser fields, is one of the best possible examples of a dead and much eroded volcanic region. The scenic detail of the volcanic landscape is interesting and different from any other. Centuries and the elements create from lava a soil of great fertility. No forests and wildflowers excel those growing on the lavas of the Cascades, and the fertility of the Hawaiian Islands, which are entirely volcanic, is world-famous. Streams cut deep and often highly colored canyons in these broad lava lands, and wind and rain, while eroding valleys, often leave ornately modeled edifices of harder rock and tall, thin needles pointing to the zenith. In the near neighborhood of the volcanoes, as well as on their sloping sides, are found lava formations of many strange and wonderful kinds. Hot springs and bubbling paint pots abound, and in the Yellowstone National Park, geysers fields of fantastic twisted shapes, masses suggesting heaps of tumbled ropes. Upstanding spatter cones, caves arched with lava roofs, are a very few of the very many phenomena which the climber of a volcano encounters on his way. And at the top, broad, bowl-shaped craters, whose walls are sometimes many hundred feet deep, enclose, if the crater has long been dormant, sandy floors, from which, perhaps, small cinder cones arise. If the crater is still active, the adventurer's experiences are limited only by his daring. The entire region, in short, strikingly differs from any other of scenic kind. Of the several processes of world-making, all of which are progressing today at normal speed, none is so thrilling as volcanism, because no other concentrates action into terms of human grasp. Lassen's peak eruption of a thousand cubic yards of lava in a few hours thrills us more than the Mississippi's erosion of an average foot of her vast valley in a hundred thousand years, yet the latter is enormously the greater. The explosion of Mount Katmai, the rise and fall of Kilauea's boiling lava, the playing of Yellowstone's monster geysers, the spectacle of Mazama's lake-filled crater, the steaming of the Cascade's myriad bubbling springs, all make strong appeal to the imagination. They carry home the realization of mysterious, overwhelming power. Lava is molten rock of excessively high temperature, which suddenly becomes released from the fearful pressures of Earth's interior. Hurled from volcanic vents or gushing from cracks in the Earth's skin, it spreads rapidly over large neighborhoods, filling valleys and raising bulky, rounded masses. Often it is soft and frothy, like pumice. Even in its frequent glass forms, obsidian, for example, it easily disintegrates. There are as many kinds of lava as there are kinds of rock from which it is formed. Volcanic scenery is by no means confined to what we call the volcanic national parks. Volcanoes are frequent in many parts of the continent. We meet their remnants unexpectedly among the granites of the Rockies and the Sierra, and the sedimentary rocks of the west and the southwest. Several of our national parks besides those prevailingly volcanic, and several of our most distinguished national monuments, 
exhibit interesting volcanic interludes. End of Part 10part 11 of the book of the national parks this librivox recording is in the public domain the book of the national parks by robert sterling yard lassen peak and mount katmai the one a national park in northern california the other a national monument in alaska because most of the conspicuous volcanic eruptions of our day have occurred in warmer climes nearer the equator we usually think of volcanoes as tropical or semi-tropical phenomena. Vesuvius is in the Mediterranean, Pele in the Caribbean, Mauna Loa and Kilauea on the Hawaiian Islands. Of course, there is Lassen Peak in California, the exception, as we say, which proves the rule. As a fact, many of the world's greatest volcanoes are very far indeed from the tropics. Volcanoes result from the movement of earth masses seeking equilibrium underneath the earth's crust, but near enough to the surface to enable molten rock under terrific pressure to work upward from isolated pockets and break through. Volcanoes occur in all latitudes. Even Iceland has its great volcano. It is true that the volcano map shows them congregating thickly in a broad band, of which the equator is the center, but it also shows them bordering the Pacific coast from Patagonia to Alaska, crossing the ocean through the Aleutian Islands, and extending far down the Asian coast. It also shows many inland volcanoes, isolated and in series. The distribution is exceedingly wide. Volcanoes usually occur in belts, which may or may not coincide with lines of weakening in the Earth's crust below. Hence the series of flaming torches of prehistoric days, which, their fires now extinguished, and their sides swathed in ice, have become in our day the row of spectacular peaks extending from northern California to Puget Sound. Hence also the long range of threatening summits which skirts Alaska's southern shore, today the world's most active volcanic belt. Here it was that Katmai's summit was lost in the mighty explosion of June 1912, one of enormous violence, which followed tremendous eruptions elsewhere along the same coast, and is expected to be followed by others, perhaps of even greater immensity and power. These two volcanic belts contain each an active volcano which Congress has made the center of a national reservation. Lassen Peak, some wise men believe, is the last exhibit of activity in the dying volcanism of the Cascade Mountains. Mount Katmai is the latest and greatest exhibit in a volcanic belt which is believed to be young and growing. The Building of the Cascades Millions of years ago, in the period which geologists call tertiary, the pressure under that part of the crust of the earth which is now Washington, Oregon, and Northern California became too powerful for solid rock to withstand. Long lines of hills appeared parallel to the sea, and gradually rose hundreds and perhaps thousands of feet. These cracked, and from the long summit fissures issued hot lava, which spread over enormous areas, and cooling, laid the foundations for the coming Cascade Mountains. When the gaping fissures eased the pressure from beneath, they filled with ash and lava, except at certain vent holes, around which grew the volcanoes which, when their usefulness as chimneys passed, became those cones of ice and snow which now are the glory of our northwest. There may have been at one time many hundreds of these volcanoes, big and little. Most of them doubtless quickly perished under the growing slopes of their larger neighbors, and as they became choked with ash, the lava which had been finding vent through them sought other doors of escape, and found them in the larger volcanoes. Thus, by natural selection, there survived at last that nightly company of monsters, now uniformed in ice, which includes, from north to south, such celebrities as Mount Baker, Mount Rainier, Mount Adams, Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, vanished Mount Mazama, Mount Shasta, and living Lassen Peak. Whether or not several of these vast beacons lit Pacific's nights at one time can never be known with certainty, but probability makes the claim. Whether or not in their decline the canoes of prehistoric men found harbor by guidance of their pillars of fire by night and their pillars of smoke by day is less probable but possible. One at least of the giant band, Lassen Peak, is semi-active today, and at least two others, Mount Rainier and Mount Baker, offer evidences of internal heat beneath their mail of ice, and early settlers in the northwest report Indian traditions of the awful cataclysm in which Mount Rainier lost 2,000 feet of cone. 
Lassen Peak National Park. Lassen Peak, the last of the Cascades in active eruption, rises between the northern end of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, in which it is locally but wrongly considered a part, and the Klamath Mountains, a spur of the Cascades. Actually, it is the southern terminus of the Cascades. Though quiet for more than 200 years, the region long has enjoyed scientific and popular interest because it possesses hot springs, mud volcanoes, and other minor volcanic phenomena, and particularly because its cones, which are easily climbed and studied, have remained very nearly perfect. Besides Lassen Peak, whose altitude is 10,437 feet, there are others of large size and great interest close by. Prospect Peak attains the altitude of 9,200 feet, Harkness Peak 9,000 feet, and Cinder Cone, a specimen of unusual beauty, 6,907 feet. Because it seemed desirable to conserve the best two of these examples of recent volcanism, President Taft in 1906 created the Lassen Peak and the Cinder Cone National Monuments. Doubtless there would have been no change in the status of these reservations had not Lassen Peak broken its long sleep in the spring of 1914 with a series of eruptions covering a period of 19 months. This centered attention upon the region, and in August 1916, Congress created the Lassen Volcanic National Park, a reservation of 124 square miles, which included both national monuments, other notable cones of the neighborhood, and practically all the hot springs and other lesser phenomena. Four months after the creation of the national park, Lassen Peak ceased activity with its 212th eruption. It is not expected to resume. For some years, however, scientists will continue to class it as semi-active. These eruptions, none of which produced any considerable lava flow, are regarded as probably the dying gas of the volcanic energy of the Cascades. They began in May 1914, with sharp explosions of steam and smoke from the summit crater. The news aroused widespread interest throughout the United States. It was the first volcanic eruption within the national boundaries. During the following summer, there were 38 slight similar eruptions, some of which scattered ashes in the neighborhood. The spectacle was one of magnificence because of the heavy columns of smoke. Eruptions increased in frequency with winter, 56 occurring during the balance of the year. About the end of March 1915, according to Dr. J. S. Diller of the United States Geological Survey, new lava had filled the crater and overflowed the west slope a thousand feet. On May 22nd following occurred the greatest eruption of the series. A mushroom-shaped cloud of smoke burst four miles upward in the air. The spectacle, one of grandeur, was plainly visible even from the Sacramento Valley. At night, writes Dr. Diller, flashes of light from the mountain summit, flying rocket-like bodies and cloud glows over the crater reflecting the light from incandescent lavas below, were seen by many observers from various points of view, and appear to indicate that much of the material erupted was sufficiently hot to be luminous. Another interesting phenomenon was the blast of superheated gas which swept down Lost Creek and Hot Creek Valleys. For ten miles it withered and destroyed every living thing in its path. Large trees were uprooted, forests were scorched to a cinder, snow fields were instantly turned to water and flooded the lower valleys with rushing tides. Later examination showed that this explosion had opened a new fissure, and that the old and new craters, now joined in one, were filled with a lava lid. Following this, the eruptions steadily declined in violence till their close the following December. As a national park, though undeveloped and unequipped as yet, Lassen has many charms besides its volcanic phenomena. Its western and southern slopes are thickly forested and possess fine lakes and streams. Several thousand persons, largely motorists, have visited it yearly of late. There are hot springs at Drakesbad, just within the southern border, which have local popularity as baths. The trout fishing in lake and stream is excellent, and shooting is encouraged in the extensive national forest which surrounds the park, but not in the park itself, which is a sanctuary. In spite of the hunting, deer are still found. The greatest pleasure, however, will be found in exploring the volcanoes, from whose summits views are obtainable of many miles of this tumbled and splendidly forested part of California and of the dry plains of the Great Basin on its east. The Katmai National Monument We turn from the dying flutter of California's last remaining active volcano to the excessive violence of a volcano in the extremely active Alaska coast range. The Mount Katmai National Monument will have few visitors 
because it is inaccessible by anything less than an exploring party. We know it principally from the reports of four expeditions by the National Geographic Society. Informed by these reports, President Wilson created it a national monument in 1918. A remarkable volcanic belt begins in southern Alaska at the head of Cook Inlet and follows the coast in a broad southwesterly curve 1,500 miles long through the Alaskan Peninsula to the end of the Aleutian Islands, nearly enclosing Bering Sea. It is very ancient. Its mainland segment contains a dozen peaks, which are classed as active or latent, and its island segment many other volcanoes. St. Augustine's eruption in 1883 was one of extreme violence. Kugak was active in 1889. Veni Amanov's eruption in 1892 ranked with St. Augustine's. Redoubt erupted in 1902, and Katmai with excessive violence in June 1912. The entire belt is alive with volcanic excitement. Pavlov, at the peninsula's end, has been streaming for years, and several others are under expectant scientific observation. Katmai may be outdone at any time. Katmai is a peak of 6,970 feet altitude on treacherous Shelikov Strait opposite Kodiak Island. It rises from an inhospitable shore far from steamer routes or other recognized lines of travel. Until it announced itself with a roar which was heard at Juneau, 750 miles away, its very existence was probably unknown, except to a few prospectors, fishermen, geographers, and geologists. Earthquakes followed the blast, then followed night of smoke and dust. Darkness lasted sixty hours at Kodiak, a hundred miles away. Dust fell as far as Ketchikan, nine hundred miles away. Fumes were borne on the wind as far as Vancouver Island, fifteen hundred miles away. Weather Bureau reports noted haziness as far away as Virginia during succeeding weeks, and the extraordinary haziness in Europe during the following summer is noted by Dr. C. S. Abbott, director of the Astrophysical Observatory of the Smithsonian Institution, in connection with this eruption. Nevertheless, Katmai is by no means the greatest volcanic eruption. Katmai's output of ash was about five cubic miles. Several eruptions have greatly exceeded that in bulk, notably that of Tomboro in the island of Sumbawa, near Java in 1815, when more than 28 cubic miles of ash were flung to the winds. Comparison with many great eruptions whose output was principally lava is, of course, impossible. The scene of this explosion is the national monument of today. The hollowed shell of Katmai's summit is a spectacle of wonderment and grandeur. Robert F. Griggs, who headed the expeditions which explored it, states that the area of the crater is 8.4 square miles, measured along the highest point of the rim. The abyss is 2.6 miles long, 7.6 miles in circumference, and 4.2 square miles in area. A lake has formed within it, which is 1.4 miles long and nine-tenths of a mile wide. Its depth is unknown. The precipice from the lake to the highest point of the rim measures 3,700 feet. The most interesting exhibit of the Katmai National Monument, however, is a group of neighboring valleys just across the western divide, the principal one of which Mr. Griggs, with picturesque inaccuracy, named the Valley of Ten Thousand Smokes. For from its floor and sides, and the floor and sides of smaller tributary valleys, superheated steam issues in thousands of hissing columns. It is an appalling spectacle. The temperatures of this steam are extremely high. Griggs reports one instance of 432 degrees centigrade, which would equal 948 degrees Fahrenheit. In some vents he found a higher temperature at the surface than a few feet down its throat. The very ground is hot. This phenomenal valley is not to be fully explained offhand. As Griggs says, there are many problems to work out. The steam vents appear to be very recent. They did not exist when Spur crossed the valley in 1898, and Martin heard nothing of them when he was in the near neighborhood in 1903 and 1904. The same volcanic impulse, which found its main relief in the explosive eruption of nearby Katmai in 1912, no doubt cracked the deep-lying rocks beneath this group of valleys, exposing superheated rocks to subterranean waters, which forthwith turned to steam, and forced these vents for escape. Griggs reports that volcanic gases mingle freely with the steam. The waters may have one or more of several sources, Perhaps they come from deep springs originating in surface snows and rains. Perhaps they seep in from the sea. Whatever their origin, the region especially interests us 
as a probably early stage of phenomena whose later stages find conspicuous examples in several of our national parks some day with the cooling of the region this may become the valley of ten thousand hot springs but it is useful and within scientific probability to carry this conception much further the comparison between Katmai's steaming valleys and the geyser basin of yellowstone is especially instructive because yellowstone's basins doubtless once were what Katmai's steaming valleys are now the valley of ten thousand smokes may well be a coming geyser field of enormous size the explanation is simple bunsen's geyser theory now generally accepted presupposes a column of water filling the geyser vent above a deep rocky superheated chamber in which entering water is being rapidly turned into steam when this steam becomes plentiful enough and sufficiently compressed to overcome the weight of the water in the vent it suddenly expands and hurls the water out that is what makes the geysers play now one difference between the yellowstone geyser fields and katmai's steaming valley is just a difference in temperature the entire depth of earth under these valleys is heated far above the boiling point so that it is not possible for water to remain in the vents it turns to steam as fast as it collects and rushes out at the top in a continuous flow but when enough thousands of centuries elapse for the rocks between the surface and the deep internal pockets to cool the water will remain in many vents as water until at regular intervals enough steam gathers below to hurl it out then these valleys will become basins of geysers and hot springs like yellowstones end of part eleven part twelve of the book of the national parks this librivox recording is in the public domain the book of the national parks by robert sterling yard mount rainier icy octopus mount rainier national park west central washington area three hundred twenty four square miles one mount rainier the loftiest volcano within the boundaries of the united states one of our greatest mountains and certainly our most imposing mountain rises from western central washington to an altitude of fourteen thousand four hundred and eight feet above mean tide in puget sound it is forty two miles in direct line from the center of tacoma and fifty seven miles from seattle from both of which its glistening peak is often a prominent spectacle with favoring atmospheric conditions it can be seen a hundred and fifty miles away north and south of rainier the cascade mountains bear other snow-capped volcanic peaks baker rises ten thousand seven hundred three feet adams twelve thousand three hundred seven feet st helens nine thousand six hundred ninety seven feet hood eleven thousand two hundred twenty five feet and shasta fourteen thousand one hundred sixty two feet but rainier surpasses them all in height bulk and majesty once it stood sixteen thousand feet as is indicated by the slopes leading up to its broken and flattened top. The supposition is that nearly 2,000 feet of its apex were carried away in one or more explosive eruptions long before history, but possibly not before man. There are Indian traditions of a cataclysm. There were slight eruptions in 1843, 1854, 1858, and 1870, and from the two craters at its summit issue many jets of steam which comfort the chilled climber this immense sleeping cone is blanketed in ice twenty-eight well-defined glaciers flow down its sides several of which are nearly six miles long imagining ourselves looking down from an airplane at a great height we can think of seeing it as an enormous frozen octopus sprawling upon the grass for its curving arms of ice reaching out in all directions penetrate one of the finest forests even of our northwest the contrast between these cold glaciers and the luxuriantly wild-flowered and forest-edged meadows which border them as snugly as so many rippling summer rivers affords one of the most delightful features of mount rainier national park paradise inn for example stands in a meadow of wild flowers between rainier's icy front on the one side and the snowy tatouche range on the other with the nisqually glacier fifteen minutes walk away the casual tourist who has looked at the snowy range of the Rockies from the distant comfort of Estes Park, or the High Sierra from the dining porch of the Glacier Point Hotel, receives an invigorating shock of astonishment at beholding Mount Rainier even at a distance. 
its isolation gives it enormous scenic advantage. Mount Whitney of the Sierra, our loftiest summit, which overtops it 93 feet, is merely the climax in a tempestuous ocean of snowy neighbors, which are only less lofty. Vernier towers nearly 8,000 feet above its surrounding mountains. It springs so powerfully into the air that one involuntarily looks for signs of life and action. But no smoke rises from its broken top. It is still and helpless, shackled in bonds of ice. Will it remain bound, or will it, with due warning, destroy in a day the elaborate system of glaciers which countless centuries have built, and leave a new and different, and perhaps, after years of glacial recovery, even a more gloriously beautiful Mount Rainier than now? The extraordinary individuality of the American national parks, their difference each from every other, is nowhere more marked than here. Single peak glacial systems of the size of Rainier's, of course, are found wherever mountains of great size rise in close masses far above the line of perpetual snow. The Alaskan range and the Himalayas may possess many, but if there is anywhere another mountain of approximate height and magnitude, carrying an approximate glacier system, which rises 8,000 feet higher than its neighbors out of a parkland of lakes, forests, and wildflower gardens, which nature seems to have made especially for pleasuring, and the heart of which is reached in four hours from a large city situated upon a transatlantic railway line, I have not heard of it. Seen a hundred miles away, or from the streets of Seattle and Tacoma, or from the motor road approaching the park, or from the park itself, or from any of the many interglacial valleys, one never gets used to the spectacle of Rainier. The shock of surprise, the instant sense of impossibility, ever repeats itself. The mountain assumes a thousand aspects which change with the hours, with the position of the beholder, and with atmospheric conditions. Sometimes it is fairy-like, sometimes threatening, always majestic. One is not surprised at the Indian's fear. Often Rainier withdraws his presence altogether behind the horizon mists. Even a few miles away, no hint betrays his existence. And very often, shrouded in snowstorm or cloud, he is lost to those at his foot. Mysterious and compelling is this ghostly mountain to us who see it for the first time, unable to look long away while it remains in view. It is the same, old Washingtonians tell me, with those who have kept watching it every day of visibility for many years. And so it was to Captain George Vancouver when, first of white men, he looked upon it from the bridge of the Discovery on May 8, 1792. The weather was serene and pleasant, he wrote under that date, and the country continued to exhibit, between us and the eastern snowy range, the same luxuriant appearance. At its eastern extremity, Mount Baker bore by compass north 22 east, the round snowy mountain, now forming its southern extremity, and which, after my friend Rear Admiral Rainier, I distinguished by the name of Mount Rainier, bore north, south, 42 east. Thus Mount Rainier was discovered, and named at the same time, presumably on the same day. Eighteen days later, having followed the inlet, meaning Puget Sound, to his point of nearest approach to the mountain, Vancouver wrote, We found the inlet to terminate here in an extensive circular compact bay, whose waters washed the base of Mount Rainier, though its elevated summit was yet at a very considerable distance from the shore, with which it was connected by several ridges of hills, rising towards it with gradual ascent and much regularity. The forest trees and several shades of verdure that covered the hills gradually decreased in point of beauty until they became invisible, when the perpetual clothing of snow commenced, which seemed to form a horizontal line from north to south along this range of rugged mountains, from whose summit Mount Rainier rose conspicuously and seemed as much elevated above them as they were above the level of the sea, the whole producing a most grand, picturesque effect. Vancouver made no attempt to reach the mountain. Dreamer of great dreams though he was, how like a madhouse nightmare would have seemed to him a true prophecy of mighty engines, whose like no human mind had then conceived, running upon roads of steel and asphalt, at speeds which no human mind had then imagined, whirling thousands upon thousands of pleasure-seekers from the shores of that very inlet to the glistening mountain's flowered sides. Just one century after the discovery, the Geological Society of America, 
started the movement to make Mount Rainier a national park. Within a year, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the National Geographic Society, the Appalachian Mountain Club, and the Sierra Club joined in the memorialization of Congress. Six years later, in 1899, the park was created. 2. The principal entrance to the park is up the Nisqually River at the south. Here entered the pioneer, James Longmire, many years ago, and the roads established by him and his fellows determined the direction of the first national park development. Longmire Springs, for many years the nearest resort to the Great Mountain, lies just within the southern boundary. Beyond it, the road follows the Nisqually and Paradise Valleys, under glorious groves of pine, cedar, and hemlock, along ravines of striking beauty, past waterfalls, and the snout of the Nisqually Glacier. Finally, to inimitable Paradise Park, its inn, its hotel camp, and its public camping grounds. Other centers of wilderness life have been since established, and the marvelous north side of the park will be opened by the construction of a northwesterly highway up the valley of the Carbon River. Already, a fine trail entirely around the mountain connects these various points of development. But the southern entrance and Paradise Park will remain for many years the principal center of exploration and pleasuring. Here begins the popular trail to the summit. Here begin the trails to many of the finest viewpoints, the best-known falls, the most accessible of the many exquisite interglacial gardens. Here the Nisqually Glacier is reached in a few minutes' walk at a point particularly adapted for ice climbing, and the comfortable viewing of icefalls, crevasses, caves, and other glacier phenomena grandly exhibited in fullest beauty. It is a spot which can have in the nature of things few equals elsewhere in scenic variety and grandeur. On one side is the vast glistening mountain, on the other side the high serrated Tatouche range, spattered with perpetual snow. In middle distance, details of long winding glaciers seamed with crevasses, in the foreground gorgeous rolling meadows of wildflowers, dotted and bordered with equally luxuriant and richly varied forest groves. From close by elevations, a gorgeous tumbled wilderness of hills, canyons, rivers, lakes, and falls, backgrounded by the cascades and accented by distant snowy peaks. The whole pervaded by the ever-present mountain, always the same yet grandly different, from different points of view in the detail of its glaciered sides. The variety of pleasuring is similarly very large. One can ride horseback round the mountain in a leisurely week, or spend a month or more exploring the greater wilderness of the park. One can tramp the trails on long trips, camping by the way, or vary a vacation with numerous short tramps. Or one can loaf away the days in dreamy content, with now and then a walk, and now and then a ride. Or one can explore glaciers and climb minor mountains. The Tatouche Range alone will furnish the stiffest as well as the most delightful climbing, with wonderful rewards upon the jagged summits, while short climbs to points upon nearby snowfields will afford coasting without sleds, an exciting sport, especially appreciated when one is young. In July, before the valley snows melt away, there is tobogganing and skiing within a short walk of the inn. The leisurely tour afoot around the mountain with pack train following the trail is an experience never to be forgotten. One passes the snouts of a score of glaciers, each producing its river, and sees the mountain from every angle, besides having a continuous panorama of the surrounding country, including Mount Adams, Mount St. Helens, Mount Baker, Tacoma, Seattle, Mount Olympus, the Pacific Ocean, and the Cascades from the Columbia to the International Line. Shorter excursions to other beautiful parklands offer a wide variety of pleasure. Indian Henry's Hunting Ground, Van Trump Park, Summerland, and others provide charm and beauty as well as fascinating changes in the aspect of the Great Mountain. Of course, the ascent of the mountain is the ultimate objective of the climber, but few, comparatively, will attempt it. It is a feat in endurance which not many are physically fit to undertake while to the unfit there are no rewards. There is comparatively little rock climbing, but what there is will try wind and muscle. Most of the way is tramping up long, snow-covered and ice-covered slopes, with little rest from the start at midnight to the return, if all goes well, before the following sundown. Face and hands are painted to protect against sunburn, and colored glasses avert snow blindness. Success is so largely a matter of physical condition 
that many ambitious tourists are advised to practice a while on the Tatouche Range before attempting the trip. Do you see Pinnacle Peak up there? they ask you. If you can make that, you can make her near. Better try it first. And many who try Pinnacle Peak do not make it. As with every very lofty mountain, the view from the summit depends upon the conditions of the moment. Often Rainier's summit is lost in mists and clouds, and there is no view. Very often on the clearest day, clouds continually gather and dissipate. One is lucky in the particular time he is on top. Frequently there are partial views. Occasionally every condition favors, and then, indeed, the reward is great. S. F. Emmons, who made the second ascent, and after whom one of Rainier's greatest glaciers was named, stood on the summit upon one of those fortunate moments. The entire mountain, in all its inspiring detail, lay at his feet, a wonder spectacle of first magnitude. Looking to the more distant country, he wrote, the whole stretch of Puget Sound, seeming like a pretty little lake embowered in green, could be seen in the northwest, beyond which the Olympic Mountains extend out into the Pacific Ocean. The Cascade Mountains, lying dwarfed at our feet, could be traced northward into British Columbia, and southward into Oregon, while above them, at comparatively regular intervals, rose the ghost-like forms of our companion volcanoes. To the eastward the eye ranged over hundreds of miles, over chain on chain of mountain ridges which gradually disappeared in the dim blue distance. Notwithstanding the rigors of the ascent, parties leave Paradise Inn for the summit every suitable day. Hundreds make the ascent each summer. To the experienced mountain climber, it presents no special difficulties. To the inexperienced, it is an extraordinary adventure. Certainly no one knows his Mount Rainier who has not measured its gigantic proportions in units of his own endurance. The first successful ascent was made by General Hazard Stevens and P.B. Van Trump, both residents of Washington, on August 17, 1870. Starting from James Longmire's, with Mr. Longmire himself as guide up the Nisqually Valley, they spent several days in finding the Indian Sluskin, who would take them to the summit. With him, then, assuming Longmire's place, Stevens and Van Trump started on their great adventure. It proved more of an adventure than they anticipated, for not far below the picturesque falls which they named after Sluskin, the Indian stopped and begged them to go no farther. From that compilation of scholarly worth by Professor Edmund S. Meany, president of the Mountaineers, entitled Mount Rainier, A Record of Exploration, I quote General Stevens' translation of Sluskin's protest. Listen to me, my good friends, said Sluskin. I must talk with you. Your plan to climb Tacoma is all foolishness. No one can do it and live. A mighty chief dwells upon the summit in a lake of fire. He brooks no intruders. Many years ago my grandfather, the greatest and bravest chief of all the Yakima, climbed nearly to the summit. There he caught sight of the fiery lake, and the infernal demon coming to destroy him, and fled down the mountain, glad to escape with his life. Where he failed, no other Indian ever dared make the attempt. At first the way is easy, the task seems light. The broad snowfields over which I have often hunted the mountain goat offer an inviting path, but above them you will have to climb over steep rocks, overhanging deep gorges, where a misstep would hurl you far down, down to certain death. You must creep over steep snowbanks and cross deep crevasses where a mountain goat would hardly keep his footing. You must climb along steep cliffs where rocks are continually falling to crush you or knock you off into the bottomless depths. And if you should escape these perils and reach the great snowy dome, then a bitterly cold and furious tempest will sweep you off into space like a withered leaf. But if by some miracle you should survive all these perils, the mighty demon of Tacoma will surely kill you and throw you into the fiery lake. Don't you go. You make my heart sick when you talk of climbing Tacoma. You perish if you try to climb Tacoma. You will perish and your people will blame me. Don't go. Don't go. If you go, I will wait here two days and then go to Olympia and tell your people that you perished on Tacoma. Give me a paper to them to let them know that I am not to blame for your death. My talk is ended. Except for the demon and his lake of fire, Sluskin's portent of hardship proved to be a literal, even a modest prophecy. At five o'clock in the evening, after eleven hours of struggle with precipices and glaciers, exhausted, chilled, and without food, they faced a night of zero gales upon the summit. 
the discovery of comforting steam jets in a neighboring crater, the reality, perhaps, of Sluskin's lake of fire, made the night livable, though one of suffering. It was afternoon of the following day, before they reached camp, and found an astonished Sluskin, then, in fact, on the point of leaving, to report their unfortunate destruction. Stevens and Van Trump were doubly pioneers, for their way up the mountain is, in general direction at least, the popular way today, greatly bettered since, however, by the shortcuts and easier detours which have followed upon experience. End of Part 12part 13 of the book of the national parks this librivox recording is in the public domain the book of the national parks by robert sterling yard mount rainier icy octopus continued 3 our four volcanic national parks exemplify four states of volcanic history lassen peak is semi-active mount rainier is dormant yellowstone is dead and Crater Lake marks the spot through which a volcano collapsed and disappeared. Rainier's usefulness as a volcanic example, however, is lost in its supreme usefulness as a glacial exhibit. The student of glaciers, who begins here with the glacier in action, and then studies the effects of glaciers upon igneous rocks among the cirques of the Sierra, and upon sedimentary rocks in the Glacier National Park, will study the masters, which, by the way, is a tip for universities contemplating summer field classes. Upon the truncated top of Mount Rainier, nearly three miles in diameter, rise two small cinder cones, which form, at the junction of their craters, the mountain's rounded, snow-covered summit. It is known as Columbia Crest. As this only rises 400 feet above the older containing crater, it is not always identified from below as the highest point. Two commanding rocky elevations of the old rim, Point success on its southwest side, 14,150 feet, and Liberty Cap on its northwest side, 14,112 feet, appear to be, from the mountain's foot, its points of greatest altitude. Rainier's top, though covered with snow and ice, except in spots bared by internal heat, is not the source of its glaciers, although its extensive ice fields flow into and feed several of them. The glaciers themselves, even those continuous with the summit ice, really originate about 4,000 feet below the top, in cirques or pockets which are principally fed with the tremendous snows of winter, and the wind sweepings and avalanches from the summit. The Pacific winds are charged heavily with moisture, which descends upon Rainier in snows of great depth. Even Paradise Park is snowed under from 12 to 30 feet. There is a photograph of a ranger cabin in February which shows only a slight snow mound with a hole in its top, which locates the hidden chimney. Effie Mathis, the geologist, tells of a snow level of 50 feet depth in Indian Henry's hunting ground, one of Rainier's most beautiful parks, in which the wind had sunk a crater-like hollow from the bottom of which emerged a chimney. These snows replenish the glaciers, which have a combined surface of 45 square miles, along their entire length, in addition to making enormous accumulations in the cirques. Beginning then in its cirque, as a river often begins in its lake, the glacier flows downward, river-like, along a course of least resistance. Here it pours over a precipice in broken falls to flatten out in perfect texture in the even stretch below. Here it plunges down rapids, breaking into crevasses as the river in corresponding phase breaks into ripples. Here it rises smoothly over rocks upon its bottom. Here it strikes against a wall of rock and turns sharply. The parallel between the glacier and the river is striking and consistent, notwithstanding that the geologist, for technical reasons, will quarrel with you if you picturesquely call your glacier a river of ice. Any elevated viewpoint will disclose several or many of these mighty streams flowing in snake-like curves down the mountainside, the greater streams swollen here and there by tributaries as rivers are swollen by entering creeks and all eventually reach a point, determined by temperature and therefore not constant, where the river of ice becomes the river of water. Beginning white and pure, the glacier gradually clothes itself in rock and dirt, gathering as it moves narrow edges of matter filched from the shores, later on it heaps these up upon its lower banks. They are lateral moraines. Two merging glaciers unite the material carried on their joined edges and form a medial moraine, 
a ribbon broadening and thickening as it descends. A glacier made up of several tributaries carries as many medial moraines. It also carries much unorganized matter, fallen from the cliffs or scraped from the bottom. Approaching the snout, all these accumulations merge into one moraine, and so soiled has the ice now become that it is difficult to tell which is ice and which is rock. At its snout is an ice cave far inside of which the resultant river originates. But the glacier has one very important function which the river does not share. Far up at its beginnings it freezes to the back wall of its cirque, and, moving forward, pulls out or plucks out, as the geologists have it, masses of rock which it carries away in its current. The resulting cavities in the back of the cirque fill with ice, which in its turn freezes fast and plucks out more rock, and presently the back wall of the cirque, undermined, falls on the ice and is also carried away. There is left a precipice, often sheerly perpendicular, and as the process repeats itself, this precipice moves backward. At the beginning of this process, it must be understood, the glacier lies upon a tilted surface far more elevated than now when you see it in its old age, sunk deep in its self-dug trench, and while it is plucking backward and breaking off an ever-increasing precipice above it, it is plucking downward too. If the rock is even in structure, this downward cutting may be very nearly perpendicular. But if the rock lies in strata of varying hardness, shelves form where the harder strata are encountered, because it takes longer to cut them through. In this way are formed the long series of steps which we often see in empty glacial cirques. By this process of backward and downward plucking, the carbon glacier bit its way into the north side of the great volcano until it invaded the very foundations of the summit and created the Willis Wall, which drops avalanches 3,600 feet to the glacier below. Willis Wall is nearly perpendicular, because the lava rock at this point was homogeneous. But in the alternating shale and limestone strata of Glacier National Park, on the other hand, the glaciers of old dug cirques of many shelves. The monster ice streams which dug glaciers' mighty valleys have vanished, but often tiny remainders are still seen upon the cirques' topmost shelves. So we see that the glacier acquires its cargo of rock not only by scraping its sides and plucking it from the bottom of its cirque and valley, but by quarrying backward till undermined material drops upon it, all of this in fulfillment of nature's purpose of wearing down the highlands for the upbuilding of the hollows. This is not the place for a detailed description of Mount Rainier's 28 glaciers. A glance at the map will tell something of the story. Extending northeasterly from the summit will be seen the greatest unbroken glacial mass. Here are the Emmons and the Winthrop glaciers, much the largest of all. This is the quarter farthest from the sun, upon which its rays strike at the flattest angle. The melting, then, is least here. But still a more potent reason for their larger mass is found in their position on the lee quarter of the peak, the prevailing winds whirling in the snow from both sides. The greater diversification of the other sides of the mountain, with extruding cliffs, cleavers, and enormous rock masses, tends strongly to scenic variety and grandeur. Some of the rock cleavers which divide glaciers stand several thousand feet in height, veritable fences. Some of the cliffs would be mountains of no mean size elsewhere, and around their sides pour mighty glacial currents, cascading to the depths below, where again they may meet and even merge. The Nisqually Glacier naturally is the most celebrated, not because of scenic superiority, but because it is the neighbor and the playground of the visiting thousands. Its perfect and wonderful beauty are not in excess of many others, and it is much smaller than many. The Cowlitz Glacier nearby exceeds it in size, and is one of the stateliest. It springs from a cirque below Gibraltar, a massive near-summit rock, whose well-deserved celebrity is due in some part to its nearness to the traveled summit trail. The point I am making is not in depreciation of any of the celebrated sites from the southern side, but in emphasis of the fact that a hundred other sites would be as celebrated, or more celebrated, were they as well known. The Mount Rainier National Park at this writing is replete with splendors which are yet to be discovered by the greater traveling public. The Great North Side, for instance, with its mighty walls, its magnificently scenic glaciers, its lakes, canyons, and enormous areas of flowered and forested pleasure grounds, is destined to wide development. It is a national park in itself. Already roads enter to camps at the foot of great glaciers. 
the west side also, with its four spectacular glaciers, which pass under the names of Moich and Tahoma, attains sublimity. It remains also for future occupation. Many of the minor phenomena, while common also to other areas of snow and ice, have fascination for the visitor. Snow cups are always objects of interest and beauty. Instead of reducing a snow surface evenly, the warm sun sometimes melts it in patterned cups set close together like the squares of a checkerboard. These deepen gradually till they suggest a gigantic honeycomb, whose sails are sometimes several feet deep. In one of these, one summer day in the Sierra, I saw a stumbling horse deposit his rider, a high official of one of our western railroads, and there he sat, helpless, hands and feet emerging from the top, while we recovered enough from laughter to help him out. Pink snow always arouses lively interest. A microscopic plant, Protococcus nivalis, growing in occasional patches beneath the surface of old snow, gradually emerges with a pink glow, which sometimes covers acres. On the tongue, its flavor suggests watermelon. No doubt many other microscopic plants thrive in the snowfields and glaciers, which remain invisible for lack of color. Insects also inhabit these glaciers. There are several Thrysonura, which suggest the sand fleas of our seashores, but are seldom noticed because of their small size. More noticeable are the Mesenchytrius, a slender brown worm which attains the length of an inch. They may be seen in great numbers on the lower glaciers in the summer, but on warm days retreat well under the surface. 4. The extraordinary forest luxuriance at the base of Mount Rainier is due to moisture and climate. The same heavy snowfalls which feed the glaciers store up water supplies for the forest and meadow. The winters at the base of the mountain are mild. The lower valleys are covered with a dense growth of fir, hemlock, and cedar. Pushing skyward in competition for the sunlight, trees attain great heights. Protected from winter severity by the thickness of the growth, and from fire by the dampness of the soil, great age is assured, which means thick and heavy trunks. The Douglas fir, easily the most important timber tree of western America, here reaches its two hundred feet in massive forests, while occasional individuals grow two hundred and fifty to two hundred and seventy-five feet, with a diameter of eight feet. The bark at the base of these monsters is sometimes ten inches thick. The western hemlock also reaches equal heights in competition for the light, with diameters of five feet or more. Red cedar, white pines of several varieties, several firs, and a variety of hemlocks complete the list of conifers. Deciduous trees are few and not important. Broad-leafed maples, cottonwoods, and alders are the principal species. Higher up the mountain slopes, the forests thin and lessen in size, while increasing in picturesqueness. The Douglas fir and other monsters of the lower levels disappear, their places taken by other species. At an altitude of 4,000 feet, the Angleman spruce and other mountain trees begin to appear, not in the massed ranks of the lower levels, but in groves bordering the flowered opens. The extreme limit of tree growth on Mount Rainier is about 7,000 feet of altitude, above which one finds only occasional, distorted, wind-tortured mountain hemlocks. There is no well-defined timberline, as on other lofty mountains. Avalanches and snowslides keep the upper levels swept and bare. The wild flower catalog is too long to enumerate here. John Muir expresses the belief that no other subalpine floral gardens excel Rainier's in profusion and gorgeousness. The region differs little from other Pacific regions of similar altitude in variety of species. In luxuriance, it is unsurpassed. 5. According to Theodore Winthrop, who visited the Northwest in 1853 and published a book entitled The Canoe and the Saddle, which had wide vogue at the time and is consulted today, Mount Rainier had its Indian Rip Van Winkle. The story was told in great detail by Hammett Chu, a frowsy ancient of the Squaliamish. The hero was a wise and wily fisherman and hunter. Also, as his passion was gain, he became an excellent businessman. He always had salmon and berries when food became scarce and prices high. Gradually he amassed large savings in Hiaqua, the little perforated shell which was the most valued form of wampum, the Indian's money. The richer he got, the stronger his passion grew for Hiaqua, and when a spirit told him in a dream of vast hordes at the summit of Rainier, he determined to climb the mountain. The spirit was Tamanoas, which, Winthrop explains, is the vague Indian personification of the supernatural. 
So he threaded the forest and climbed the mountain's glistening side. At the summit he looked over the rim into a large basin in the bottom of which was a black lake surrounded by purple rock. At the lake's eastern end stood three monuments. The first was as tall as a man and had a head carved like a salmon. The second was the image of a camas bulb. The two represented the great necessities of Indian life. The third was a stone elk's head with the antlers in velvet. At the foot of this monument he dug a hole. Suddenly a noise behind him caused him to turn. An otter clambered over the edge of the lake and struck the snow with its tail. Eleven others followed. Each was twice as big as any otter he had ever seen. Their chief was four times as big. The eleven sat themselves in a circle around him, and the leader climbed upon the stone elk head. At first the treasure-seeker was abashed, but he had come to find Hiaqua, and he went on digging. At every thirteenth stroke, the leader of the otters tapped the stone elk with his tail, and the eleven followers tapped the snow with their tails. Once they all gathered closer, and whacked the digger good and hard with their tails. But, though astonished and badly bruised, he went on working. Presently he broke his elkhorn pick, but the biggest otter seized another in his teeth and handed it to him. Finally his pick struck a flat rock with a hollow sound, and the otters all drew near and gazed into the hole, breathing excitedly. He lifted the rock, and under it found a cavity filled to the brim with pure white hiaqua, every shell large, unbroken, and beautiful. All were neatly hung on strings. Never was treasure quest so successful. The otters, recognizing him as the favorite of Tamanous, retired to a distance and gazed upon him respectfully. But the miser, writes the narrator, never dreamed of gratitude, never thought to hang a string from the buried treasure about the salmon and camas Tamanous stones, and two strings around the elk's head. No, all must be his own, all he could carry now, and the rest for the future. Greedily he loaded himself with the booty, and laboriously climbed to the rim of the bowl, prepared for the descent of the mountain. The otters, puffing in concert, plunged again into the lake, which at once disappeared under a black cloud. Straightway a terrible storm arose, through which the voice of Tamanuus screamed tauntingly. Blackness closed around him. The din was horrible. Terrified, he threw back into the bowl behind him five strings of hiaqua to propitiate Tamanuus, and there followed a momentary lull, during which he started homeward. But immediately the storm burst again, with roaring like ten thousand bears. Nothing could be done but to throw back more hiaqua. Following each sacrifice came another lull, followed in turn by more terrible outbreaks, and so, string by string, he parted with all his gains. Then he sank to the ground insensible. When he awoke, he lay under an arbutus tree in a meadow of camas. He was shockingly stiff, and every movement pained him. But he managed to gather and smoke some dry arbutus leaves and eat a few camas bulbs. He was astonished to find his hair very long and matted, and himself bent and feeble. Tamanuus, he muttered. Nevertheless, he was calm and happy. Strangely, he did not regret his lost strings of hiaqua. Fear was gone, and his heart was filled with love. Slowly and painfully he made his way home. Everything was strangely altered. Ancient trees grew where shrubs had grown four days before. Cedars, under whose shade he used to sleep, lay rotting on the ground. Where his lodge had stood, now he saw a new and handsome lodge, and presently out of it came a very old, decrepit squaw, who, nevertheless, through her wrinkles, had a look that seemed strangely familiar to him. Her shoulders were hung thick with hiaqua strings. She bent over a pot of boiling salmon and crooned. My old man has gone, gone, gone. My old man to Tacoma has gone. To hunt the elk he went long ago. When will he come down, 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 to salmon pot and me? He has come down, quavered the returned traveller, at last recognising his wife. He asked no questions. Charging it all to the wrath of Tamanous, he accepted fate as he found it. After all, it was a happy fate enough in the end, for the old man became the great medicine man of his tribe, by whom he was greatly revered. The name of this Rip Van Winkle of Mount Rainier is not mentioned in Mr. Winthrop's narrative. End of Part 13
Part 14 of the Book of the National Parks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard. Crater Lakes Bowl of Indigo. Crater Lake National Park, Southwestern Oregon, area 249 square miles. Crater Lake is in southwestern Oregon, among the Cascade Mountains, and is reached by an automobile ride of several hours from Medford. The government information circular calls it, quote, the deepest and bluest lake in the world, unquote. Advertising circulars praise it in choicest professional phrase. Its beauty is described as exceeding that of any other lake in all the world. Never was blue so wonderful as the blue of these waters. Never were waters so deep as its 2,000 feet. Lured by this eloquence, the traveler goes to Crater Lake and finds it all as promised, in fact, far better than promised, for the best intended adjectives, even when winged by the energetic pen of the most talented ad writer, cannot begin to convey the glowing, changing, mysterious loveliness of this lake of unbelievable beauty. In fact, the tourist, with expectation at fever heat by the time he steps from the auto stage upon the crater rim, is silenced as much by astonishment as by admiration. Before him lies a crater of pale, pearly lava several miles in diameter. A thousand feet below its rim is a lake whose farthest blues vie in delicacy with the horizon lavas, and deepen as they approach till at his feet they turn to almost black. There is nothing with which to compare the nearby blue looked sharply down upon from crater's rim. The deepest indigo is nearest its intensity, but at certain angles falls far short nor is it only the color which affects him so strongly. Its kind is something new, startling, and altogether lovely. Its surface, so magically framed and tinted, is broken by fleeting silver wind streaks here and there. Otherwise, it has the vast stillness which we associate with the Grand Canyon and the sky at night. The lava walls are pearly, faintly blue afar off, graying and daubed with many colors nearer by pinks, purples, brick reds, sulfurs, orange yellows, and many intermediates streak and splash the foreground gray, and often pine green forests fringe the rim and funnel down sharply tilted canyons to the water's edge, and sometimes shrubs of livelier green find foothold on the gentler slopes, and spreading paint bright patches. Overall, shutting down and around it like a giant bowl, is a sky of Californian blue overhead, softening to the pearl of the horizon a wonder spectacle indeed. And then our tourist, recovering from his trance, walks upon the rim and descends the trail to the water's edge to join a launch party around the lake. Here he finds a new and different experience, which is quite as sensational as that of his original discovery. Seen close by from the lake's surface, these tinted lava cliffs are carved as grotesquely as a Japanese ivory. Precipices rise at times two thousand feet, sheer as a wall. Elsewhere, gentle slopes of powdery lava, moss-tinted, connect rim and water with a ruler line, and between these two extremes are found every fashion and kind and degree of lava wall, many of them precipitous, most of them rugged, all of them contorted and carved in the most fantastic manner that imagination can picture. Caves open their dark doors at the water's edge. Towered rocks emerge from submerged reefs. A mimic volcano rises from the water near one side. Perpetual snow fills sheltered crevices in the southern rim. And all this wonder is reflected, upside down, in the still mirror through which the launch plows its rapid way. But looking backward, where the inverted picture is broken and tossed by the waves from the launch's prow, he looks upon a kaleidoscope of color which he will remember all his life, for to the gorgeous disarray of the broken image of the cliffs is added the magic tint of this deep-dyed water, every wavelet of which, at its crest, seems touched for the fraction of a second with a flash of indigo, the whole dancing, sparkling, shimmering in a glory which words cannot convey. And on the other side, and far astern, the subsiding waves calming back to normal, in a flare of robin's egg blue. Our tourist returns to the Rimside Hotel to the ceremony of sunset on Crater Lake, for which the lake abandons all traditions and clothes itself in gold and crimson. And in the morning, after looking, before sunrise, upon a crater lake of hard polished steel from which a falling rock would surely bounce and bound away as if on ice, he breakfasts and leaves without another look, lest repetition dull his priceless memory 
of an emotional experience which, all in all, can never come again the same. It is as impossible to describe Crater Lake as it is to paint it. Its outlines may be photographed, but the photograph does not tell the story. Its colors may be reproduced, but the reproduction is not Crater Lake. More than any other spot I know, except the Grand Canyon from its rim, Crater Lake seems to convey a glory which is not of line or mass or color or composition, but which seems to be of the spirit. No doubt this vivid impression which the stilled observer seems to acquire with his mortal eye is born somehow of his own emotion. Somehow he finds himself in communion with the infinite. Perhaps it is this quality which seems so mysterious that made the Klamath Indians fear and shun Crater Lake, just as the Indians of the Great Plateau feared and shunned the Grand Canyon. It is this intangible, seemingly spiritual quality which makes the lake impossible either to paint or to describe. So different is this spectacle from anything else upon the continent that the first question asked usually is how it came to be. The answer discloses one of the most dramatic incidents in the history of the earth. In the evolution of the Cascades, many have been the misadventures of volcanoes. Some have been buried alive in ash and lava, and merged into conquering rivals. Some have been buried in ice, which now, organized as glaciers, is wearing down their sides. Some have died of starvation and passed into the hills. Some have been blown to atoms. Only one in America, so far as known, has returned into the seething gulf which gave it birth. That was Mount Mazama. The processes of creation are too deliberate for human comprehension. The Mississippi takes 5,000 years to lower one inch its valley surface. The making of Glacier National Park required many, perhaps hundreds of millions of years. It seems probable that the cataclysm in which Mount Mazama disappeared was exceptional. Death may have come suddenly, even as expressed in human terms. What happened seems to have been this. Some foundation underpinning gave way in the molten gulf below, and the vast mountain sank and disappeared within itself. Imagine the spectacle. Who can? Mount Mazama left a clean-cut rim surrounding the hole through which it slipped and vanished. But there was a surging back. The eruptive forces, rebounding, pushed the shapeless mass again up the vast chimney. They found it too heavy a load. Deep within the ash-choked vent burst three small craters, and that was all. Two of these probably were short-lived. The third lasted a little longer and centuries later spring water seeped through, creating Crater Lake. Crater Lake is set in the summit of the Cascade Range, about 65 miles north of the California boundary. The road from the railway station at Medford leads 80 miles eastward up the picturesque volcanic valley of the Rogue River. The country is magnificently forested. The mountains at this point are broad, gently rolling plateaus, from which suddenly rise many volcanic cones, which seen from elevated opens are picturesque in the extreme. Each of these cones is the top of a volcano from whose summit has streamed the prehistoric floods of lava which have filled the intervening valleys, raising and leveling the country. Entering the park, a high, broad, forested elevation is quickly encountered, which looks at a glance exactly what it is, the base which once supported a towering cone. At its summit, this swelling base is found to be the outside supporting wall of a roughly circular lake, about five miles in diameter, the inside wall of which is steeply inclined to the water's surface, a thousand feet below. The strong contrast between the outer and inner walls tells a plainly read story. The outer walls, all around, slope gently upward at an angle of about fifteen degrees. Naturally, if carried on, they would converge in a peak summit higher than that of Shasta. The inner walls converge downward at a steep angle, suggesting a funnel of enormous depth. It was through this funnel that Mount Mazama, as men call the volcano that man never saw, once collapsed into the gulf from which it had emerged. Studying the scene from the lodge on the rim where the automobile stage has left you, the most vivid impressions of detail are those of the conformation of the inner rim, the cliffs which rise above it, and the small volcano which emerges from the blue waters of the lake. The marvelous inner slope of the rim is not a continuous cliff, but a highly diversified succession of strata. Examination shows the layer of volcanic conglomerate and lava of which, like layers of brick and stone, the great structure was built. The downward dip of these strata away from the lake is everywhere discernible. 
The volcano's early story thus lies plain to eyes trained to read it. The most interesting of these strata is the lava flow which forms 12,000 feet of the total precipice of Leo Rock, a prominence of conspicuous beauty. Many of these cliffs are magnificently bold. The loftiest is Glacier Peak, which rises almost 2,000 feet above the water's surface. But Dutton Cliff is a close rival, and Vidi Cliff, Garfield Peak, Leo Rock, and the Watchman fall close behind. Offsetting these are breaks where the rim drops within 600 feet of the water. The statement of a wall height of a 1,000 feet expresses the general impression, though as an average it is probably well short of the fact. At the foot of all the walls, at water's edge, lie slopes of talus, the rocky fragments which erosion has broken loose and dropped into the abyss. Nowhere is there a beach. The talus shallows the water for a few hundred feet, and descending streams build small deltas. These shallows edge the intense blue of the depths with exquisite lighter tints which tend to green, but this edging is very narrow. The next most striking object, after the gigantic carven cliffs, is Wizard Island. This complete volcano in miniature, notwithstanding that it is forest-clothed and rises from the water, carries the traveler's mind instantly to the thirteen similar cones which rise within the enormous desert crater of dead Haleakala in the Hawaii National Park. Wizard Island's crater may easily be seen in the tip of its cone. Its two fellow volcanoes are invisible, 400 feet under the water. Scanning the blue surface, one's eye is caught by an interesting sail-like rock rising from the waters on the far right, close to the foot of Dutton Cliff. This is the phantom ship. Seen two miles away in certain lights, the illusion is excellent. The mass seem to tilt rakishly, and the sails shine in the sun. There are times when the phantom ship suddenly disappears, and times again when it as suddenly appears where nothing was before, hence its name and mysterious repute. But there is nothing really mysterious about this ghostly behavior, which occurs only when the heated atmosphere lends itself readily to mirage. Days and weeks of rare pleasure may be had in the exploration of these amazing walls, a pleasure greatly to be enhanced by discovering and studying the many plain evidences of Mazama's slow upbuilding and sudden extinction. The excellent automobile road around the rim affords easy approach afoot, as well as by automobile and bicycle. Its passage is enlivened by many inspiring views of the outlying cascades, with their great forests of yellow pine and their lesser volcanic cones, some of which, within and without the park boundaries, hung upon the flanks of Mount Mazama while it was belching flame and ash, while others, easing the checked pressure following the great catastrophe, were formed anew or enlarged from older vents. From this road any part of the fantastic rim may be reached and explored, often to the water's edge, by adventurous climbers. What more enjoyable day's outing, for instance, than the exploration of the splendid pile of pentagonal basaltic columns suspended halfway in the rim at one point of picturesque beauty? What more inspiring than the climbing of Dutton Cliff, or, for experienced climbers, of many of the striking lava spires? The only drawback to these days of happy wandering along this sculptured and painted rim is the necessity of carrying drinking water from the lodge. Then there are days of pleasure on the water. Wizard Island may be thoroughly explored, with luncheon under its trees by the lakeside. The phantom ship's gnarled lavas may be examined and climbed. Everywhere the steep rocky shore invites more intimate acquaintance. Its caves may be entered, some afoot, at least one afloat. The lake is well stocked with rainbow trout, some of them descendants of the youngsters which Will G. Steele laboriously carried across country from Gordon's Ranch, 49 miles away, in 1888. They are caught with the fly from shore and boat. A pound trout in Crater Lake is a small trout. Occasionally a monster of eight or ten pounds is carried up the trail to the lodge. During all these days and weeks of pleasure and study, the vision of ancient Mount Mazama and its terrible end grows more and more in the enlightened imagination. There is much in the confirmation of the base to justify a rather definite picture of this lost brother of Hood, Shasta, St. Helens, and Rainier. At the climax of his career, Mazama probably rose 16,000 feet above the sea, which means 10,000 feet above the level of the present lake. We are justified, too, in imagining his end a cataclysm. Volcanic upbuildings are so often spasmodic and slow, a series of impulses separated by centuries of quiescence, but their climaxes often are sudden and excessively violent. 
it seems more probable that Mazama collapsed during violent eruption. Perhaps like a stroke of lightning at the moment of triumph, death came at the supreme climax of his career. Certainly no mausoleum was ever conceived for human hero, which may be compared for a moment with this glorified grave of dead Mazama. The human history of Crater Lake has its interest. The Indians feared it. John W. Hillman was the first white man to see it. Early in 1853, a party of Californian miners ascended the Rogue River to rediscover a lost gold mine of fabulous richness. The expedition was secret, but several Oregonians who suspected its object and meant to be in at the finding quickly organized and followed. Hillman was of this party. The Californians soon learned of the pursuit. Then, wrote Hillman, half a century later, it was a game of hide-and-seek, until rations on both sides got low. The Californians would push through the brush, scatter, double backward on their trail, and then camp in the most inaccessible places to be found, and it sometimes puzzled us to locate and camp near enough to watch them. Eventually, the rivals united. A combination search party was chosen, which included Hillman. And this party, while it found no gold mine, found Crater Lake. While riding up a long, sloping mountain, Hillman continued, we suddenly came in sight of water, and were very much surprised, as we did not expect to see any lakes. We did not know, but what we had come in sight, and close to Klamath Lake, and not until my mule stopped within a few feet of the rim of Crater Lake, did I look down, and if I had been riding a blind mule, I firmly believe I would have ridden over the edge to death and destruction. The finding of Crater Lake, he concludes, was an accident, as we were not looking for lakes, but the fact of my being the first upon its banks was due to the fact that I was riding the best saddle mule in southern Oregon, the property of Jimmy Dobson, a miner and packer with headquarters at Jacksonville, who had furnished me the mule in consideration of a claim to be taken in his name should we be successful. Stranger to me than our discovery was the fact that after our return I could get no acknowledgment from any Indian, buck or squaw, old or young, that any such lake existed. Each and every one denied any knowledge of it, or ignored the subject completely. The next development in Crater's history introduces Will G. Steele, widely known as the father of Crater Lake National Park, a pioneer of the highest type, a gold seeker in the coast ranges and the Klondike, a school teacher for many years, and a public-spirited enthusiast. In 1869, a farmer's boy in Kansas, he read a newspaper account of an Oregon lake with precipice sides 5,000 feet deep. Moving to Oregon in 1871, he kept making inquiries for seven years before he verified the fact of the lake's existence, and it was two years later before he found a man who had seen it. This man's description decided him to visit it, then an undertaking of some difficulty. He got there in 1885. Standing on the rim, he suggested to Professor Joseph LeConte that an effort be made to induce the national government to save it from defacement and private exploitation. Returning home, they prepared a petition to President Cleveland, who promptly withdrew ten townships from settlement pending a bill before Congress to create a national park. Congress refused to pass the bill on the ground that Oregon should protect her own lake. Then Steele began an effort, or rather an unbroken succession of efforts, to interest Congress. For seventeen years he agitated the project at home, where he made speeches winter and summer all over the state, and at Washington, which he deluged with letters and circulars. Finally, the bill was passed. Crater Lake became a national park on May 22, 1902. Mr. Steele's work was not finished. He now began just as vigorous a campaign to have the lake properly stocked with trout. It required years, but succeeded. Then he began a campaign for funds to build a road to the lake. This was a stubborn struggle which carried him to Washington for a winter, but it finally succeeded. During most of this time, Mr. Steele was a country school teacher without other personal income than his salary. He spent many of his summers talking Crater Lake projects to audiences in every part of the state, depending upon his many friends for entertainment and for lifts from town to town. He was superintendent of the park from 1913 to the winter of 1920, when he became United States Commissioner for the park. The attitude of the Indians toward Crater Lake remains to be told. Steele is authority for the statement that previous to 1886 no modern Indian had looked upon its waters. Legends inherited from their ancestors made them greatly fear it. I quote O.C. Applegate's Klamath's Legend of Leo from Steele Points for January 1907. 
According to the mythology of the Klamath and Modoc Indians, the chief spirit who occupied the mystic land of Gawas, or Crater Lake, was Leo. Under his control were many lesser spirits who appeared to be able to change their forms at will. Many of these were monsters of various kinds, among them the giant crawfish, or dragon, who could, if he chose, reach up his mighty arms even to the tops of the cliffs and drag down to the cold depths of Crater Lake any too venturesome tourist of the primal days. The spirits or beings who were under the control of Leo assumed the forms of many animals of the present day when they chose to go abroad on dry land, and this was no less true of the other fabulous inhabitants of Klamath Land who were dominated by other chief spirits and who occupied separate localities. All these forms, however, were largely or solely subject to the will of Kamukumps, the great spirit. Now on the north side of Mount Jackson, or Leo Yena, Leo's Mountain, the eastern escarpment of which is known as Leo Rock, is a smooth field sloping a little toward the north, which was a common playground for the fabled inhabitants of Gawas and neighboring communities. Skell was a mighty spirit whose realm was the Klamath Marsh country, his capital being near the Yamsey River on the eastern side of the marsh. He had many subjects who took the form of birds and beasts when abroad on the land, as the antelope, the bald eagle, the Bliwas or Golden Eagle, among them many of the most sagacious and active of all the beings then upon the earth. A fierce war occurred between Skell and Leo and their followers, which raged for a long time. Finally Skell was stricken down in his own land of Yamsi, and his heart was torn from his body and was carried in triumph to Leo Yena. Then a great gala day was declared, and even the followers of Skell were allowed to take part in the games on Mount Jackson, and the heart of scale was tossed from hand to hand in the great ball game in which all participated. If the heart of scale could be borne away so that it could be restored to his body, he would live again, and so, with a secret understanding among themselves, the followers of scale watched for the opportunity to bear it away. Eventually, when it reached the hands of Antelope, he sped away to the eastward like the wind. When nearly exhausted, he passed it to Eagle, and he in turn to Bliwas, and so on, and although Leo's followers pursued with their utmost speed, they failed to overtake the swift bearers of the precious heart. At last they heard the faraway voice of the dove, another of Skell's people, and then they gave up the useless pursuit. Skell's heart was restored, and he lived again, but the war was not over, and finally Leo was himself overpowered and slain, and his bleeding body was borne to the Leo Yena, on the very verge of the great cliff, and a false message was conveyed to Leo's monsters in the lake that Skell had been killed instead of Leo, and when a quarter of the body was thrown over, Leo's monsters devoured it, thinking it a part of Skell's body. Each quarter was thrown over in turn with the same result. But when the head was thrown into the lake, the monsters recognized it as the head of their master and would not touch it, and so it remains today, an island in the lake, to all people now known as Wizard Island." In 1885, at Fort Klamath, Steele obtained from Alan David, the white-headed chief of the Klamath Indians, the story of how the Indians returned to Crater Lake. It was long before the white man appeared to drive the native out. Several Klamaths, while hunting, were shocked to find themselves on the lake rim, but gazing upon its beauty, suddenly it was revealed to them that this was the home of the Great Spirit. They silently left and camped far away, but one brave under the spell of the lake returned, looked again, built his campfire and slept. The next night he returned again, and still again. Each night strange voices which charmed him rose from the lake. Mysterious noises filled the air. Moons waxed and waned. One day he climbed down to the water's edge, where he saw creatures, like in all respects to Klamath Indians, inhabiting the waters. Again and again he descended, bathed, and soon began to feel mysteriously strong. Stronger than any Indian of his tribe, because of his many visits to the waters. Others, perceiving his growing power, ventured also to visit the lake, and upon bathing in its waters also received strength. On one occasion, said David solemnly, the brave who first visited the lake killed a monster or fish, and was at once set upon by untold numbers of excited laos, for such they were called, who carried him to the top of the cliffs, cut his throat with a stone knife, then tore his body into small pieces, which were thrown down to the waters far beneath, and devoured by angry Laos. In 1886, two Klamaths accompanied Captain Clarence E. Dutton's geological survey party to Crater Lake, and descended to the water's edge. 
the news of the successful adventure spread among the Indians, and others came to look upon the forbidden spot. That was the beginning of the end of the superstition. Steele says that 200 claimants camped upon the rim in 1896 while he was there with the Mazamas. The lake was variously named by its early visitors. The Hillman party which discovered it named it Deep Blue Lake on the spot. Later it was known as Lake Mystery, Lake Majesty, and Hole in the Ground. A party from Jacksonville named it Crater Lake on August 4, 1869. End of Part 14「Part fifteen of the Book of the National Parks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard. Yellowstone, a Volcanic Interlude. Wyoming, Northwestern Wyoming. Area, 3,348 square miles. 1. John Coulter's story of hot springs at the upper waters of the Yellowstone River was laughed at by the public of 1810. Jim Bridger's account of the geysers in the thirties made his national reputation as a liar. Warren Angus Ferris's description of the upper geyser basin was received in 1842 in unbelieving silence. Later explorers who sought the Yellowstone to test the truth of these tales thought it wholesome to keep their findings to themselves, as magazines and newspapers refused to publish their accounts, and lecturers were stoned in the streets as impostors. It required the authority of the semi-official Washburn-Langford expedition of 1869 to establish credence. The original appeal of the Yellowstone, that to wonder, remains its most popular appeal today, though science has dissipated mystery these many years. Many visitors, I am persuaded, enjoy the wonder of it more even than the spectacle. I have heard people refuse to listen to the explanation of geyser action, lest it lessen their pleasure in Old Faithful. I confess to moods in which I want to see the blue flames and smell the brimstone which Jim Bridger describes so eloquently. There are places where it is not hard to imagine both. For many years the uncanny wonders of a dying volcanic region absorbed the public mind to the exclusion of all else in the Yellowstone neighborhood, which Congress, principally in consequence of these wonders, made a national park in 1872. Yet all the time it possessed two other elements of distinction, which a later period regards as equal to the volcanic phenomena, elements, in fact, of such distinction that either one alone, without the geysers, would have warranted the reservation of so striking a region for a national park. One of these is the valley of the Yellowstone River, with its spectacular waterfalls and its colorful canyon. The other is its population of wild animals, which, in 1872, probably was as large and may have been larger than today's. Yet little was heard of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone in those days, although Morin's celebrated painting, now in the Capitol at Washington, helped influence Congress to make it a national park, and so little did the wild animals figure in the calculations of the period that they were not even protected in the national park until 1894, when hunting had reduced the buffalo to twenty-five animals. Even in these days of enlightenment and appreciation, the great majority of people think of the Yellowstone only as an area enclosing geysers. There are tourists so possessed with this idea that they barely glance at the canyon in passing. I have heard tourists refuse to walk to Inspiration Point because they had already looked over the rim at a convenient and unimpressive place. Imagine coming two thousand miles to balk at two miles and a half to the only spectacle of its kind in the world, and one of the world's great spectacles at that. As for the animals, Few indeed see any but the occasional bears that feed at the hotel dumps in the evening. The Yellowstone National Park lies in the recesses of the Rocky Mountains in northwestern Wyoming. It slightly overlaps Montana on the north and northwest, and Idaho on the southwest. It is rectangular, with an entrance about the middle of each side. It is the largest of the national parks, enclosing 3,348 square miles. It occupies a high plain girt with mountains. The Absarokas bounded on the east, their crest invading the park at Mount Chittenden. The Galantin Range pushes into the northwestern corner from the north. The Continental Divide crosses the southwestern corner over the lofty Madison Plateau and the ridge south of Yellowstone Lake. Altitudes are generally high. The plains range from six to 8,000 feet. The mountains rise occasionally to 10,000 feet. 
south of the park the pitchstone plateau merges into the foothills of the teton mountains which thirty miles south of the southern boundary rise precipitously seven thousand feet above the general level of the country though occupying the heart of the rocky mountains the region is not of them in no sense is it typical the rockies are essentially granite which was forced molten from the depths when at the creation of this vast central mountain system lateral pressures lifted the earth's skin high above sea level folded it and finally eroded it along the crest of the folds in this granite system the yellowstone is a volcanic interlude and of much later date it belongs in a general way to the impulse of volcanic agitation which lighted vast beacons over three hundred thousand square miles of our northwest the cascade mountains belong in this grouping four national parks of today were then in the making mount rainier in washington crater lake in oregon lassen volcanic in california and the yellowstone in wyoming subterranean heat remaining from those days of volcanic activity today boils the water which the geysers hurl in air in the northeastern part of the yellowstone a large central crater was surrounded by smaller volcanoes you can easily trace the conformation from mount washburn which stood upon its southeastern rim heaped there doubtless by some explosion of more than common violence this volcanic period was of long duration perhaps hundreds of thousands of years in the northeastern part of the park the erosion of a hill has exposed the petrified remains of thirteen large forests in layers one on top of the other the deep intervening spaces filled with thick deposits of ashes thirteen consecutive times were great forests here smothered in the products of eruption thirteen times did years enough elapse between eruptions for soil to make and forests to grow again each perhaps of many generations of great trees yellowstone's mountains then are decayed volcanoes its rock is lava its soil is ash and disintegrated lava the resulting outline is soft and waving with a tendency to levels there are no pinnacled heights no stratified minareted walls no precipiced cirques and glacier shrouded peaks yet glaciers visited the region the large granite boulder brought from afar and left near the west rim of the grand canyon with thousands of feet of rheolite and other products of volcanism beneath it is alone sufficient proof of that between the periods from volcano to glacier and from glacier to today stream erosion has performed its miracles the volcanoes have been rounded and flattened the plateaus have been built up and leveled and the canyons of the yellowstone gibbon and madison rivers have been dug vigorous as its landscape still remains it has thus become the natural playground for a multitude of people unaccustomed to the rigors of a powerfully accented mountain country the fact is that in spite of its poverty of peaks and precipices the yellowstone country is one of the most varied and beautiful wildernesses in the world among national parks it gains rather than loses by its difference while easily penetrated it is wild in the extreme hinting of the prairies in its broad opens pasture for thousands of wild ruminants and of the loftier mountains in its distant ranges its isolated peaks and its groups of rugged rolling summits in the number magnitude and variety of its waters it stands quite alone it contains no less than three watersheds of importance those of the yellowstone madison and snake rivers flowing respectively north west and south the waters of the yellowstone and madison make it an important source of the missouri there are minor rivers of importance in the park and innumerable lesser streams it is a network of waterways its waterfalls are many and two of them are large and important its lakes are many and several are large yellowstone lake is the largest of its altitude in the world as a wilderness therefore the yellowstone is unequalled its innumerable waters ensure the luxuriance of its growth its forested parts are densely forested its flower gardens are unexcelled in range color and variety and its meadows grow deep in many kinds of rich grass if it were only for the splendor of its wilderness it still would be worth the while imagine this wilderness heavily populated with friendly wild animals sprinkled with geysers hot springs mud volcanoes painted terraces and petrified groves sensational with breathtaking canyons and waterfalls penetrable over hundreds of miles of well-built road and several times the mileage of trails and comfortable because of its large hotels and public camps located conveniently for its enjoyment and you have a pleasure ground of extraordinary quality 
Remember that one may camp out almost anywhere, and that all waters are trout waters. Yellowstone offers the best fishing easily accessible in the continent. Another advantage possessed by the Yellowstone is a position near the center of the country among great railroad systems. The Northern Pacific reaches it on the north, the Burlington on the east, and the Union Pacific on the west. One can take it coming or going between oceans. It is possible to buy tickets in by any one railroad and out by either of the others. An elaborate system of automobile coaches swings the passenger where he pleases, meeting all incoming trains and delivering at all outgoing trains. It is much easier now to see the Yellowstone than in the much vaunted stagecoach times previous to 1915, times solely lamented by the Romantic, because their passing meant the passing of the picturesque old horse-drawn stagecoach from its last stand in the United States, times when a tour of the Yellowstone meant six and a half days of slow, dusty travel, starting early and arriving late, with a few minutes or hours at each site for the soiled and exhausted traveler to gape in ignorant wonder, watch in hand. Today one travels swiftly and comfortably in entire leisure, stopping at hotels or camps as he pleases, and staying at each as long as he likes. The runs between the lingering places are now a pleasure. If hurried, one can now accomplish the stagecoach trip of the past in two days, while the old six and a half days now means a leisurely and delightful visit. With the new order of travel began a new conception of the Yellowstone's public usefulness. It ceased to be a museum of wonders and began to be a summer pleasure ground. Instead of the fast automobile stage decreasing the average length of visit, the new idea which it embodied has lengthened it. This new idea is a natural evolution which began with the automobile and spread rapidly. The railroads have been bringing tourists principally on transcontinental stopovers. Automobiles brought people who came really to see the Yellowstone, who stayed weeks at public camps to see it, or who brought outfits and camped out among its spectacles. The first Ford which entered the park on the morning of August 1, 1915, the day when private cars were first admitted, so loaded with tenting and cooking utensils that the occupants scarcely could be seen, was the herald of the new and greater Yellowstone. Those who laughed, and those who groaned at the sight of it, and there were both, were no seers, for that minute Yellowstone entered upon her destiny. The road scheme is simple and effective. From each entrance, a road leads into an oblong loop road, enclosing the center of the park and touching the principal points of scenic interest. This loop is connected across the middle for convenience. From it, several short roads push out to special spectacles, and a long road follows Lamar Creek, through a northeastern entrance to a mining town which has no other means of communication with the world outside. This is the road to Specimen Ridge, with its thirteen engulfed forests, to the Buffalo Range, and outside the park boundaries to the Grasshopper Glacier, in whose glassy embrace may be seen millions of grasshoppers, which have lain in very cold storage, indeed, from an age before man. All are automobile roads. 2. The hot water phenomena are scattered over a large area of the park. The mammoth hot springs at the northern entrance are the only active example of a high terrace building. The geysers are concentrated in three adjoining groups upon the middle west side, but hot springs occur everywhere at widely separated points. A steam jet is seen emerging even from the depths of the Grand Canyon, a thousand feet below the rim. The traveler is never long allowed to forget, in the silent beauty of the supreme wilderness, the park's uncanny nature, suddenly encountered columns of steam rising from innocent meadows, occasional half-acres of dead and discolored brush emerging from hot and yellow mud holes within the glowing forest heart, an unexpected roaring hillside running with smoking water, irregular agitated pools of gray, pink, or yellow mud, spitting like a pot of porridge, explosive puffs of steam, the warm vaporing of a shallow in a cold forest-bound lake, a continuous violent bellowing from the depths of a ragged roadside hole which at intervals vomits noisily quantities of thick brown and purple liquid, occasional groups of richly colored hot springs in an acre or more of dull yellows, the hole steaming vehemently and interchanging the pinks and blues of its hot waters as the passing traveler changes his angle of vision. These and other uncouth phenomena in wide variety and frequent repetition enliven the tourist's way. They are more numerous in geyser neighborhoods, but some of them are met singly, always with a little shock of surprise, in every part of the park. 
The terrace building springs in the north of the park engulf trees. The bulky, growing mounds of white and gray deposit are edged with minutely carven basins mounted upon elaborately fluted supports of ornate design, over whose many-colored edges flows a shimmer of hot water. Basin rises upon basin, tier upon tier, each in turn destined to clog and dry and merge into the mass, while new basins and new tiers form and grow and glow a while upon their outer flank. The material, of course, is precipitated by the water when it emerges from the earth's hot interior. The vivid yellows and pinks and blues in which these terraces clothe themselves upon warm days result from minute vegetable algae, which thrive in the hot, saturated lime water, but quickly die and fade to gray and shining white on drying. The height of some of these shapeless masses of terrace-built structures is surprising, but more surprising yet is the vividness of color assumed by the limpid springs in certain lights and at certain angles. Climbing the terraces at the expense of wet feet, one stands upon broad, white, and occasionally very damp plateaus which steam vigorously in spots. These spots are irregularly circular and very shallow pools of hot water, some of which bubble industriously with a low, pleasant hum. They are not boiling springs. The bubbling is caused by escaping gases, but their waters are extremely hot. The intense color of some of these pools varies or disappears with the changing angle of vision. The water itself is limpid. Elsewhere throughout the park, the innumerable hot springs seem to be less charged with depositable matter. Elsewhere they build no terraces, but bubble joyously up through bowls often many feet in depth and diameter. Often they are inspiringly beautiful. The blue morning glory spring is jewel-like rather than flower-like in its color quality, but its bowl remarkably resembles the flower which gives it name. Most springs are gloriously green. Some are the sources of considerable streams. Some stir slightly with the feeling rather than the appearance of life. Others are perpetually agitated, several small springs betraying their relationship to the geysers by a periodicity of activity. When the air is dry and the temperature low, the springs shoot thick volumes of steam high in the air. To the incomer by the north or west entrance, who has yet to see a geyser, the first view of the lower geyser basin gives a shock of astonishment, no matter what his expectation. Let us hope it is a cool, bracing, breezy morning when the broad yellow plain emits hundreds of columns of heavy steam to unite in a wind-tossed cloud overlying and settling on the uncanny spectacle. Several geysers spout vehemently, and one or more roaring vents bellow like angry bulls in a nightmare. This is, appropriately, the introduction to the greater geyser basins which lie nearby upon the south. Who shall describe the geysers? What pen, what brush, shall do justice to their ghostly glory? The eager vehemence of their assaults upon the sky, their joyful gush and roar, their insistence upon conscious personality and power, the white majesty of their fluted columns, at the instant of fullest expansion, the supreme loveliness of their feathery fluorescence at the level of poise between rise and fall, their graciousness of form, their speedy airiness of action, their giant convolutions of sun-flecked steam rolling aloft in ever-expanding volume to rejoin the parent cloud. Perhaps there have been greater geyser basins somewhere in the prehistoric past. There may be greater still to come. One or two promising possibilities are in Alaska but for the lapse of geologic time in which man has so far lived, Yellowstone has cornered the world's geyser market. There are only two other places where one may enjoy the spectacle of large geysers. One of these is New Zealand, and the other Iceland, but both displays combined cannot equal Yellowstone's either in the number or the size of the geysers. Yellowstone has dozens of geysers of many kinds. They range in size from the little spring that spurts a few inches every minute to the monster that hurls hundreds of tons of water 300 feet in the air every six or eight weeks. Many spout at regular intervals of minutes or hours or days. Others are notably irregular, and these include most of the largest. Old Faithful won its name and reputation by its regularity. It is the only one of the group of monsters which lives up to its timetable. Its period ranges from intervals of about 55 minutes in seasons following winters of heavy snow to 80 or 85 minutes in seasons following winters of light snow. Its eruptions are announced in the Old Faithful Inn a few minutes in advance of action, and the population of the hotel walks out to see the spouting. 
At night a searchlight is thrown upon the gushing flood. After all, Old Faithful is the most satisfactory of geysers. Several are more imposing. Sometimes enthusiasts remain in the neighborhood for weeks, waiting for the giant to play, and dare not venture far away for fear of missing the spectacle, while Old Faithful, which is quite as beautiful and nearly as large, performs hourly for the pleasure of thousands. Even the most hurried visitor to the upper basin is sure, between stages, of seeing several geysers in addition to one or more performances of Old Faithful. The greatest of known geysers ceased playing in 1888. I have found no authentic measurements or other stated records concerning the famous Excelsior. It hurled aloft an enormous volume of water, with a fury of action described as appalling. Posterity is fortunate in the existence of a striking photograph of this monster taken at the height of its play by F. J. Haynes, then official photographer of the park. The first photographs I made were in the fall of 1881, Mr. Haynes writes me. The eruptions continued during the winter at increasing intervals from two hours, when the series began, to four hours when it ceased operations before the tourist season of 1882. Not having the modern photographic plates for instantaneous work in 1881, it was impossible to secure instantaneous views then, but in the spring of 1888 I made the view which you write about. It was taken at the fullness of its eruption. The explosion was preceded by a rapid filling of the crater and a great overflow of water. The column was about 50 feet wide and came from the center of the crater. Pieces of formation were torn loose and were thrown out during each eruption. Large quantities eventually were removed from the crater, thus enlarging it to its present size. Here we have a witness's description of the process which clouds the career of the Excelsior geyser. The enlargement of the vent eventually gave unrestrained passage to the imprisoned steam. The geyser ceased to play. Today, the Excelsior Spring is one of the largest hot springs in the Yellowstone and the world. Its output of steaming water is constant and voluminous. Thus again we find relationship between the hot spring and the geyser. It is apparent that the same vent, except perhaps for differences of internal shaping, might serve for both. It was the removal of restraining walls which changed the Excelsior geyser to the Excelsior Spring. For many years, geyser action remained a mystery, balanced among conflicting theories, of which, at last, Bunsen's won general acceptance. Spring waters or surface waters seeping through porous lavas gather thousands of feet below the surface in some pocket located in strata which internal pressures still keep hot. Boiling as they gather, the waters rise till they fill the long vent hole to the surface. Still the steam keeps making in the deep pocket, where it is held down by the weight of the water in the vent above. As it accumulates, this steam compresses more and more. The result is inevitable. There comes a moment when the expansive power of the compressed steam overcomes the weight above. Explosion follows. The steam, expanding now with violence, drives the water up the vent and out, nor is it satisfied until the vent is emptied. Upon the surface, as the geyser lapses and dies, the people turn away to the inn and luncheon. Under the surface, again the waters gather and boil in preparation for the next eruption. The interval, till then, will depend upon the amount of water which reaches the deep pocket, the size of the pocket, and the length and shape of the vent hole. If conditions permit the upward escape of steam, as fast as it makes in the pocket, we have a hot spring. If the steam makes faster than it can escape, we have a geyser. End of Part 15「Part Sixteen of the Book of the National Parks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard. Yellowstone, a Volcanic Interlude, Continued. Three. So interesting are the geysers and their kin that, with their splendid wilderness setting, other glories seem superfluous. I have had my moments of impatience with the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone for being in the Yellowstone. Together, the canyon and the geysers are almost too much for one place, even perhaps for one visit. One can only hold so much, even of beauty, at once. Spectacles of this quality and quantity need assimilation, and assimilation requires time. Nevertheless, once enter into sympathetic relations with the canyon, once find its heart and penetrate its secret, and the tables are quickly turned. Strangely, it now becomes quite easy 
to view with comparative coolness the claims of mere hot-water wonders. The canyon cannot be considered apart from its river, any more than a geyser apart from its environment of hot spring and basin, and any consideration of the Yellowstone River begins with its lake. As compared with others of scenic celebrity, Yellowstone Lake is unremarkable. Its shores are so low, and the mountains of its southern border so flat and unsuggestive, that it curiously gives the impression of surface altitude. Curiously, because it actually has the altitude, its surface is more than 7,700 feet above tide. If I have the advertisement right, it is the highest water in the world that floats a line of steamboats. The lake is large, 20 miles north and south by 15 miles east and west. It is irregular with deep indentations. It is heavily wooded to the water's edge. All its entering streams are small, except the Yellowstone River, which from its source in the Absarokas, just south of the park boundary, enters the southeast arm through the lowland wilderness home of the moose and the wild buffalo. The lake is the popular resort of thousands of large white pelicans, its most picturesque feature. That part of the Yellowstone River, which interests us, emerges from the lake at its most northerly point. It is here a broad, swift stream of some depth and great clarity, so swarming with trout that half a dozen or more usually may be seen upon its bottom at any glance from boat or bridge. A number of boats usually are anchored above the bridge, from which anglers are successfully trailing artificial flies and spinners in the fast current, and the bridge is usually lined with anglers who, in spite of crude outfits, frequently hook good trout, which they pull up by main strength, much as the phlegmatic patrons of excursion steamers to the banks yank flopping cod from brine to basket on the top deck. The last time I crossed the fishing bridge and paused to see the fun, a woman whose face beamed with happiness held up a twenty-inch trout and said, "'Just look! My husband caught this, and he is seventy-six years old, last month. It's the first fish he ever caught, for he was brought up in Kansas, you know, where there isn't any fishing. My, but he's a proud man. We're going to get the camp to cook it for us. He's gone now to look for a board to draw its measurement, to show the folks at home.' From here to the river's emergence from the park, the fishing is not crude. In fact, it taxes the most skillful angler's art to steer his fighting trout through boiling rapids to the net. For very soon, the Yellowstone narrows and pitches down sharper slants to the climax of the falls and the mighty canyon. This intermediate stretch of river is beautiful in its quietude. The forests often touch the water's edge, and ever it narrows and deepens and splashes higher against the rocks which stem its current, forever it is steepening to the plunge. Above the upper fall, it pinches to almost a mill race, roars over low sills, swings eastward at right angles, and plunges a hundred and nine feet. I know of no cataract which expresses might in action so eloquently as the upper fall of the Yellowstone. Pressed as it is within narrow bounds, it seems to gush with other motive power than mere gravity. Seen from above looking down, seen sideways from below, or looked at straight on from the campsite on the opposite rim, the water appears hurled from the brink. Less than a mile south of the upper fall, the river again falls, this time into the Grand Canyon. Imposing as the Great Fall is, it must chiefly be considered as a part of the Grand Canyon picture. The only separate view of it looks up from the river's edge in front, a view which few get because of the difficult climb. Every other view poses it merely as an element in the canyon composition. Compared with the upper fall, its more than double height gives it the great superiority of majesty without detracting from the upper fall's gushing personality. In fact, it is the king of falls. Comparison with Yosemite's falls is impossible, so different are the elements and conditions. The great fall of the Yellowstone carries in one body, perhaps, a greater bulk of water than all the Yosemite Valley's falls combined. And so we come to the canyon. In figures, it is roughly a thousand feet deep and twice as wide, more or less, at the rim. The supremely scenic part reaches perhaps three miles below the Great Fall. Several rock points extend far into the canyon, from which the gorgeous spectacle may be viewed as from an aeroplane. Artist Point, which is reached from the east side, displays the Great Fall as the center of a noble composition. It was Moran's choice. Inspiration Point, which juts in far from the west side, shows a deeper and more comprehensive view of the canyon, and only a glimpse of the Great Fall. Both views are essential to any adequate conception. From artist's point, the eye loses detail in the overmastering glory of the whole. From inspiration point, the canyon reveals itself in all the intimacy of its sublime form and color. 
Both views dazzle and astonish. Neither can be looked at very long at one time. It will help comprehension of the picture quality of this remarkable canyon to recall that it is carved out of the products of volcanism. Its promontories and pinnacles are the knobbed and gnarled decomposition products of lava rocks left following erosion. Its sides are gashed and fluted lava cliffs, flanked by long straight slopes of coarse volcanic sand-like grains. Its colors have the distinctness and occasional luridness which seem natural to fused and oxidized disintegrations. Geologically speaking, it is a young canyon. It is digging deeper all the time. Yellow, of course, is the prevailing color. Moran was right. His was the general point of view, his message the dramatic ensemble. But even from artist's point, closer looking reveals great masses of reds and grays, while inspiration point discloses a gorgeous palette daubed with most of the colors and intermediate tints that imagination can suggest. I doubt whether there is another such kaleidoscope in nature. There is apparently every gray from purest white to dull black, every yellow from lemon to deep orange, every red, pink, and brown. These tints dye the rocks and sands in splashes and long transverse streaks, which merge into a single joyous exclamation in vivid color whose red and yellow accents have something of the oriental. Greens and blues are missing from the dyes, but are otherwise supplied. The canyon is edged with lodgepole forests, and growths of lighter greens invade the sandy slants, at times nearly to the frothing river, and the river is a chain of emeralds and pearls. Blue completes the color gamut from the inverted bowl of sky. No sketch of the canyon is complete without the story of the great robbery. I am not referring to the several hold-ups of the old stagecoach days, but to a robbery which occurred long before the coming of man, the theft of the waters of Yellowstone Lake. For this splendid river, these noble falls, this incomparable canyon, are the ill-gotten products of the first of Yellowstone's hold-ups. Originally, Yellowstone Lake was a 160 feet higher and very much larger than it is today. It extended from the headwaters of the present Yellowstone River, far in the south, northward past the present Great Fall and Inspiration Point. It included a large part of what is now known as the Hayden Valley. At that time, the Continental Divide, which now cuts the southwest corner of the park, encircled the lake on its north, and just across the low divide was a small flat-lying stream which drained and still drains the volcanic slopes leading down from Dunraven Peak and Mount Washburn. This small stream, known as Sulphur Creek, has the honor, or the dishonor if you choose, of being the first desperado of the Yellowstone, but one so much greater than its two petty imitators of human times that there is no comparison of misdeeds. Sulphur Creek stole the lake from the Snake River and used it to create the Yellowstone River, which in turn created the wonderful canyon. Here at last is a crime in which all will agree that the end justified the means. How this piracy was accomplished is written on the rocks. Even the former lake outlet into the Snake River is plainly discernible today. At the lake's north end, where the seeping waters of Sulphur Creek and the edge of the lake nearly met on opposite sides of what was then the low flat divide, it only required some slight disturbance, indirectly volcanic, some unaccustomed rising of lake levels, perhaps merely some special stress of flood or storm, to make the connection. Perhaps the creek itself, sapping back in the soft lava soils, unaided found the lake. Connection once made, the mighty body of lake water speedily deepened a channel northward, and Sulphur Creek became sure of its posterity. At that time, hidden under the lake's surface, two real light dikes, or upright walls of harder rock, extended crosswise through the lake more than half a mile apart. As the lake level fell, the nearer of these dikes emerged and divided the waters into two lakes, the upper of which emptied over the dike into the lower. This was the beginning of the Great Fall. And presently, as the Great Fall cut its breach deeper and deeper into the restraining dike, it lowered the upper lake level, until presently the other rheolite dike emerged from the surface, carrying another cataract, and thus began the upper fall. Meantime, the stream below kept digging deeper the canyon of Sulphur Creek, and there came a time when the lower lake drained wholly away. In its place was left a bottom land, which is now a part of the Hayden Valley, and running through it a river. Forthwith, this river began scooping, from the great fall to Inspiration Point, the scenic ditch which is world-celebrated today as the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. 
4. Now imagine this whole superlative wilderness heavily populated with wild animals in a state of normal living. Imagine 30,000 elk, for instance, roaming about in bands of half a dozen to half a thousand. Imagine them, not friendly, perhaps, but fearless, with that entire indifference which most animals show to creatures which neither help nor harm them, as indifferent, say, as the rabbits in your pasture or the squirrels in your oak woods. Imagine all the wild animals, except the sneaking predatory kind, proportionately plentiful and similarly fearless. Bear, antelope, mountain sheep, deer, bison, even moose in the fastnesses, to say nothing of the innumerable smaller beasts. There has been no hunting of harmless animals in the Yellowstone since 1894, and this is one result. It is true that comparatively few visitors see many animals, but that is the fault of their haste or their temperament or their inexperience of nature. One must seek in sympathy to find. Tearing over the wilderness roads in noisy motors smelling of gasoline is not the best way to find them, although the elk and deer became indifferent to automobiles as soon as they discovered them harmless. One may see them not infrequently from automobiles and often from horse-drawn wagons, and one may see them often and intimately who walks or rides horseback on the trails. The admission of the automobile to Yellowstone roads changed seeing conditions materially. In five days of quiet driving in 1914 with Colonel L. M. Brett, then superintendent of the park, in a direction opposite to the stages, I saw more animals from my wagon seat than I had expected to see wild in all my life. We saw bear half a dozen times, elk in numbers, black-tailed and white-tailed deer so frequently that count was lost the second morning, four bands of antelope, buffalo, foxes, coyotes, and even a bull moose. Once we stopped so as not to hurry a large bear and two cubs, which were leisurely crossing the road. Deer watched us pass within a hundred yards, elk grazed at close quarters, and our one bull moose obligingly ambled ahead of us along the road. There was never fear, never excitement, except my own, not even haste. Even the accustomed horses, no more than cocked an ear or two, while waiting for three wild bears to get out of the middle of the road. Of course, scenic completeness is enough in itself to justify the existence of these animals in the marvelous wilderness of the Yellowstone. Their presence in normal abundance, and their calm at homeness, perfects nature's spectacle. In this respect also, Yellowstone's unique place among the national parks is secure. The lessons of the Yellowstone are plain. It is now too late to restore elsewhere the great natural possession which the thoughtless savagery of a former generation destroyed in careless ruth. But thanks to this early impulse of conservation, a fine example still remains in the Yellowstone. But it is not too late to obliterate wholly certain misconceptions by which that savagery was then justified. It is not too late to look upon wild animals as fellow heritors of the earth, possessing certain natural rights which men are glad rather than bound to respect. It is not too late to consider them, with birds and forests, lakes, rivers, seas, and skies, a part of nature's glorious gift for man's manifold satisfaction, a gift to carefully conserve for the study and enjoyment of today, and to develop for the uses of larger and more appreciative generations to come. Of course, if this be brought to universal accomplishment, and the impulse has been advancing fast of late, it must be Yellowstone's part to furnish the exhibit, for we have no other. To many, the most surprising part of Yellowstone's wild animal message is man's immunity from hatred and harm by predatory beasts. To know that wild bears, if kindly treated, are not only harmless but friendly, that grizzlies will not attack except in self-defense, and that wolves, wild cats, and mountain lions fly with that instinctive dread which is man's dependable protection, may destroy certain romantic illusions of youth, and discredit the observation, if not the conscious verity, of many an honest hunter. But it imparts a modern scientific fact, which sets the whole wild animal question in a new light. In every case of assault by bears, where complete evidence has been obtainable, the United States Biological Survey, after fullest investigation, has exonerated the bear. He has always been attacked, or has had reason to believe himself attacked. In more than thirty summers of field work, Vernon Bailey, chief field naturalist of the Biological Survey, has slept on the ground without fires or other protection, and frequently in the morning found tracks of investigating predatory beasts. There are reports, but no records, of human beings killed by wolves or mountain lions in America. Yet for years, all reports susceptible of proof 
have been officially investigated. One of Yellowstone's several manifest destinies is to become the well-patronized American school of wildlife study. Already, from its abundance, it is supplying wild animals to help in the long and difficult task of restoring here and there, to national parks and other favorable localities, stocks which existed before the great slaughter. 5. Thirty miles south of this rolling volcanic interlude, the pristine Rockies, as if in shame of their moment of gorgeous softness, rear in contrast their sharpest and most heroic monument of bristling granite. Scarcely over the park's southern boundary, the foothills of the Teton Mountains swell gently toward their Gothic climax. The country opens and roughens. The excellent road, which makes Jackson's Hole a practical part of the Yellowstone pleasure ground, winds through a rolling, partly wooded grazing ground of elk and deer. The time was when these wild herds made living possible for the nation's hunted desperados, for Jackson's Hole was the last refuge to yield to law and order. At the climax of this sudden granite protest, the Grand Teton rises 7,014 feet in seeming sheerness from Jackson Lake to its total altitude of 13,747 feet. To its right is Mount Moran, a monster only less. The others, clustering around them, have no names. Altogether, they are few and grouped like the units of some fabulous barbaric stronghold. Fitted by size and majesty to be the climax of a mighty range, the Tetons concentrate their all in this one gigantic group. Quickly, north and south, they subside and pass. They are a granite island in a sea of plain. Seen across the lake, a dozen miles which seem but three, these clustered steeple temples rise sheer from the water. Their flanks are snow streaks still in August. Their shoulders hung with glaciers, their spires bald and shining. A greater contrast to the land from which we came and to which we presently return cannot be imagined. Geologically, the two have nothing in common. Scenically, the Tetons set off and complete the spectacle of the Yellowstone. End of Part 16part 17 of the book of the national parks this librivox recording is in the public domain the book of the national parks by robert sterling yard three monsters of hawaii hawaii national park hawaiian islands area 118 square miles if this chapter is confined to the three volcano tops which congress reserved on the islands of hawaii and maui in 1917 wonderful though these are it will describe a small part indeed of the wide range of novelty charm and beauty which will fall to the lot of those who visit the hawaii national park one of the great advantages enjoyed by this national park as indeed by mount mckinley's is its location in a surrounding of entire novelty so that in addition to the object of his visit itself so supremely worth while the traveller has also the pleasure of a trip abroad in novelty, at least, the Hawaii National Park has the advantage over the Alaskan Park, because it involves the life and scenery of the tropics. We can find snow-crowned mountains and winding glaciers at home, but not equatorial jungles, sandalwood groves, and surf-riding. Enormous as this element of charm unquestionably is, this is not the place to sing the pleasures of the Hawaiian Islands. Their palm-fringed horizons, surf-edged coral reefs, tropical forests and gardens, Plantations of pineapple and sugar cane are as celebrated as their rainbows, earthquakes, and graceful girls dancing under tropical stars to the languorous ukulele. Leaving these and kindred spectacles to the steamship circulars and the library shelf, it is our part to note that the Hawaii National Park possesses the fourth largest volcanic crater in the world, whose aspect at sunrise is one of the world's famous spectacles, the largest active volcano in the world, and a lake of turbulent, glowing molten lava, the house of everlasting fire, which fills the beholder with awe. It was not at all, then, the gentle, poetic aspects of the Hawaiian Islands which led Congress to create a national park there, though these form its romantic, contrasted setting. It was the extraordinary volcanic exhibit, that combination of thrilling spectacles of nature's colossal power, which for years have drawn travelers from the four quarters of the earth. The Hawaii National Park includes the summits of Haleakala on the island of Maui and Manaloa and Kilauea on the island of Hawaii. Spain claims the discovery of these delectable islands by Juan Gatano in 1555, 
but their formal discovery and exploration fell to the lot of Captain James Cook in 1778. The Hawaiians thought him a god and loaded him with the treasures of the islands, but on his return the following year, his illness and the conduct of his crew ashore disillusioned them. They killed him and burned his flesh, but their priests deified his bones nevertheless. Parts of these were recovered later, and a monument was erected over them. Then civil wars raged until all the tribes were conquered, at the end of the eighteenth century, by one chieftain, Kamehameha, who became king. His descendants reigned until 1874, when, the old royal line dying out, Kaleakawa was elected his successor. From this time the end hastened. A treaty with the United States ceded Pearl Harbor as a coaling station, and entered American goods free of duty, in return for which Hawaiian sugar and a few other products entered the United States free. This established the sugar industry on a large and permanent scale, and brought laborers from China, Japan, the Azores, and Madeira. More than 10,000 Portuguese migrated to the islands, and the native population began a comparative decrease which still continues. After Kalakewa's death, his sister, Lalia Lokalani, succeeding him in 1891, the drift to the United States became rapid. When President Cleveland refused to annex the islands, a republic was formed in 1894, but the danger from Japanese immigration became so imminent that in 1898, during the Spanish-American War, President McKinley yielded to the Hawaiian request, and the islands were annexed to the United States by resolution of Congress. The setting for the picture of our island park will be complete with several facts about its physical origin. The Hawaiian islands rose from the sea in a series of volcanic eruptions. Originally, doubtless, the greater islands were simple cones emitting lava, ash, and smoke, which coral growths afterward enlarged and enriched. Kauai was the first to develop habitable conditions, and the island southeast of it followed in order. Eight of the twelve are now habitable. The most eastern island of the group is Hawaii. It is also much the largest. This has three volcanoes, Mauna Loa, greatest of the three, and also the greatest volcanic mass in the world, is nearly the center of the island. Kilauea lies a few miles east of it. The summits of both are included in the national park. Mauna Kea, a volcanic cone of great beauty in the north center of the island, forming a triangle with the other two, is not a part of the national park. Northwest of Hawaii, across 60 miles or more of salt water, is the island of Maui, second largest of the group. In its southern part rises the distinguished volcano of Haleakala, whose summit and world-famous crater is the third member of the national park. The other habited islands, in order westward, are Kahulawi, Lanai, Molokai, Oahu, Kauai, and Niha. No portions of these are included in the park. Kahului, Lanai, and Nihiwa are much the smallest of the group. Halia Kala Of the three volcanic summits which concern us, Halia Kala is nearest the principal port of Honolulu, though not always the first visited. Its slopes nearly fill the southern half of the island of Maui. The popular translation of the name Halia Kala is the House of the Sun. Literally, the word means the house built by the sun. The volcano is a monster of more than 10,000 feet, which bears upon its summit a crater of a size and beauty that make it one of the world's show places. This crater is seven and a half miles long by two and a third miles wide. Only three known craters exceed Haleakala's in size. Aso San, the monster crater of Japan, largest by far in the world, is 14 miles long by 10 wide and contains many farms. Lego di Bolsino in Italy, next in size, measures eight and a half by seven and a half miles, and Monte Albano, also in Italy, eight by seven miles. Exchanging your automobile for a saddle horse at the volcano's foot, you spend the afternoon in the ascent. Wonderful indeed, looking back, is the growing arc of plantation and sea, islands growing upon the horizon, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa lifting distant snow-tipped peaks. You spend the night in a rest house on the rim of the crater, but not until you have seen the spectacle of sunset, and in the gray of the morning you are summoned to the supreme spectacle of sunrise. Thousands have crossed seas for Halia Kala's sunrise. That first view of the crater from the rim is one never to be forgotten. Its floor lies two thousand feet below, an enormous rainless rolling plain from which rise thirteen volcanic cones, clean-cut, as regular in form as carven things. Several of these are 700 feet in height. It must have been awe-inspiring, writes Castle, 
when its cones were spouting fire and rivers of scarlet molten lava crawled along the floor. The stillness of this spot emphasizes its emotional effect. A word spoken ordinarily loud is like a shout. You can hear the footsteps of the goats far down upon the crater floor. Upon this floor grow plants known nowhere else. They are famous under the name of silver swords, yucca-like gross, three or four feet high, whose drooping filaments of bloom gleam like polished silver stilettos. When Mark Twain saw the crater, quote, vagrant white clouds came drifting along, high over the sea and valley. Then they came in couples and groups. Then in imposing squadrons, gradually joining their forces, they banked themselves solidly together a thousand feet under us, and totally shut out land and ocean. Not a vestige of anything was left in view, but just a little of the rim of the crater, circling away from the pinnacle whereon we sat, for a ghostly procession of wanderers from the filmy hosts without had drifted through a chasm in the crater wall, and filled round and round, and gathered and sunk and blended together till the abyss was stored to the brim with a fleecy fog. Thus banked, motion ceased, and silence reigned. Clear to the horizon, league upon league, the snowy folds, with shallow creases between, and with here and there stately piles of vapory architecture lifting themselves aloft out of the common plain, some near at hand, some in the middle distances, and others relieving the monotony of the remote solitudes. There was little conversation, for the impressive scene overawed speech. I felt like the last man, neglected of the judgment, and left pinnacled in mid-heaven, a forgotten relic of a vanished world." Unquote. The extraordinary perfection of this desert crater is probably due to two causes. Vents which tapped it far down the volcano's flanks prevented its filling with molten lava. Absence of rain has preserved its walls intact, and saved its pristine beauty from the defacement of erosion. Haleakala has its legend, and this Jack London has sifted to its elements and given us in the cruise of the snark. I quote, It is told that long ago one Maui, the son of Hina, lived on what is now known as West Maui. His mother, Hina, employed her time in the making of capas. She must have made them at night, for her days were occupied in trying to dry the capas. Each morning and all morning she toiled at spreading them out in the sun, but no sooner were they out than she began taking them in in order to have them all under shelter for the night. For know that the days were shorter then than now. Maui watched his mother's futile toil and felt sorry for her. He decided to do something— Oh, no, not to help her hang out and take in the kappas. He was too clever for that. His idea was to make the sun go slower. Perhaps he was the first Hawaiian astronomer. At any rate, he took a series of observations of the sun from various parts of the island. His conclusion was that the sun's path was directly across Haleakala. Unlike Joshua, he stood in no need of divine assistance. He gathered a huge quantity of coconuts, from the fiber of which he braided a stout cord and in one end of which he made a noose, even as the cowboys of Haleakala do to this day. Next he climbed into the house of the sun. When the sun came tearing along the path, bent on completing its journey in the shortest time possible, the valiant youth threw his lariat around one of the sun's largest and strongest beams. He made the sun slow down some, also he broke the beam short off, and he kept on roping and breaking off beams till the sun said it was willing to listen to reason. Maui set forth his terms of peace, which the sun accepted, agreeing to go more slowly thereafter. Wherefore, Hina had ample time in which to dry her kappas, and the days are longer than they used to be, which last is quite in accord with the teachings of modern astronomy. Unquote. Mauna Loa Sixty miles south of Maui, Hawaii, largest of the island group, contains the two remaining parts of our national park, from every point of view, Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, both snow-crowned monsters approaching 14,000 feet of altitude, dominate the island. But Mauna Kea is not a part of the national park. Kilauea, of less than a third its height, shares that honor with Mauna Loa. Of the two, Kilauea is much the older, and doubtless was a conspicuous figure in the old landscape. It has been largely absorbed in the immense swelling bulk of Mauna Loa, which, springing later from the island soil nearby, no doubt diverting Kilauea's vents far below sea level, has sprawled over many miles. So nearly has the younger absorbed the older that Kilauea's famous pit of molten lava seems almost to lie upon Mauna Loa's slope. 
Mauna Loa soars 13,675 feet. Its snowy dome shares with Mauna Kea, which rises even higher, the summit honors of the islands. From Hilo, the principal port of the island of Hawaii, Mauna Loa suggests the back of a leviathan, its body hidden in the mists. The way up, through forests of ancient mahogany and tangles of giant tree fern, then up many miles of lava slopes, is one of the inspiring tours in the mountain world. The summit crater, Mokwawiawio, three-quarters of a mile long by a quarter mile wide, is as spectacular in action as that of Kilauea. This enormous volcanic mass has grown of its own output in comparatively a short time. For decades it has been extraordinarily frequent in eruption. Every five or ten years it gets into action with violence, sometimes at the summit, oftener of recent years, since the central vent has lengthened, at weakened places on its sides. Few volcanoes have been so regularly and systematically studied. Kilauea the most spectacular exhibit of the Hawaii National Park is the Lake of Fire in the crater of Kilauea. Kilauea is unusual among volcanoes. It follows few of the popular conceptions. Older than the towering Mauna Loa, its height is only 4,000 feet. Its lavas have found vents through its flanks, which they have broadened and flattened. Doubtless its own lavas have helped Mauna Loa's to merge the two mountains into one. It is no longer explosive like the usual volcano. Since 1790, when it destroyed a native army, it has ejected neither rocks nor ashes. Its crater is no longer definitely bowl-shaped. From the middle of a broad, flat plain, which really is what is left of the ancient great crater, drops a pit with vertical sides within which boil its lavas. The pit, the lake of fire, is Halimama, commonly translated the House of Everlasting Fire. The correct translation is the House of Mama Fern whose leaf is twisted and contorted like some forms of lava. Two miles and a little more from Halimama, on a part of the ancient crater wall, stands the Hawaiian Volcanic Observatory, which is under the control of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The observatory was built for the special purpose of studying the pit of fire, the risings and fallings of whose lavas bear a relationship toward the volcanism of Mauna Loa, which is scientifically important, but which we need not discuss here. The traveler enters Hawaii by steamer through Hilo. He reaches the rim of Kilauea by automobile, an inspiring run of 31 miles over a road of volcanic glass bordered with vegetation strange to eyes accustomed only to that of the temperate zone. Brilliant hibiscus, native hardwood trees with feathery pom-poms for blossoms, and the giant ferns which tower overhead. On the rim are the hotels and the observatory. Steam jets emerge at intervals, and hot sulfur banks exhibit rich yellows. From there, the way descends to the floor of the crater and unrolls a ribbon of flower-bordered road seven miles long to the pit of fire. By trail, the distance is only two miles and a half across long stretches of hard lava congealed in ropes and ripples and strange contortions. Where else is a spectacle one-tenth as appalling so comfortably and quickly reached? Halimama is an irregular pit a thousand feet long with perpendicular sides. Its depth varies. Sometimes one looks hundreds of feet down to the boiling surface. Sometimes its lavas overrun the top. The fumes of sulfur are very strong, with the wind in your face. At these times, too, the air is extremely hot. There are cracks in the surrounding lava where you can scorch paper or cook a beefsteak. Many have been the attempts to describe it, not having seen it myself, I quote two here. One, a careful picture by a close student of the spectacle, Mr. William R. Castle, Jr. of Honolulu, and the other, a rapid sketch by Mark Twain. By daylight, writes Castle, the lake of fire is a greenish-yellow, cut with ragged cracks of red that look like pale streaks of stationary lightning across its surface. It is restless, breathing rapidly, bubbling up at one point and sinking down in another, throwing up southern fountains of scarlet molten lava that play a few minutes and subside, leaving shimmering mounds which gradually settle to the level surface of the lake, turning brown and yellow as they sink. But as the daylight fades, the fires of the pit shine more brightly. Mauna Loa, behind, becomes a gray, pale blue, insubstantial dome, and overhead stars begin to appear. As darkness comes, the colors on the lake grow so intense that they almost hurt. The fire is not only red, 
it is blue and purple and orange and green blue flames shimmer and dart about the edges of the pit back and forth across the surface of the restless mass sudden fountains paint blood red the great plume of sulphur smoke that rises constantly to drift away across the poisoned desert of ka sometimes the spurts of lava are so violent so exaggerated by the night that one draws back terrified lest some atom of their molten substance should spatter over the edge of the precipice sometimes the whole lake is in motion waves of fire toss and battle with each other and dash in clouds of bright vermilion spray against the black sides of the pit sometimes one of these sides falls in with a roar that echoes back and forth and mighty rocks are swallowed in the liquid mass of fire that closes over them in a whirlpool like water over a sinking ship again everything is quiet a thick scum forms over the surface of the lake dead like the scum on the surface of a lonely forest pool then it shivers flashes of fire dart from side to side the centre bursts open and a huge fountain of lava twenty feet thick and fifty high streams into the air and plays for several minutes waves of blinding fire flowing out from it dashing against the sides until the black rocks are starred all over with bits of scarlet to the spectator there is through it all no sense of fear so intense so tremendous is the spectacle that silly little human feelings find no place all sensations are submerged in a sense of awe mark twain gazed into halimama's terrifying depths it looked he writes like a colossal railroad map of the state of massachusetts done in chain lightning on a midnight sky imagine it imagine a coal-black sky shivered into a tangled network of angry fire here and there were gleaming holes a hundred feet in diameter broken in the dark crust and in them the melted lava the color a dazzling white just tinged with yellow was boiling and surging furiously and from these holes branched numberless bright torrents in many directions like the spokes of a wheel and kept a tolerably straight course for a while and then swept round in huge rainbow curves or made a long succession of sharp worm fence angles which looked precisely like the fiercest jagged lightning those streams met other streams and they mingled with and crossed and recrossed each other in every conceivable direction like skate tracks on a popular skating ground sometimes streams twenty or thirty feet wide flowed from the holes to some distance without dividing and through the opera glasses we could see that they ran down small steep hills and were genuine cataracts of fire white at their source but soon cooling and turning to the richest red grained with alternate lines of black and gold every now and then masses of the dark crust broke away and floated slowly down these streams like rafts down a river occasionally the molten lava flowing under the superincumbent crust broke through split like a dazzling streak from five hundred to a thousand feet long like a sudden flash of lightning and then acre after acre of the cold lava parted into fragments turned up edgewise like cakes of ice when a great river breaks up plunged downward and were swallowed in the crimson cauldron then the wide expanse of the thaw maintained a ruddy glow for a while but shortly cooled and became black and level again during a thaw every dismembered cake was marked by a glittering white border which was superbly shaded inward by aurora borealis rays which were a flaming yellow where they joined the white border and from thence toward their points tapered into glowing crimson then into a rich pale carmine and finally into a faint blush that held its own a moment and then dimmed and turned black some of the streams preferred to mingle together in a tangle of fantastic circles and then they looked something like the confusion of ropes one sees on a ship's deck when she has just taken in sail and dropped anchor provided one can imagine those ropes on fire through the glasses the little fountains scattered about looked very beautiful they boiled and coughed and spluttered and discharged sprays of stringy red fire of about the consistency of mush for instance from ten to fifteen feet into the air along with a shower of brilliant white sparks a quaint and unnatural mingling of gouts of blood and snowflakes unquote. one can descend the sides and approach surprisingly close to the flaming surface the temperature of which by the way is seventeen hundred fifty degrees fahrenheit such is the house of everlasting fire to-day but who can say what it will be a year or a decade hence a clogging or a shifting of the vents below sea-level 
and Kilauea's lake of fire may become again explosive. Who will deny that Kilauea may not soar even above Mauna Loa? Stranger things have happened before this in the Islands of Surprise. End of Part 17「Part 18 of the Book of the National Parks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard. The Sedimentary National Parks. On Sedimentary Rock in Scenery. The national parks which are wrought in sedimentary rocks are Glacier, Mesa Verde, Hot Springs, Platte, Wind Cave, Sully's Hill, and Grand Canyon. Zion National Monument is carved from sedimentary rock also several distinguished reservations in our southwest which conserve natural bridges and petrified forests sedimentary rocks have highly attractive scenic quality lying in strata usually horizontal but often inclined by earth movements sometimes even standing on end they form marked and pleasing contrasts with the heavy massing of the igneous rocks and the graceful undulations and occasional sharp-pointed summits of the lavas as distinguished from igneous rocks, which form under pressure in the Earth's hot interior, and from lava, which results from volcanic eruption when fluid igneous rocks are released from pressure, sedimentary rocks are formed by the solidification of precipitations in water, like limestone, or from material resulting from rock disintegrations washed down by streams, like sandstone and shale. The beds in which they lie, one above another, exhibit a wide range of tint and texture, often forming spectacles of surpassing beauty and grandeur. These strata tend to cleave vertically, sometimes producing an appearance suggestive of masonry, frequently forming impressive cliffs, but often they lie in unbroken beds of great area. When a number of well-defined strata cleave vertically, and one end of the series sags below the other, or lifts above it, the process which geologists call faulting, the scenic effect is varied and striking. Sometimes, as in Glacier National Park, it is puzzling and amazing. Many granitic and volcanic landscapes are variegated in places by accidental beds of sedimentary rock, and conversely, occasional sedimentary landscapes are set off by intrusions of igneous rocks. Besides variety of form, sedimentary rocks furnish a wide range of color derived from mineral dyes dissolved out of rocks by erosion. The gorgeous tint of the Vermilion Cliff in Utah and Arizona the reds and greens of the Grand Canyon and Glacier National Park, the glowing cliffs of the Canyon de Chalie, and the variegated hues of the Painted Desert are examples which have become celebrated. Geologists distinguish many kinds of sedimentary rocks. Scenically, we need consider only four, limestone, conglomerate, sandstone, and shale. Limestone is calcium carbonate derived principally from seawater, sometimes from freshwater, either by the action of microscopic organisms which absorb it for their shells, or occasionally by direct precipitation from saturated solutions. The sediment from organisms, which is the principal source of American scenic limestones, collects as ooze in shallow lakes or seas, and slowly hardens when lifted above the water level. Limestone is a common and prominent scenic rock. Generally it is gray or blue, and weathers pale yellow. Moisture seeping in from above, often reduces soluble minerals, which drain away, leaving caves which sometimes have enormous size. The other sedimentary rocks, which figure prominently in landscape, are products of land erosion, which rivers sweep into seas or lakes, where they are promptly deposited. The coarse gravels which naturally fall first become conglomerate, when cemented by the action of chemicals in water. The finer, sandy particles become sandstone. The fine mud, which deposits last, eventually hardens into shale. Shale has many varieties, but is principally hardened clay. It tends to split into slate-like plates, each the thickness of its original deposit. It is usually dull brown or slate color, but sometimes, as in Glacier National Park and the Grand Canyon, shows a variety of more or less brilliant colors, and, by weathering, a wide variety of kindred tints. Sandstone, which forms wherever moving water or wind has collected sands, and pressure or chemical action has cemented them, is usually buff, but sometimes is brilliantly colored. The processes of nature have mixed the earth's scenic elements in seemingly inextricable confusion, and the task of the geologist has been colossal. Fortunately for us, the elements of scenery are few, and their larger combinations broad and simple. Once the mind has grasped the outline and the processes, 
and the eye has learned to distinguish elements and recognize forms, the world is recreated for us. End of Part 18「is to express a small part of a complicated fact. Glacier is so much less and more. It is less in its exhibit of ice and snow. Both are dying glacial regions, and glacier is hundreds of centuries nearer the end. No longer can it display snowy ranges in August and long, sinuous, Alaska-like glaciers at any time. Nevertheless, it has its glaciers, sixty or more of them, perched upon high rocky shelves, the beautiful, shrunken reminders of one-time monsters. Also, it has the precipice-walled cirques and painted, lake-studded valleys, which these monsters left for the enjoyment of today. It is these cirques and valleys which constitute Glacier's unique feature, which make it incomparable of its kind. Glacier's innermost sanctuaries of grandeur are comfortably accessible and intimately enjoyable for more than two months each summer. The greatest places of the Canadian Rockies are never accessible comfortably. Alpinists may clamber over their icy crevasses and scale their slippery heights in August, but the usual traveler will view their noblest spectacles from hotel porches or valley trails. This comparison is useful, because both regions are parts of the same geological and scenic development in which Glacier may be said to be scenically, though by no means geologically, completed, and the Canadian Rockies still in the making. A hundred thousand years or more from now, the Canadian Rockies may have reached, except for coloring, the present scenic state of Glacier. Glacier National Park hangs down from the Canadian boundary line in northwestern Montana, where it straddles the Continental Divide. Adjoining it on the north is the Waterton Lakes Park, Canada. The Blackfeet Indian Reservation borders it on the east. Its southern boundary is Marias Pass, through which the Great Northern Railway crosses the crest of the Rocky Mountains. Its western boundary is the North Fork of the Flathead River. The park contains 1,534 square miles. Communication between the east and west sides within the park is only by trail across passes over the Continental Divide. There are parts of America quite as distinguished as Glacier, Mount McKinley for its enormous snowy mass and stature, Yosemite for the quality of its valley's beauty, Mount Rainier for its massive radiating glaciers, Crater Lake for its color range in pearls and blues, Grand Canyon for its stupendous painted gulf, but there is no part of America or the Americas, or of the world, to match it of its kind. In respect to the particular wondrous thing these glaciers of old left behind them when they shrank to shelved trifles, there is no other. At Glacier one sees what he never saw elsewhere and never will see again, except at Glacier. There are mountains everywhere, but no others carved into shapes quite like these. Cirques in all lofty ranges, but not cirques just such as these, and because of these unique bordering highlands, there are nowhere else lakes having the particular kind of charm possessed by Glacier's lakes. Visitors seldom comprehend Glacier, hence they are mute, or praise in generalities or vague superlatives. Those who have not seen other mountains find the unexpected and are puzzled. Those who have seen other mountains fail to understand the difference in these. I have never heard comparison with any region except the Canadian Rockies, and this seldom very intelligent. I miss the big glaciers and snowy mountain tops, says the traveler of one type. You can really see something here besides snow, and how stunning it all is says the traveller of another type. "'My God, man, where are your artists?' cried an Englishman, who had come to St. Mary Lake to spend a night and was finishing his week. "'They ought to be here in regiments. Not that this is the greatest thing in the world, but that there's nothing else in the world like it.' Yet this emotional traveller, who had seen the Himalayas, Andes, and Canadian Rockies, could not tell me clearly why it was different. Neither could the others explain why they liked it better than the Canadian Rockies, 
or why its beauty puzzled and disturbed them. It is only he whom the intelligent travel has educated to analyze and distinguish who sees in the fineness and the extraordinary distinction of glaciers' mountain forms the completion of the more heroic undevelopment north of the border. 2. The elements of Glacier's personality are so unusual that it will be difficult, if not impossible, to make phrase describe it. Comparison fails. Photographs will help, but not very efficiently, because they do not convey its size, color, and reality, or perhaps I should say its unreality, for there are places like Two Medicine Lake in still pale mid-morning, St. Mary Lake during one of its gold sunsets, and the cirques of the South Fork of the Belly River, under all conditions, which never can seem actual. To picture Glacier as nearly as possible, imagine two mountain ranges roughly parallel in the north, where they pass the continental divide between them across a magnificent high intervening valley, and in the south, merging into a wild and apparently planless massing of high peaks and ranges. Imagine these mountains repeating everywhere huge pyramids, enormous stone gables, elongated cones, and many other unusual shapes, including numerous sawtooth edges which rise many thousand feet upward from swelling sides, and suggest nothing so much as overturned keelboats. Imagine ranges glacier-bitten alternately on either side with cirques of three or four thousand feet of precipitous depth. Imagine these cirques often so nearly meeting that the intervening walls are knife-like edges. Miles of such walls carry the continental divide, and occasionally these cirques meet and the intervening wall crumbles and leaves a pass across the divide. Imagine places where cirque walls have been so bitten outside as well as in that they stand like amphitheaters builded up from foundations instead of gouged out of rock from above. Imagine these mountains plentifully snow-spattered upon their northern slopes and bearing upon their shoulders many small and beautiful glaciers perched upon rock shelves above and back of the cirques left by the greater glaciers of which they are the remainders. These glaciers are nearly always wider than they are long. Of these I have seen only three with elongated lobes. One is the Blackfeet Glacier, whose interesting west lobe is conveniently situated for observation south of Gunsight Lake, and another, romantically beautiful Agassiz Glacier, in the far northwest of the park, whose ice currents converge in a tongue which drops steeply to its snout. These elongations are complete miniatures, each exhibiting in little more than half a mile of length all usual glacial phenomena, including caves and icefalls. Occasionally, as on the side of Mount Jackson at Gunsight Pass and east of it, one notices small elongated glaciers occupying clefts in steep slopes. The largest and most striking of these tongued glaciers is the westernmost of the three Carter glaciers on the slopes of Mount Carter. It cascades its entire length into Bowman Valley, and Marius R. Campbell's suggestion that it should be renamed the Cascading Glacier deserves consideration. Imagine deep rounded valleys emerging from these cirques and twisting snake-like among enormous and sometimes grotesque rock masses, which often are inconceivably twisted and tumbled, those of each drainage basin converging fan-like to its central valley. Sometimes a score or more of cirques, great and small, unite their valley streams for the making of a river. Seven principal valleys, each the product of such a group, emerge from the east side of the park, thirteen from the west. Imagine hundreds of lakes whose waters, fresh run from snowfield and glacier, brilliantly reflect the odd surrounding landscape. Each glacier has its lake or lakes of robin's egg blue. Every successive shelf of every glacial stairway has its lake, one or more, and every valley has its greater lake or string of lakes. Glacier is preeminently the park of lakes. When all is said and done, they constitute its most distinguished single element of supreme beauty. For several of them, enthusiastic admirers loudly claim world preeminence. And finally, imagine this picture done in soft glowing colors. Not only the blue sky, the flowery meadows, the pine green valleys, and the innumerable many hued waters, but the rocks, the mountains, and the cirques besides. The glaciers of old penetrated the most colorful depths of earth's skin, the very ancient Algonquian strata, that from which a part of the Grand Canyon also was carved. At this point, 
the rocks appear in four differently colored layers. The lowest of these is called the Alton limestone. There are about 1,600 feet of it, pale blue within, weathering pale buff. Whole yellow mountains of this rock hang upon the eastern edge of the park. Next above the Alton lies 3,400 feet of Apicuni argillite, or dull green shale. The tint is pale, deepening to that familiar in the lower part of the Grand Canyon. It weathers every darkening shade to very dark greenish-brown. Next above lies 2,200 feet of Grinnell argillite, or red shale, a dull rock of varying pinks which weathers many shades of red and purple, deepening in places almost to black. There is some gleaming white quartzite mixed with both these shales. Next above lies more than 4,000 feet of Saya limestone, very solid, very massive, iron-gray, with an insistent flavor of yellow and weathering buff. This heavy stratum is the most impressive part of the glacier landscape. Horizontally through its middle runs a dark broad ribbon of diorite, a rock as hard as granite, which once, when molten, burst from below and forced its way between horizontal beds of limestone. And occasionally, as in the swift current and triple divide passes, there are dull iron-black lavas in heavy twisted masses. Above all of these colored strata once lay still another shale of very brilliant red. Fragments of this, which geologists call the Kintla Formation, may be seen topping mountains here and there in the northern part of the park. Imagine these rich strata, hung east and west across the landscape, and sagging deeply in the middle, so that a horizontal line would cut all colors diagonally. Now imagine a softness of line, as well as color, resulting probably from the softness of the rock. There is none of the hard insistence, the uncompromising definiteness of the granite landscape. And imagine further an impression of antiquity, a feeling akin to that with which one enters a medieval ruin or sees the pyramids of Egypt. Only here is the look of immense, unmeasured, immeasurable age. More than at any place, except perhaps the rim of the Grand Canyon, does one seem to stand in the presence of the infinite, an instinct which, while it baffles analysis, is sound, for there are few rocks of the earth's skin so aged as these ornate shales and limestones. And now, at last, you can imagine Glacier. 3. But with Glacier this is not enough. To see, to realize in full its beauty, still leaves one puzzled. One of the peculiarities of the landscape, due perhaps to its differences, is its insistence upon explanation. How came this prehistoric plain so etched with cirques and valleys as to leave standing only worm-like crests, knife-edged walls, amphitheaters, and isolated peaks? The answer is the story of a romantic episode in the absorbing history of America's making. Somewhere between forty and six hundred million years ago, according to the degree of conservatism controlling the geologist who does the calculating, these lofty mountains were deposited in the shape of muddy sediments on the bottom of shallow, freshwater lakes, whose waves left many ripple marks upon the soft muds of its shores, fragments of which, hardened now to shale, are frequently found by tourists. So ancient was the period that these deposits lay next above the primal Archean rocks, and mark, therefore, almost the beginning of accepted geological history. Life was then so nearly at its beginnings that the forms which Walcott found in the Saya limestone were not at first fully accepted as organic. Thereafter, during a time so long that none may even estimate it, certainly for many millions of years, the history of the region leaves traces of no extraordinary change. It sank possibly thousands of feet beneath the fresh waters tributary to the sea, which once swept from the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic, and accumulated their sediments, which today are scenic limestones and shales, and doubtless other sediments above these which have wholly passed away. It may have alternated above and below water level many times, as our southwest has done, eventually under earth pressures concerning whose cause many theories have lived and died, it rose to remain until our times. Then, millions of years ago, but still recently as compared with the whole vast lapse we are considering, came the changes which seem dramatic to us as we look back upon them accomplished, but which came to pass so slowly that no man, had man then lived, could have noticed a single step of progress 
in the course of a long life. Under earth pressures, the skin buckled and the rocky mountains rose. At some stage of this process, the range cracked along its crest from what is now Marias Pass to a point just over the Canadian border, and a couple of hundred miles farther north, from neighborhood of Banff to the northern end of the Canadian Rockies. Then the great overthrust followed. Side pressures of inconceivable power forced upward the western edge of this crack, including the entire crust from the Algonquian strata up, and thrust it over the eastern edge. During the overthrusting, which may have taken a million years, and during the millions of years since, the frosts have chiseled open and the rains have washed away all the overthrust strata, the accumulations of the geological ages from Algonquian times down, except only that one bottom layer. This alone remained for the three ice invasions of the glacial age to carve into the extraordinary area which is called today the Glacier National Park. The Lewis overthrust, so called because it happened to the Lewis Range, is ten to fifteen miles wide. The eastern boundary of the park roughly defines its limit of progress. Its signs are plain to the eye taught to perceive them. The yellow mountains on the eastern edge, near the gateway to Lake McDermott, lie on top of the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, whose surface is many millions of years younger and quite different in coloring. Similarly, Chief Mountain, at the entrance of the Belly River Valley, owes much of its remarkable distinction to the incompatibility of its form and color with the prairie upon which it lies, but out of which it seems to burst. The bottom of McDermott Falls, at Many Glacier Hotel, is plainly a younger rock than the colored Algonquian limestones which form its brink. Perhaps thousands of years after the overthrust was accomplished, another tremendous faulting still further modified the landscape of today. The overthrust edge cracked lengthwise, this time west of the Continental Divide, all the way from the Canadian line southward nearly to Marias Pass. The edge of the strata west of this crack sank perhaps many thousands of feet, leaving great precipices on the west side of the divide, similar to those on the east side. There was this great difference, however, in what followed. The elongated gulf or ditch thus formed became filled with the deposits of later geological periods. This whole process, which also was very slow in movement, is important in explaining the conformation and scenic peculiarities of the west side of the park, which, as the tourist sees it today, is remarkably different from those of the east side. Here the great limestone ranges, glaciered, cirqued, and precipiced as on the east side, suddenly give place to broad, undulating plains, which constitute practically the whole of the great west side, from the base of the mountains, on the east, to the valley of the Flathead, which forms the park's western boundary. These plains are grown thickly with splendid forests. Cross ranges, largely glacier-built, stretch west from the high mountains, subsiding rapidly, and between these ranges lie long winding lakes, forests grown to their edges, which carry the western drainage of the continental divide through outlet streams into the flathead. The inconceivable lapse of time covered in these titanic operations of nature and their excessive slowness of progress robbed them of much of their dramatic quality. Perhaps an inch of distance was an extraordinary advance for the Lewis overthrust to make in any ordinary year, and doubtless there were lapses of centuries where no measurable advance was made. Yet sometimes sudden settlings, accompanied by more or less extended earthquakes, must have visibly altered local landscapes. Were it possible by some such mental foreshortening as that by which the wizards of the screen can press a life into a minute, for imagination to hasten this progress into the compass of a few hours, how overwhelming would be the spectacle! How tremendously would loom this advancing edge, which at first we may conceive as having enormous thickness! How it must have cracked, crumbled, and fallen in frequent titanic crashes as it moved forward! It does not need the imagination of Doré to picture this advance. Thus hastened in fancy. Grim, relentless as death, its enormous towering head lost in eternal snows, its feet shaken by earthquakes, accumulating giant glaciers only to crush them into powder, resting, then pushing forward in slow, smashing, reverberating shoves. How the accumulations of all periods may be imagined crashing together into the depths. 
Silurian gastropods, strange Devonian fishes, enormous Triassic reptiles, the rich and varied shells of the Jurassic, the dinosaurs and primitive birds of the Cretaceous, the little early horses of the Eocene, and Miocene's camels and mastodons mingling their fossil remnants in a democracy of ruin to defy the eternal ages. It all happened, but unfortunately for a romantic conception, it did not happen with dramatic speed. Hundreds, thousands, sometimes millions of years intervened between the greater stages of progress which, with intervening lesser stages, merged into a seldom broken quietude such as that which impresses today's visitor to the mountain tops of Glacier National Park. And who can say that the landscape which today's visitor, with the inborn arrogance of man, looks upon as the thing which the ages have completed for his pleasure, may not merely represent a minor stage in a progress still more terrible. The grist of creation's past milling has disappeared. The waters of heaven, collected and stored in snowfields and glaciers to be released in seasonal torrents, have washed it all away. Not a sign remains today, save here and there, perhaps a fragment of Cretaceous coal. All has been ground to powder and carried off by flood and stream to enrich the soils and upbuild later strata in the drainage basins of the Saskatchewan, the Columbia, and the Mississippi. It is probable that little remained but the Algonquian shales and limestones when the Ice Age sent southward the first of its three great invasions. Doubtless already there were glaciers there of sorts, but the lowering temperatures which accompanied the ice sheets developed local glaciers so great of size that only a few mountain tops were left exposed. It was then that these extraordinary cirques were carved. There were three such periods during the Ice Age, between which and after which stream erosion resumed its untiring sway. The story of the ice is written high upon glaciers' walls and far out on the eastern plains. 4. Into this wonderland the visitor enters by one of two roads. Either he leaves the railroad at Glacier Park on the east side of the Continental Divide, or at Belton on the west side. In either event he can cross to the other side only afoot or on horseback over passes. The usual way is in through Glacier Park. There is a large hotel at the station, from which automobile stages run northward to chalets at Two Medicine Lake, the Cutbank Valley, and St. Mary Lake, and to the Many Glacier Hotel and chalets at Lake McDermott. A road also reaches Lake McDermott from Canada by way of Bab, and Canadian visitors can reach the trails at the head of Waterton Lake by boat from their own Waterton Lakes Park. Those entering at Belton, where the park headquarters are located, find chalets at the railroad station and an excellent hotel near the head of Lake McDonald. There is also a comfortable chalet close to the Sperry Glacier. To see Glacier as thoroughly as Glacier deserves, and to draw freely on its abundant resources of pleasure and inspiration, one must travel the trails and pitch his tent where day's end brings him. But that does not mean that Glacier cannot be seen and enjoyed by those to whom comfortable hotel accommodations are a necessity or even by those who find trail traveling impossible. Visitors therefore fall into three general classes, all of which may study scenery which quite fully covers the range of glaciers' national phenomena and peculiar beauty. The largest of these classes consists of those who can travel, or think they can travel, only in vehicles, and can find satisfactory accommodations only in good hotels. The intermediate class includes those who can, at a pinch, ride ten or twelve miles on comfortably saddled horses, which walk the trails at two or three miles an hour, and who do not object to the somewhat primitive but thoroughly comfortable overnight accommodations of the chalets. Finally comes the small class, which constantly will increase, of those who have the time and inclination to leave the beaten path with tent and camping outfit for the splendid wilderness, and the places of supreme magnificence which are only for those who seek. The man, then, whose tendency to gout, let us say, forbids him ride a horse or walk more than a couple of easy miles a day, may, nevertheless, miss nothing of Glacier's meaning and magnificence, provided he takes the trouble to understand. But he must take the trouble. He must comprehend the few examples that he sees. This is his penalty for refusing the rich experience of the trail, which, out of its very fullness, drives meaning home with little mental effort. His knowledge must be got from six places only, 
which may be reached by vehicle, at least three of which, however, may be included among the world's great scenic places. He can find at Two Medicine, St. Mary, and McDermott superb examples of Glacier's principal scenic elements. Entering at Glacier Park, he will have seen the range from the plains, an important beginning. Already approaching from the east, he has watched it grow wonderfully on the horizon. So suddenly do these painted mountains spring from the grassy plain that it is a relief to recognize in them the advance guard of the Lewis overthrust. Vast fragments of upheavals of the depths, pushed eastward by the centuries to their final resting places upon the surface of the prairie. From the hotel porches they glow gray and yellow and purple and rose and pink, according to the natural coloring of their parts and the will of the sun, a splendid, ever-changing spectacle. End of Part 19Part 20 of the Book of the National Parks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Book of the National Parks by Robert Sterling Yard. Glaciered Peaks and Painted Shales Continued. The Two Medicine Country. An hour's automobile ride from Glacier Park Hotel will enable our traveler to penetrate the range at a point of supreme beauty and stand beside a chalet at the foot of Two Medicine Lake. He will face what appears to be a circular lake in a densely forested valley, from whose shore rises a view of mountains which will take his breath. In the near center stands a cone of enormous size and magnificence, Mount Rockwell, faintly blue, mistily golden, richly purple, dull silver, or red and gray, according to the favor of the hour and the sky. Upon its left and somewhat back rises a smaller, similar cone, flatter but quite as perfectly proportioned, known as Grizzly Mountain, and upon its right less regular masses. In the background, connecting all, are more distant mountains flecked with snow, the Continental Divide. Towering mountains close upon him upon both sides, that upon his right a celebrity in red argolite known as Rising Wolf. He sees all this from a beach of many-colored pebbles. Few casual visitors have more than a midday view of Two Medicine Lake, for the stage returns in the afternoon. The glory of the sunset and the wonder before sunrise are for the few who stay over at the chalet. The lover of the exquisite cannot do better, for, though beyond, lie scenes surpassing this in the qualities which bring to the lips the shout of joy, I am convinced that nothing elsewhere equals the two medicine canvas in the perfection of delicacy. It is the messonnier of glacier. Nor can the student of nature's processes afford to miss the study of two medicines marvelously complete and balanced system of cirques and valleys, though this, of course, is not for the rheumatic traveler, but for him who fears not horse and tent. Such an explorer will find thrills with every passing hour. Giant Mount Rockwell will produce one when a side view shows that its apparent cone is merely the smaller eastern end of a ridge two miles long which culminates in a towering summit on the divide, Pumpily Pillar, with the proportions of a monument when seen from near the lake, becomes, seen sideways, another long and exceedingly beautiful ridge, striking examples, these, of the leavings of converging glaciers of old. Two Medicine Lake proves to be long and narrow, the chalet view being the long way, and Upper Two Medicine Lake proves to be an emerald encircled pearl in a silvery-gray setting. The climax of such a several days' trip is a night among the coyotes at the head of the main valley and a morning upon Dawson Pass overlooking the indescribable tangle of peak, precipice, and canyon lying west of the Continental Divide. Taken as a whole, the Two Medicine Drainage Basin is an epitome of glacier in miniature. To those entering the park on the east side and seeing it first, it becomes an admirable introduction to the greater park. To those who have entered on the west side and finish here, it is an admirable farewell review, especially as its final picture sounds the note of scenic perfection. Were there nothing else of Glacier, this spot would become in time itself a world celebrity. Incidentally, exceedingly lively eastern brook trout will afford an interesting hour to one who floats a fly down the short stream into the lakelet at the foot of Two Medicine Lake, not far below the chalet. There are also fish below Trick Falls. The Spectacle of St. Mary St. Mary Lake, similarly situated in the outlet valley of a much greater group of cirques 
north of Two Medicine, offers a picture as similar in kind as two canvases are similar which have been painted by the same hand, but they widely differ in composition and magnificence. Two Medicine's preciousness yields to St. Mary's elemental grandeur. The steamer which brings our rheumatic traveller from the motor stage at the foot of the lake lands him at the upper chalet group, appropriately Swiss, which finds vantage on a rocky promontory for the view of the divide. Gigantic mountains of deep red argillite, grotesquely carved, close in the sides, and with lake and sky wonderfully frame the amazing central picture of pointed pyramids, snow fields, hanging glaciers, and silvery ridges merging into the sky. Seen on the way into Glacier, St. Mary is a prophecy which will not be fulfilled elsewhere in charm, though often far exceeded in degree. Seen leaving Glacier, it combines with surpassing novelty scenic elements whose possibilities of further gorgeous combination the trip through the park has seemed to exhaust. The St. Mary picture is impossible to describe. Its colors vary with the hours and the atmosphere's changing conditions. It is silver, golden, mauve, blue, lemon, misty white, and red by turn. It is seen clearly in the morning, with the sun behind you. Afternoons and sunsets offer theatrical effects, often baffling, always lovely and different. Pointed fusillade and peaked Reynolds Mountains often lose their tops in lowering mists. So often does going to the Sun Mountain in the nearby right foreground. So not so often does keel-shaped Citadel Mountain on the nearby left. Also at times majestic little chief, he of lofty mien and snow-dashed crown, and stolid red eagle whose gigantic reflection reddens a mile of waters. It is these close-up monsters, even more than the colorful ghosts of the western horizon, which stamp St. Mary's personality. From the porches of the chalets and the deck of the steamer in its evening tour of the lake end, the traveler will note the enormous size of those upper valleys which once combined their glaciers as now they do their streams. He will guess that the glacier which once swept through the deep gorge in whose bottom now lies St. Mary Lake was several thousand feet in thickness. He will long to examine those upper valleys and reproduce in imagination the amazing spectacle of long ago. But they are not for him. That vision is reserved for those who ride the trails. The Scenic Climax of the Swift Current Again passing north, the automobile stage reaches Rhodes End at McDermott Lake, the fan handle of the Swift Current drainage basin. Overlooking a magnificent part of each of its contributing valleys, the lake, itself supremely beautiful, may well deserve its reputation as Glacier's scenic center. I have much sympathy with the thousands who claim supremacy for McDermott Lake. Lake MacDonald has its wonderfully wooded shores, its majestic length and august vista, Helen Lake its unequaled wildness, Bowman Lake its incomparable view of glacier-shrouded divide. But McDermott has something of everything. It is a composite, a mosaic masterpiece, with every stone a gem. There is no background from which one looks forward to the view. Its horizon contains 360 degrees of view. From the towering south gable of that rock temple to God the Creator, which the map calls Mount Gould, around the circle it offers an unbroken panorama in superlative. In no sense by way of comparison, which is absurd between scenes so different, but merely to help realization by contrast with what is well known, let us recall the Yosemite Valley. Yosemite is a valley, swift current an enclosure. Yosemite is gray and shining, swift current richer far in color. Yosemite's walls are rounded, peaked, and polished, swift currents toothed, torn, and crumbling. The setting sun shines through the holes worn by frost and water in the living rock. Yosemite guards her western entrance with a shaft of gray granite rising 3,600 feet from the valley floor, and her eastern end by granite domes of 5,000 and 6,000 feet. Swift currents rocks gather round her central lake, Altin, 3,200 feet above the lake's level, Henkel, 3,800 feet, Wilbur, 4,500 feet, and Grinnell, 4,000, Gould, 4,700, Allen, 4,500, all of colored strata, green at base, then red, then gray. Yosemite has its winding river and waterfalls, Swift Current, its lakes and glaciers. Swift Current has the repose, but not the softness, of Yosemite. 
Yosemite is unbelievably beautiful. Swift current inspires wondering awe. McDermott Lake, focus point of all this natural glory, is scarcely a mile long and narrow. It may be vivid blue and steel blue and milky blue, and half a dozen shades of green and pink, all within twice as many minutes, according to the whim of the breeze, the changing atmosphere, and the clouding of the sun. Often it suggests nothing so much as a pool of dull green paint, or it may present a reversed image of mountains, glaciers, and sky in their own coloring or at sunset it may turn lemon or purple or crimson or orange or a blending of all or with rushing storm clouds it may suddenly lose every hint of any color and become a study in black white and intermediate grays there are times when from hotel porch rock or boat the towering peaks and connecting limestone walls become suddenly so fairy-like that they lose all sense of reality seeming to merge into their background of sky from which, nevertheless, they remain sharply differentiated. The rapidity and the variety of change in the appearance of the water is nothing to that in the appearance of these magical walls and mountains, now near, now distant, now luring, now forbidding, now gleaming as if with their own light, now gloomy in threat. They lose not their hold on the eye for a moment. The unreality of McDermott Lake, the sense it often imparts of impossibility, is perhaps its most striking feature. One suspects he dreams, awake. THE SCENIC CIRCLE To realize the spot as best we may, let us pause on the bridge among those casting for trout below the upper fall and glance around. To our left rises Allen Mountain, rugged, irregular, forest-clothed, halfway up its 4,500 feet of elevation, above the valley floor. Beyond it a long, gigantic wall sets in at right angles, blue, shining, serrated, supporting, apparently on the lake edge, an enormous gable end of grey limestone banded with black diorite, a veritable personality comparable with Yosemite's most famous rocks. This is Mount Gould. Next is the Grinnell Glacier, hanging glistening in the air, dripping waterfalls, backgrounded by the gnawed top of the venerable garden wall. Then comes, in turn, the majestic mass of Mount Grinnell, four miles long, culminating at the lakeside in an enormous, party-colored pyramid more impressive from the hotel than even Rockwell is from two medicine chalets. Then, upon its right, appears a wall, which is the unnamed continuation of the garden wall, and plastered against the side of Swift Current Mountain, three small hanging glaciers, seeming in the distance like two long parallel snowbanks. Then Mount Wilbur, another giant pyramid, gray, towering, massively carved, grandly proportioned, kingly in bearing. Again upon its right emerges still another continuation, also unnamed, of the garden wall, this section loftiest of all, and bitten deeply by the ages. A part of it is instantly recognized from the hotel window as part of the skyline, surrounding famous Iceberg Lake. Its right is lost behind the nearer slopes of Red Mount Henkel, which swings back upon our right, bringing the eye nearly to its starting point. A glance out behind, between mountains, upon the limitless lake-dotted plain, completes the scenic circle. McDermott Lake, by which I here mean the swift current enclosure as seen from the Many Glacier Hotel, is illustrative of all of Glacier. There are wilder spots, by far, some which frighten. There are places of nobler beauty, though as I write I know I shall deny it the next time I stand on McDermott's shores. There are supreme places, which at first glance seem to have no kinship with any other place on earth. Nevertheless, McDermott contains all of Glacier's elements, all her charm, and practically all her combinations. It is the place of places to study Glacier. It is also a place to dream away idle weeks. So he who cannot ride or walk the trails may still see and understand Glacier in Her Majesty. Besides the places I have mentioned, he may see, from the Cutbank Chalet, a characteristic forested valley of great beauty, and at Lewis's Hotel on Lake MacDonald, the finest spot accessible upon the broad west side, the playground, as the east side is the showplace of hundreds of future thousands. So many are the short horseback trips from Many Glacier Hotel to places of significance and beauty that it is hard for the timid to withstand the temptation of the trail. Four miles will reach Grinnell Lake at the foot of its glacier. Six miles will penetrate the Cracker Lake Gorge 
at the perpendicular base of Mount Sia. Eight miles will disclose the astonishing spectacle of Iceberg Lake, and nine miles will cross the Swift Current Pass to the Granite Park Chalet. Iceberg Lake Typical of All In some respects, Iceberg Lake is Glacier's supreme spectacle. There are few spots so wild. There may be no easily accessible spot in the world half so wild. Imagine a horseshoe of perpendicular rock wall, 2,700 to 3,500 feet high, a glacier in its inmost curve, a lake of icebergs in its center. The back of the tower peak of Mount Wilbur is the southern end of this horseshoe. This enclosure was not built up from below as it looks, but bitten down within and without it was left. On the edge of the lake in early July, the sun sets at four o'clock. Stupendous as Iceberg Lake is as a spectacle, its highest purpose is illustrative. It explains Glacier. Here by this lakeside, fronting the glacier's floating edge and staring up at the jagged top in front and on either side, one comprehends at last. The appalling story of the past seems real. The Climax at Granite Park It is at Granite Park that one realizes the geography of Glacier. You have crossed the Continental Divide and emerged upon a lofty abutment just west of it. You are very nearly in the park's center, and on the margin of a forested canyon of impressive breadth and depth, lined on either side by mountain monsters, and reaching from Mount Cannon at the head of Lake MacDonald northward to the Alberta Plain. The western wall of this vast avenue is the Livingston Range. Its eastern wall is the Lewis Range. Both, in turn, carry the Continental Divide, which crosses the avenue from Livingston to Lewis by way of low-crowned Flattop Mountain, a few miles north of where you stand, and back to Livingston by way of Clements Mountain, a few miles south. Opposite you, across the chasm, rises snowy Heaven's Peak. Southwest lies Lake MacDonald, hidden by Heaven's shoulder. South is Logan Pass, carrying another trail across the divide, and disclosing hanging gardens beyond on Reynolds' eastern slope. Still south of that, unseen from here, is famous Gunsight Pass. It is a stirring spectacle. But wait, a half-hour's climb to the summit of Swift Current Mountain close at hand, the chalet is most of the way up to start with, and all of Glacier lies before you like a model in relief. Here you see the iceberg cirque from without and above. The Belly River chasm yawns enormously. Mount Cleveland, monarch of the region, flaunts his crown of snow among his nearby court of only lesser monsters. The Avenue of the Giants deeply splits the northern half of the park. That land of extravagant accent, mysterious because so little known, the glacier of tourists lying south. A marvelous spectacle this, indeed, and one which clears up many misconceptions. The Canadian Rockies hang on the misty northern horizon. The Montana Plains float eastward. The American Rockies roll south and west. Over Gunsight Pass To me, one of the most stirring sights in all glacier is the view of Gunsight Pass from the foot of Gunsight Lake. The immense glaciered uplift of Mount Jackson on the south of the pass, the wild, whitened sides of Gunsight Mountain opposite, dropping to the upturned strata of red shale at the water's edge, the pass itself, so well named, perched above the dark precipice at the lake's head the corkscrew which the trail makes up Jackson's perpendicular flank, and its passage across a mammoth snowbank high in the air. These, in contrast with the silent black water of the sunken lake, produce ever the same thrill, however often seen. The look back, too, once the pass is gained, down St. Mary's gracious valley to going to the Sun Mountain and its horizon companions. Sun Mountain, for short, always a personality, is never from any other point of view so undeniably the crowned majesty as from Gunsight Pass. And finally, looking forward, which in this speaking means westward, the first revelation of Lake Ellen Wilson gives a shock of awed astonishment whose memory can never pass. Truly, Gunsight is a pass of many sensations, for leaving Lake Ellen Wilson and its 1,800 feet of vertical frothing outlet the westward trail crosses the shoulder of Lincoln Peak to the Sperry Glacier and its inviting chalet, where the biggest hoary marmot I ever saw sat upon my dormitory porch, and eight miles farther down the mountain, beautiful Lake MacDonald.
Destiny of the West Side Although it was settled earlier, Glacier's west side is less developed than its east side. This because, for the most part, its scenery is less sensational, though no less gorgeously beautiful. Its five long lakes, of which MacDonald is much the longest and largest, head up toward the snowy monsters of the Divide. Their thin bodies wind leisurely westward among superbly forested slopes. Its day is still to come. It is the land of the bear, the moose, the deer, the trout, and summer leisure. Its destiny is to become Glacier's Vacation Playground. The Coming Splendors of the North The wild north side of Glacier, its larger, bigger-featured, and occasionally greater part, is not yet for the usual tourist. For many years from this writing, doubtless, none will know it but the traveler with the tent and pack train. He alone, and may his tribe increase, will enjoy the gorgeous cirques and canyons of the Belly River, the wild quietude of the Waterton Valley, the regal splendors of Brown Pass, and the headwater spectacles of the Logging, Quartz, Bowman, and Kintla Valleys. He alone will realize that here is a land of greater power, larger measures, and bigger horizons. And yet with Kintla comes climax. Crossing the border, the mountains subside, the glaciers disappear. Canada's Waterton Lakes Park begins at our climax and merges in half a dozen miles to the great prairies of Alberta. It is many miles northwest before the Canadian Rockies assume proportions of superlative scenic grandeur. The Belly River Valleys To realize the growing bigness of the land northward, one only has to cross the wall from Iceberg Lake into the Belly River Canyon. Only, indeed. In 1917 it took us forty miles of detour outside the park, even under the shadow of Chief Mountain, to cross the wall from Iceberg Lake, the west side precipice of which is steeper even than the east. The Belly River drainage basin is itself bigger, and its mountains bulk in proportion. Eighteen glaciers contribute to the making of perhaps as many lakes. The yellow mountains of its northern slopes invade Canada. The borders of its principal valley are two monster mountains. Cleveland, the greatest in the park for mass and height and intricate outline, the other merit, in some respects the most interesting of Glacier's abundant collection of majestic peaks. There are three valleys. The North Fork finds its way quickly into Canada. The Middle Fork rises in a group of glaciers high under the Continental Divide and descends four giant steps, a lake upon each step, to two greater lakes of noble aspect in the valley bottom. The South Fork emerges from Helen Lake deep in the gulf below to the Ahern Glacier across the garden wall from Iceberg Lake. Between the Middle and South Forks, Mount Merritt rises 9,944 feet in altitude, minareted like a medieval fort, and hollow as a bowl, its gaping chasm hung with glaciers. This is the Valley of Abundance. The waters are large, their trout many and vigorous. The bottoms are extravagantly rich in grasses and flowers, the forests are heavy and full-bodied, there is no open place, even miles beyond its boundaries, which does not offer views of extraordinary nobility. Every man who enters it becomes enthusiastically prophetic of its future. After all, the Belly River country is easily visited. A leisurely horseback journey from McDermott, that is all. Three days among the strange yellow mountains of the overthrust eastern edge, including two afternoons among the fighting trout of Kennedy Creek and Slide Lake, and two nights in camp along the wild bare arroyos of the Algonquian invasion of the prairie, an interesting prelude to the fullness of wilderness life to come. I dwell upon the belly valleys because their size, magnificence, and accessibility suggest a future of public use. Nothing would be easier, for instance, than a road from Bab to join the road already in from Canada. The name naturally arouses curiosity. Why belly? Was it not the Anglo-Saxon frontier's pronunciation of the Frenchman's original bell? The river, remember, is mainly Canadian. Surely, in all its forks and tributaries, it was and is the beautiful river. The Avenue of the Giants The Avenue of the Giants looms in any forecast of Glacier's future. It really consists of two valleys joined end-on at their beginnings on Flattop Mountain. MacDonald Creek flowing south, Little Kootenay flowing north. The road which will replace the present trail up this avenue 
from the much-traveled south to Waterton Lake and Canada is a matter, doubtless, of a distant future, but it is so manifestly destiny that it must be accepted as the key to the greater glacier to come. Uniting at its southern end roads from both sides of the divide, it will reach the Belly Valleys by way of Ahern Pass, the Bowman and Kintla Valleys by way of Brown Pass, and will terminate at the important tourist settlement which is destined to grow at the splendid American end of Waterton Lake. Incidentally, it will become an important motor highway between Canada and America. Until then, though all these are now accessible by trail, the high distinction of the Bowman and the Kintla Valley's supreme expression of the glowing genius of this whole country will remain unknown to any considerable body of travelers. The Climax of Bowman and Kintla and after all, the Bowman and Kintla regions are Glacier's ultimate expression. Bowman of her beauty, Kintla of her majesty. No one who has seen the foaming cascades of Mount Peabody and a lost outlet of the lofty boulder glacier emerging dramatically through hole-in-the-wall fall, for all the world like a horse-tail fastened upon the face of a cliff, who has looked upon the guardhouse from Brown Pass and traced the distant windings of Bowman Lake between the fluted precipice of Rainbow Peak and the fading slopes of Indian Ridge, or has looked upon the mighty monolith of Kintla Peak rising five thousand feet from the lake in its gulf-like valley, spreading upon its shoulders, like wings prepared for flight, the broad gleaming glaciers known as Kintla and Agassiz, will withhold his guerdon for a moment. Here again we repeat, for the hundredth or more time in our leisurely survey of the park, what the Englishman said of the spectacle of St. Mary. There is nothing like it in the world. End of Part 20part 21 of the book of the national parks this librivox recording is in the public domain the book of the national parks by robert sterling yard rock records of a vanished race mesa verde national park southwestern colorado area 77 square miles 1 many years possibly centuries before columbus discovered america a community of cliff dwellers inhabiting a group of canyons in what is now southwestern Colorado, entirely disappeared. Many generations before that, again possibly centuries, the founders of this community, abandoning the primitive pueblos of their people elsewhere, had sought new homes in the valleys tributary to the Mancos River. Perhaps they were enterprising young men and women, dissatisfied with the poor and unprogressive life at home. Perhaps they were dissenters from ancient religious forms, outcasts and pilgrims, for there is abundant evidence that the prehistoric sun-worshippers of our southwest were deeply religious, and human nature is the same under skins of all colors in every land and age. More likely they were merely thrifty pioneers, attracted to the green, cedar-grown mesas by the hope of better conditions. Whatever the reason for their pilgrimage, it is a fair inference that, like our own pilgrim fathers, they were sturdy of body and progressive of spirit for they had a culture which their descendants carried beyond that of other tribes and communities of prehistoric people in America, north of the land of the Aztecs. Beginning with modest stone structures of the usual cliff-dwellers type, built in deep clefts in the mesa's perpendicular cliff, safe from enemies above and below, these enterprising people developed in time a complicated architecture of a high order. They advanced the arts beyond the practice of their forefathers and their neighbors they herded cattle upon the mesas, they raised corn and melons in clearings in the forests, and watered their crops in the dry seasons by means of simple irrigation systems as soundly scientific, so far as they went, as those of today. Outgrowing their cliff homes, they invaded the neighboring mesas, where they built pueblos and more ambitious structures. Then, apparently suddenly, for they left behind them many of their household goods, and left unfinished an elaborate temple to their god, the sun, they vanished there is no clue to the reason or the manner of their going. Meantime, European civilization was pushing in all directions. Columbus discovered America, De Soto explored the southeast and ascended the Mississippi, Cortez pushed into Mexico and conquered the Aztecs, Spanish priests carried the gospel north and west from the Antilles to the continent, Raleigh sent explorers to Virginia, the Pilgrim Fathers landed in Massachusetts, the white man pushed the Indian aside, 
and at last the European pioneer sought a precarious living on the sands of the southwest. One December day in 1888, Richard and Alfred Weatherhill hunted lost cattle on the top of one of the green mesas north and west of the Mancos River. They knew this mesa well. Many a time before had they rounded up their herds and stalked the deer among the thin cedar and pinyon forest. Often, doubtless, in their explorations of the broad Mancos Valley below, they had happened upon ruins of primitive isolated or grouped stone buildings hidden by sagebrush, half buried in rock and sand. No doubt, around their ranch fire, they had often speculated concerning the manner of men that had inhabited these lowly structures so many years before that sometimes aged cedars grew upon the broken walls. But this December day brought the Weatherhills the surprise of their uneventful lives. Some of the cattle had wandered far, and the search led to the very brink of a deep and narrow canyon, across which, in a long deep cleft along the overhang of the opposite cliff, they saw what appeared to be a city. Those who have looked upon the stirring spectacle of Cliff Palace from this point can imagine the astonishment of these ranchmen. Whether or not the lost cattle were ever found is not recorded, but we may assume that living on the mesa was not plentiful enough to make the weather hills forget them in the pleasure of discovering a ruin. But they lost no time in investigating their find, and soon after crossed the canyon and climbed into this prehistoric city. They named it Cliff Palace, most inappropriately, by the way, for it was in fact that most democratic of structures, a community dwelling. Pushing their explorations farther, presently they discovered also a smaller ruin, which they named Spruce Tree House, because a prominent spruce grew in front of it. These are the largest two cliff dwellings in the Mesa Verde National Park, and until Dr. J. Walter Fuchs unearthed Sun Temple in 1915, among the most extraordinary prehistoric buildings north of Mexico. There are thousands of prehistoric ruins in our southwest, and many besides those of the Mesa Verde are examples of an aboriginal civilization. Hundreds of canyons tell the story of the ancient cliff dwellers, and still more numerous are the remains of communal houses built of stone or sun-dried brick under the open sky. These pueblos in the open are either isolated structures like the lesser cliff dwellings, or are crowded together till they touch walls, as in our modern cities. Often they were several stories high, the floors connected by ladders. Sometimes, for protection against the elements, whole villages were built in caves. Pueblos occasionally may be seen from the car window in New Mexico. The least modified of the prehistoric type, which are occupied today, are the eight villages of the Hopi near the Grand Canyon in Arizona. A suggestive reproduction of a modern pueblo, familiar to many thousands who have visited the canyon, stands near the El Tavar Hotel. It was not, therefore, because of the rarity of prehistoric dwellings of either type that the cliff villages of the Mesa Verde were conserved as a national park, nor only because they are the best preserved of all North American ruins, but because they disclose a type of this culture in advance of all others. The builders and inhabitants of these dwellings were Indians having physical features common to all American tribes. That their accomplishment differed in degree from that of the shiftless, war-making tribes north and east of them, and from that of the cultured and artistic Mayas of Central America, was doubtless due to differences in conditions of living. The struggle for bare existence in the southwest, like that of the habitats of other North American Indians, was intense, but these were agriculturalists, and protected by environment. The desert was a handicap, of course, but it offered opportunity in many places for dry farming. The Indian raised his corn. The winters, too, were short. It is only in the southwest that enterprise developed the architecture of stone houses which distinguish Pueblo Indians from others in North America. The dwellers in the Mesa Verde were more fortunate even than their fellow Pueblo dwellers. The forested mesas, so different from the arid cliffs farther south and west, possessed constant moisture and fertile soil. The grasses lured the deer within capture. The Mancos River provided fish. Above all, the remoteness of these fastness canyons from the trails of raiders and traders and their ease of defense made for long generations of peace. The enterprise innate in the spirit of man did the rest. 2. The history of the Mesa Verde National Park began with the making of America. All who have traveled in the southwest have seen mesas from the car window. New Mexico, Arizona, and parts of Colorado and Utah, the region of the Pueblos, constitute an elevated plateau, largely arid. 
many millions of years ago, all was submerged in the intercontinental sea. In fact, the region was sea many times, for it rose and fell alternately, accumulating thousands of feet of sands and gravels, much of which hardened into stone after the slow great uplifting which made it the lofty plateau of today. Erosion did its work. For a million years or more, the floods of spring have washed down the sands and gravels, and the rivers have carried them into the sea. Thousands of vertical feet have disappeared in this way from the potential altitude of the region. The spring floods are still washing down the sands and gravels, and the canyons, cliffs, and mesas of the desert are disclosed today as stages in the eternal leveling. Thus were created the canyons and mesas of the Mesa Verde. Mesa, by the way, is Spanish for table, and verde for green. These, then, are the green tablelands, forest-covered and during the summer grown scantily with grass and richly with flowers. The Mesa Verde National Park was created by Act of Congress in June 1906 and enlarged seven years later. The Mancos River, on its way to the San Juan and thence to the Colorado, and the passage of the Grand Canyon, forms its southern boundary. Scores of canyons, large and small, nearly all dry except at the spring floods, are tributary. All of these trend south. In a general way, they are parallel. Each of the greater stems has its lesser tributaries, and each of these its lesser forks. Between the canyons lie the mesas. Their tops, if continued without break, would form a more or less level surface. That is, all had been a plain before floods cut the separating canyons. The region has a wonderful scenic charm. It is markedly different in quality from other national parks, but in its own way is quite as startling and beautiful. Comparison is impossible because of the lack of elements in common. But it may be said that the Mesa Verde represents our great southwest in one of its most fascinating phases, combining the fundamentals of the desert with the flavor of the nearby mountains. The canyons, which are seven or eight hundred feet deep, and two or three times as wide where the cliff dwellings gather, are prevailingly tawny yellow. Masses of sloping talus reach more than halfway up. Above them the cliffs are perpendicular. It is in cavities in these perpendiculars that the cliff dwellings hide. Above the cliffs are low growths of yellowish-green cedar with pinions and other conifers of darker foliage. Beneath the trees and covering the many opens grows the familiar sage of the desert, a gray which hints at green and yellow both, but realizes neither. But the sagebrush shelters desert grasses, and around the occasional springs and their slender outlets, grass grows rank and plenteous. A little water counts for a great deal in the desert. Summer, then, is delightful on the Mesa Verde. The plateau is high and the air invigorating, warm by day in midsummer, always cool at night. The atmosphere is marvelously clear, and the sunsets are famous. The winter snows, which reach three or four feet in depth, disappear in April. From May to Thanksgiving, the region is in its prime. It is important to realize that this land has much for the visitor besides its ruins. It has vigor, distinction, personality, and remarkable charm. It is the highest example of one of America's most distinctive and important scenic phases, and this without reference to its prehistoric dwellings. No American traveler knows his America, even the great Southwest, who does not know the borderland where desert and forest mingle. The Southern Ute Indian Reservation bites a large rectangle from the southeast corner of the park, but its inhabitants are very different in quality of mind and spirit from the ancient and reverent builders of Sun Temple. Reservation Indians frequently enter the park, but they cannot be persuaded to approach the cliff dwellings. The little people, they tell you, live there, and neither teaching nor example will convince them that these invisible inhabitants will not injure intruders. Some of these Indians allege that it was their own ancestors who built the cliff dwellings, but there is neither record nor tradition to support such a claim. The fact appears to be that the Utes were the ancient enemies of this people. There is a Ute tradition of a victory over the ancient Pueblo dwellers at Battle Rock in McElmo Canyon. There are, on the other hand, many reasons for the opinion that the Hopi Indians of the present day, so far at least as culture goes, are descendants of this remarkable prehistoric people. Besides the many similarities between the architectural types of the Mesa Verde and the Pueblos of the modern Hopi, 
careful investigators have found suggestive points of similarity in their utensils, their art forms, and their customs. Dr. Fuchs cites a Hopi tradition to that effect by mentioning the visit of a Hopi courier a few years ago to prehistoric ruins in the Navajo National Monument to obtain water from an ancestral spring for use in a Hopi religious ceremonial. If these traditions are founded in fact, the promising civilization of the Mesa Verde has sadly retrograded in its transplanting. Hopi architecture and masonry shows marked retrogression from the splendid types of the Mesa Verde. When the telephone line was under construction to connect the park with the outside world, the Indians from the adjoining Ute Reservation became suspicious and restless. Upon hearing its purpose, they begged the superintendent not to go on with the work, which was certain to bring evil to the neighborhood. The little people, they solemnly declared, will not like it. They assured the superintendent that the wires would not talk. The little people will not let them talk, they told him. But the line was completed, and the wires talked. The park is reached by motor and rail. From Denver, Salt Lake City, and Santa Fe, railroad lines offer choice of some of the biggest country of the Rockies. From either direction, a night is spent en route in a mountain mining town, an experience which has its usefulness in preparation for the contrasted and unusual experience to come. Entrance is through Mancos, from which motor stages thread the maze of canyons and mesas from the highlands of the northern border to the deep canyons of the south where cluster the ruins of distinction. This entry is delightful. The road crosses the northern boundary at the base of a lofty butte known as Point Lookout, the park's highest elevation. Encircling its eastern side and crossing the Moorfield Canyon, the road perches for several miles upon the sinuous crest of a ridge more than 8,000 feet in altitude, whose north side plunges 1,800 feet into the broad Montezuma Valley, and whose gentle southern slope holds the small beginnings of the great canyons of the cliff dwellers. Both north and south, the panorama unfolds in impressive grandeur, eloquent of the beautiful, scanty land and of the difficult conditions of living which confronted the sturdy builders whose ancient masterpieces we are on our way to see. At the northern end of Chapin Mesa, we swing sharply south and follow its slope, presently entering the warm, glowing, scented forests, through which we speed to the hotel camp, perched upon a bluff, overlooking the depths of Spruce Canyon. Upon the top, and under the eaves of this mesa, are found very fine types of prehistoric civilization. At Mummy Lake, halfway down the mesa, we passed on the way a good example of Pueblo architecture, and within an easy walk of our terminal camp we find some of the noblest examples of cliff dwellings in existence. Here it was, near the head of this remote, nearly inaccessible canyon, guarded by nature's ramparts, that aboriginal American genius, before the coming of the Anglo-Saxon, found its culminating expression. In this spirit, the thoughtful American of today enters the Mesa Verde National Park, and examines its precious memorials. 3. Although the accident of the road brings the traveler first to the Mesa Top Pueblos of the Mummy Lake District, historical sequence suggests that examination begin with the cliff dwellings. Of the many examples of these remains in the park, Cliff Palace, Spruce Tree House, and Balcony House are the most important, because they concisely and completely cover the range of life and the fullness of development. This is not the place for detailed descriptions of these ruins. The special publications of the National Park Service, and particularly the writings of Dr. J. Walter Fuchs of the Smithsonian Institution, who has devoted many years of brilliant investigation to American prehistoric remains, are obtainable from government sources. Here we shall briefly consider several types. It is impossible, without reference to photographs, to convey a concise adequate idea of Cliff Palace. Seen from across its canyon, the splendid, crescent-shaped ruin offers to the unaccustomed eye little that is common to modern architecture. Prominently in the foreground, large circular wells at once challenge interest. These were the kivas, or ceremonial rooms of the community, centers of the religious activities which counted so importantly in Pueblo life. Here it was that men gathered monthly to worship their gods. In the floors of some kivas are small holes representing symbolically the entrance to the underworld, and around these from time to time, priests doubtless performed archaic ceremonies and communicated with the dead. Each family or clan in the community is supposed to have had its own kiva. 
the kiva walls of cliff palace show some of the finest prehistoric masonry in america all are subterranean which in a few instances necessitated excavation in floors of solid rock the roofs are supported by pedestals rising from mural banquettes usually six pedestals to a kiva the kiva supposed to have belonged to the chief's clan had eight pedestals and one perhaps belonging to a clan of lesser prominence had only two several kivas which lack roof supports may have been of different type or used for lesser ceremonials all except these have fireplaces and ventilators entrance was by ladder from the roof other rooms identified are living rooms storage rooms milling rooms and round and square towers besides which there are dark rooms of unknown use and several round rooms which are neither kivas nor towers several of the living rooms have raised benches evidently used for beds and in one of them pegs for holding clothing still remain in the walls these rooms are smoothly plastered or painted mills for grinding corn were found in one room in rows in others singly the work was done by women who rubbed the upper stone against the lower by hand the rests for their feet while at work still remain in place also the brushes for sweeping up the meal the small storage rooms had stone doors carefully sealed with clay to keep out mice and prevent moisture from spoiling the corn and meal one of the most striking buildings in cliff palace is the round tower two stories high which not only was an observatory as is indicated by its peepholes but also served purposes in religious festivals its masonry belongs to the finest north of mexico the stones are beautifully fitted and dressed the square tower which stands at the southern end of the village is four stories high reaching the roof of the cave the inner walls of its third story are elaborately painted with red and white symbols triangles zigzags and parallels the significance of which is not known the ledge under which cliff palace is built forms a roof that overhangs the structure an entrance probably the principal one came from below to a court at a lower level than the floor from which access was by ladder spruce tree house which may have been built after cliff palace has a circular room with windows which were originally supposed to have been portholes for defence dr fuchs however suggests a more probable purpose as the position of the room does not specifically suggest a fortress through the openings in this room the sun priest may have watched the setting sun to determine the time for ceremonies the room was entered from above like a kiva another room differing from any in other cliff dwellings has been named the warrior's room because unlike sleeping rooms its bench surrounds three sides and because unlike any other room it is built above a kiva only the exigencies of defence it is supposed would warrant so marked a departure from the prescribed religious form of the room balcony house has special interest apart from its commanding location perfection of workmanship and unusual beauty and because of the ingenuity of the defences of its only possible entrance at the top of a steep trail a cave-like passage between rocks is walled so as to leave a door capable of admitting only one at a time behind which two or three men could strike down one by one an attacking army out of these simple architectural elements together with the utensils and weapons found in the ruins the imagination readily constructs a picture of the austere laborious highly religious and doubtless happy lives led by the earnest people who built these ancient dwellings in the caves when all the neighborhood caves were filled to overflowing with increasing population and generations of peace had wrought a confidence which had not existed when the pioneers had sought safety in caves these people ventured to move out of cliffs and to build upon the tops of the mesa whether all the cave dwellers were descended from the original pilgrims or whether others had joined them afterwards is not known but it seems evident that the separate communities had found some common bond probably tribal and perhaps evolved some common government no doubt they intermarried no doubt the blood of many cliff-dwelling communities mingled in the new communities which built pueblos upon the mesa in time there were many of these pueblos and they were widely scattered there are mounds at intervals all over the mesa verde the largest group of pueblos one infers from the numbers of visible mounds was built upon the chapin mesa several miles north of the above-mentioned cliff dwelling near a reservoir known to-day as mummy lake it is there then that we shall now go in continuation of our story
Mummy Lake is not a lake, and no mummies were ever found there. This old-time designation applies to an artificial depression surrounded by a low, rude stone wall, much crumbled, which was evidently a storage reservoir for an irrigation system of some size. A number of conspicuous mounds in the neighborhood suggest the former existence of a village of pueblos dependent upon the farms for which the irrigation system had been built. One of these, from which a few stones protruded, was excavated in 1916 by Dr. Fuchs, and has added a new and important chapter to the history of this people. This pueblo has been named Farview House. Its extensive vista includes four other groups of similar mounds. Each cluster occurs in the fertile sagebrush clearings, which bloom in summer with asters and Indian paintbrush. There is no doubt that good crops of Indian corn could still be raised from these sands today by dry farming methods. Farview House is a pueblo, a hundred and thirteen feet long by more than fifty feet wide, not including a full-length plaza about thirty-five feet wide in which religious dances are supposed to have taken place. The differences between this fine structure and the cliff cities are considerable. The most significant evidence of progress, perhaps, is the modern regularity of the ground plan. The partitions separating the secular rooms are continuous through the building, and the angles are generally accurately right angles. The Pueblo had three stories. It is oriented approximately to the cardinal points, and was terraced southward to secure a sunny exposure. The study of the solar movements became an advanced science with these people in the latter stages of their development. It must be remembered that they had no compasses, knowing nothing of the north or any other fixed point. Nevertheless, there is evidence that they successfully worked out the solstices and planned their later buildings accurately according to the cardinal points of their own calculation. Another difference indicating development is the decrease in the number of kivas and the construction of a single very large kiva in the middle of the building. Its size suggests at once that the individual clan organization of cliff-dwelling days had here given place to a single priestly fraternity, sociologically a marked advance. Drawing parallels with the better-known customs of other primitive people, we are at liberty, if we please, to infer similar progress in other directions. The original primitive communism was developing naturally, though doubtless very slowly, into something akin to organized society, probably involving more complicated economic relationships in all departments of living. While their masonry did not apparently improve in proportion, Farview House shows increase in the number and variety of the decorative figures incised on hewn stones. The spiral, representing the coiled serpent, appears a number of times, as do many combinations of squares, curves, and angles arranged in fanciful design, which may or may not have had symbolic meanings. A careful examination of the neighborhood discloses few details of the irrigation system, but it shows a cemetery near the southeast corner of the building in which the dead were systematically buried. Large numbers of minor antiquities were found in this interesting structure. Besides the usual stone implements of the mason and the housekeeper, many instruments of bone, such as needles, dirks, and bodkins, were found. Figurines of several kinds were unearthed, carved from soft stone, including several intended to symbolize Indian corn. All of these may have been idols. Fragments of pottery were abundant, in full variety of form, decoration, and color, but always the most ancient types. Among the bones of animals, the frequency of those of rabbits, deer, antelope, elk, and mountain sheep indicate that meat formed no inconsiderable part of the diet. Fabrics and embroideries were not discovered, as in the cliff dwellings, but they may have disappeared in the centuries through exposure to the elements. Farview House may not show the highest development of the Mummy Lake cluster of Pueblos, and further exhumations here and in neighboring groups may throw further light upon this interesting people in their gropings from darkness to light. Meantime, however, returning to the neighborhood of the cliff dwellings, let us examine a structure so late in the history of these people that they left it unfinished. Sun Temple stands on a point of Chapin Mesa, somewhat back of the region of Cliff Canyon, commanding an extraordinary range of country. It is within full view of Cliff Palace and other cliff dwellings of importance and easy of access. From it, one can look southward to the Mancos River. 
On every side a wide range of mesa and canyon lies in full view. The site is unrivaled for a temple in which all could worship with devotion. When Dr. Fuchs, in the early summer of 1915, attacked the mound which had been designated Community House under the supposition that it covered a ruined pueblo, he had no idea of the extraordinary nature of the find awaiting him, although he was prepared from its shape and other indications for something out of the usual. So wholly without parallel was the disclosure, however, that it was not till it was entirely uncovered that he ventured a public conjecture as to its significance. The ground plan of Sun Temple is shaped like the letter D. It encloses another D-shaped structure, occupying nearly two-thirds of its total area, within which are two large kivas. Between the outer and the inner D are passages and rooms, and at one end a third kiva is surrounded by rooms, one of which is circular. Sun Temple is also impressive in size. It is 121 feet long and 64 feet wide. Its walls average four feet in thickness and are double-faced, enclosing a central core of rubble. They are built of the neighborhood sandstone. The masonry is of fine quality. This, together with its symmetrical architectural design, its fine proportions, and its many decorated stones, mark it the highest type of Mesa Verde architecture. It was plainly unfinished. Walls had risen in some places higher than in others. As yet, there was no roofing. No rooms had been plastered. Of internal finishing, little was completed, and of contents, of course, there was none. The stone hammers and other utensils of the builders were found lying about as if thrown down at day's close. The kivas, although circular, are unlike those of Cliff Palace, inasmuch as they are above ground, not subterranean. The mortar used in pointing shows the impress of human hands. No trowels were used. The walls exhibit many stones incised with complicated designs, largely geometric. Some may be mason's marks, others are decorative or symbolic. These designs indicate a marked advance over those in Farview House. In fact, they are far more complicated and artistic than any in the Southwest. Bare and ineloquent, though its unfinished condition left it, the religious purposes of the entire building are clear to the archaeologist in its form, and as if to make conjecture certainty, a shrine was uncovered at the cornerstone of the outer wall, which frames in solid stone walls a large fossil palm leaf whose rays strongly suggest the sun. It requires no imagination to picture the effect which the original discovery of this image of their god must have had upon a primitive community of sun worshippers. It must have seemed to them a divine gift, a promise, like the Ark of the Covenant, of the favor of the Almighty. It may even have first suggested the idea of building this temple to their deity. This is all the story. Go ahead and study it in detail. Enlightened, profoundly impressed, nevertheless you will finish at this point. The tale has no climax. It just stops. What happened to the people of Mesa Verde? Some archaeologists believe that they emigrated to neighboring valleys southwest. But why should they have left their prosperous farms and fine homes for regions which seem to us less desirable? And why, a profoundly religious people, should they have left Sun Temple unfinished? What other supposition remains? Only, I think, that perhaps, because of their prosperity and the unpreparedness that accompanies long periods of peace, they were suddenly overwhelmed by enemies. End of Part 21